you don't have to. Um, uh, good morning, everybody. We are in the uh, AIAA Space Philosophy Gathering, the first of its kind. And, uh, um, you know, I put out a little outline about what it is about. And lo and behold, we got so many beautiful people um, uh, in the event today. I can't thank you all enough to, uh, for spending the time with us and um, welcome you all. Um, I would like to start uh, with none other than the AIAA Executive Director. In fact, all the bios are uh, in your folder. You can read them. But I want to spend uh, one minute talking about Dan. Dan is a very special uh, uh, professional and an academic of sorts. Um, he graduated from Purdue, went on to NASA to lead the human space flight effort for several years. And then now he's back um, uh, as the executive director of the AIAA, uh, the largest aerospace professional organization uh, in the galaxy, let's put it that way. Um, so with that, I want to um, hand it over to Dan. Well, thank you, Madhu. And, and that's the first time I've heard it described as the largest professional society in the galaxy. I, I think we need to start using that now, now, that, you, now that you've brought it up. <laughs> we, need it for this, um, we need it for this meeting, Dan. <laughs> largest in the galaxy, as far as we know. Um, <laughs> The uh, but in all seriousness, uh, Madhu, uh, Ken, and the entire Los Angeles, Las Vegas section, uh, thank you so very, very much uh, for putting this event on. Uh, as as we uh, as our society uh, continues to build out and uh, as I call it, extend the human neighborhood from Earth to low Earth orbit to the moon and eventually beyond. The kinds of discussions uh, that you uh, have constructed for all of us today uh, are extremely important. Now, we like to talk, engineers and scientists, we like to talk about our hardware, we like to talk about our systems, we like to talk about building things and, and all of that is obviously very, very important. There is also the human side of this, uh, the philosophy part. Uh, the being able to communicate the the why and the the wonder of of everything that that we will find and the things that we will learn along the way that we have no clue that we're going to learn even today and these kinds of discussions with the great speakers you have today with the great material with the attorneys the philosophers the english professors uh, are all the beginning of, of building out and including the entire society on this wonderful endeavor of, of exploration and extending the human neighborhood uh, further and further out. Uh, and I just want to say thank you for what you guys are doing. This is tremendously important, uh, tremendously valuable, and yeah, I'm gonna I am that. looking forward to you I am looking Yes. I am looking forward to a great uh, afternoon, and and I know you guys will. The recording will be able will be available for hopefully a lot of people to take advantage of, uh, and I just want to say thank you and and get get out of your way and let you have a and get on with the fun of this. Uh, but again, this is just so very important to have these kinds of discussions, uh, and I congratulate you for the uh, initiative uh, and the effort to get this event going. And just want to say thank you. Uh, from across AIAA uh, and looking forward to a great afternoon. Well, at least a great afternoon where I am. It depends on where you are. Uh, and, and the other part of this I just realized is the international flavor of this. It's not just uh, in the United States. It's around that we have participants from around the globe. So thank you so much to everyone that uh, is, is helping make this happen and looking forward to a great event. And Madhu, I'll turn it over back to you. So thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Dan, but uh, you're not off the hook yet. It, it tell us, <clears throat> tell us some of your experiences uh, that might have driven you to think deeper about the work you did for the agency 
And uh, particularly in human space flight, while you were uh, in the office, there may have been times, there may have been times when you said, wait a minute, this is not in the book. What do I do now? And uh, you would have to scramble sometimes um, to, to send orders down, uh, down the chain. Um, tell me if you know such an instance or if you can recollect something where you had to really fly things off the seat of your, I mean, that's what managers do. But anyway, anything special you can tell, tell about HQ and uh, things well, you have to do? Oh, we, we could spend all day. <laughs> we could spend all day on those stories. <laughs> the, uh, but, but you're right. I, I think, uh, you know, first of all, uh, why I have been so engaged in this, um, according to my mother, long before I can even remember, uh, because she, she used to claim that I, I watched every launch on TV, um, beginning with Alan Shepard. The, uh, I, I kind of remember John Glenn, but, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. The, it's all about the exploration, the learning, what's over the horizon, why are we doing this, and what's the value for human society. Yes, um, I love my rockets. I love my rocket propulsion. That's how I got started in this. But as I went through my career, and particularly at NASA headquarters, it was more about the why. And, and why are we doing this? Why is the investment so necessary? Why is all the effort so necessary? And, and really, you're right. Every single day, there were those moments of, this is not in the book. What do we do now? <laughs> uh, that, that happened every single day, yeah. at least once. Um, but it all, come, it all came back to the why we are doing this. And, it, and we're doing it for opening up the horizon to learn uh what is what is over the hill so to speak and then how we can use that to make life better uh for all of our citizens i remember my, my father one night um in a in an interesting conversation with a little bit of alcohol involved uh asked me he said so why do you do this nasa stuff what 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 is it and i said well dad it's my opportunity my chance to give back to others. I am doing this for the future generations uh, to help make life better for them and to help move things forward. Uh, not in this for the money, not in this for glory and all of that. It was about, and, and I think my, my father was a little taken by that. I think he was a little bit surprised uh, with the idea that you're doing this it wasn't a bad thing. It was just, he didn't expect that answer, I, I don't think. So every day at NASA headquarters, uh, it, was a, it was a constant reassessment of why are we doing things? Are we doing the right things? Are we doing it efficiently so that we can move as quickly as possible uh, with the least amount of resources necessary to go make it happen? Uh, but it all tied back to that why and what are we going to learn and how can we make life better uh, for humans around the globe and then open up the possibility for humans to live on other planets other yeah. moons whatever you know use the asteroids for the benefit of of life on earth um, and it was all of, and that's why we do this and that's why i think this philosophy kind of conversation is so important uh, i had a, a a little bit of another sidelight there was a young man that worked with us at nasa headquarters uh, he's not so young now. He was at the time, but he was very much on this engineering philosophy and, and really why are we doing things? And, and he and I would have these long conversations deep into the evening about uh, what we were doing and why we were doing it. And I think, and it all, uh, and that's exactly the kind of conversation you guys are having today. And I'm so glad to see all of this effort, all of this energy, all of this enthusiasm uh, to, to help open up our minds and think about what the possibilities could be. Uh, thank, thank you so much, uh, Dan, for stressing that why we do something is far more important than how we go about it. And I think uh, Bezos and others mentioned this. I think Bezos, I think, on the first day letter that he promotes every year to get people into this why thing. And Simon Sinek talks about it. 
uh, to corporations and so on. It's very clear and very important. Thank you so much, Dan, for opening the uh, event. Uh, enjoy the day, uh, 70 degrees out there with uh, your grandchildren. Thank you so much. And I'm not leaving right away. I'm going to hang on for a while. Oh, you are. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, Ken, let's go on to my slide. Uh, um, so uh, uh, shall I share the screen here? Let me go here. <clears throat> we'll stop others. Okay, want to continue? Yes. <clears throat> and I always have a little bit of difficulty with this here. Let's go here. <clears throat> Give me one second, Ken. <clears throat> Take it easy. What do you see now, Ken? Your face. There's no slide. No slide. The share screen, the green button. OK, it's showing up. Great. Are we on full screen? Now, yes. OK, uh, you welcome all. And uh, thank you, Dan. Um, you know, I'm going to go quickly through some slides. I won't talk to all the bullets, but uh, 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 I teach at USC. I, I teach both in the School of Engineering and in the School of Architecture. Uh, USC has a unique uh, um, astronautical engineering program. The curriculum is different from the aerospace and mechanical engineering program of earlier years. We have that too. And uh, it's a growing program with uh, fascinating uh, new um, uh, topics. And I invite all of you to take a look at it. Uh, we have a distinguished alumnus. Um, and Neil Armstrong uh, was uh, um, recruited to Apollo 11 while he was at USC, uh, uh, doing his um, uh, degree at USC. And what you see here is the seminar that he delivered after uh, landing uh, off to the moon uh, event. That's a great story to it, but it, we'll talk about it later. So in it, I teach a class called the um, ASTE 527 Graduate Space Concept Studio. Our plan and our, our charter is to make people think creatively, uh, to, be, to make them imagine stuff. And we have good friends, like the man holding the rocket there. Um, the Buzz comes to class often, uh, sometimes incognito because he commands a huge honorarium. And in the spring, <clears throat> I teach in the School of Architecture when I get a good dose of practical down-to-earth reality. They want to know what space can do uh, for humanity now and yesterday today and tomorrow, not in the future, and not going outward into space, but looking towards Earth. And uh, so I, I walk a tightrope. So what is uh, philosophy, first of all? It is the study of the fundamental nature of knowledge, reality, and existence in the deepest forms imaginable. All great civilizations have great philosophies underpinning them. Visions, policies, governance, concepts, architectures, all follow, all flow from these great philosophies. Basically, you can look at them as Western and Eastern. They, they, they talk about the physical, the metaphysical, and the spiritual. 
uh, if you um, you may want to read Leo Tolstoy's A Confession, where he ends by saying that all of human thought ranges from theology on the one end and metaphysics and mathematics on the other. So, uh, um, you know, uh, it's a very interesting area of study. Old and enduring civilizations and cultures have a much bigger handle on it than all of us do in the modern era. Um, most of it can be separated into the dualistic or the pluralistic versus the monistic ideas, singularity versus plurality. Uh, my own town where I come from in the southern part of India had a incredible philosopher called Shankara, Adi Shankara. And he made it very clear in the Vedas that there is only one. There is no multiplicity, there is nothing. So for those who think Hinduism is a pluralistic religion, you'll have to think again. It is very, very specific to what we call the Brahman. So um, <clears throat> what are some of the modern philosophies? Physical science, which includes astronomy, cosmology, all based on math. Life sciences thinks about the origin of life and life in the universe. There's anthropology, arts and architecture, engineering, um, in which USC um, it talks about engineering plus, because we have realized that the philosophy of engineering can um, sustain and be part of the wider um, um, knowledge base and the philosophies of life. We can have um, economic philosophies, law and governance philosophies, and of course, uh, the military and the common defense philosophy. These are all very important historical philosophy. So there are so many philosophies that we can talk about. So what is space exploration or space activity philosophy about? Space is the most expansive, transparent and physical domain. It gives us, it takes us out of our understanding of, the, of uh, geography as we know it and the nation state philosophy as we use it and the boundaries get extinguished the moment you fly out into orbit and beyond, you become part of the human um, or the part of a planetary species. <clears throat> we talk about situational awareness and there is a space situational awareness that we talk about. Um, in a recent meeting, I've heard the term solar system awareness. And then there is the galactic awareness. Yeah, AAA is a galactic organization. And then there is the cosmic awareness. So our mind is expanding with these philosophies about space. It is a new worldview that is less than 100 years old. I call it supra cosmopolitanism, the understanding that we are one species and we're expanding outwards. So it is about a new understanding of our biosphere, having a new awareness and sensitivity towards all. And it resonates with our own constitution of freedom, free world values. How are we doing time? Oh, we are off time. Okay, so there are several paradigms uh, described by different people here. And uh, uh, every one of them, at the end of the day, when you look at the deepest philosophy of it all, it points to Earth, to our species, to our well being, and to our biosphere. So, um, that, with that, I want to welcome our speakers. I had no idea we would gather all these luminaries today, but we have indeed um, the first. Two speakers, uh, uh, unfortunately, are not with us, but I will share some slides with you. But look at this here. And I see uh, Frank White with us. I see Michelle Hanlon with us. And they are right here in our agenda. Thank you so much for coming. And with that, Ken, how much time I got? Oh, you should be OK. Yeah. OK, good. So. Uh, with that, I'm ready to take some questions before we move on to uh, our speakers. Uh, any any questions? Um, you, you can ask them to click raise hand. 
so they can speak out. Oh, is that right, guys? Uh, that's right. We got that. Uh, we got that uh, potential. So before that, let me uh, let me spend one more minute here, talking about the various space philosophies of our time now. Um, Elon Musk suggests that the reason we go out into space is to settle other planets. And uh, Jeff Bezos says we have to protect and make Earth uh, preserve and continue to keep Earth beautiful. John Marburger, who was our dean at USC of Arts and Letters, went on to serve as in the OSTP as um, you know, the science advisor for um, George H.W. Uh, uh, Bush. Uh, um, he talked at the Goddard Memorial Lecture. He said that it's our opportunity to bring the solar system into our economic sphere of influence. It's a great speech. I want you all to read it. Joseph Campbell, the uh, the famous uh, um, uh, the famous uh, uh, Sarah Lawrence professor, um, who talks about um, the return of the hero. He was the mentor for the Star Wars program uh, that um, that George Lucas uh, produced and still continues to fascinate all of us. Freeman Dyson, uh, who we were very happy to have it uh, uh, at the National Space Society. Um, Freeman Dyson at Princeton um, uh, Studies, Advanced Studies Institute, uh, looked at the skies and he said, it's black, it's cold, nothing is happening there, nothing is moving there. I think it's the purpose of humanity to beautify it. And I thought that was very fascinating to hear. Frank White, who is with us, is the champion of the uh, overview effect that once you go out and look back at Earth, you realize the finite resources that uh, Buckminster Fuller and others talk about. And uh, you, you, want, you become a different person, a human, different kind of human. And Michelle Hanlon, who is with us, says that we must preserve our species, cultural history beyond the boundaries of planet Earth. And I don't know, there will be new, um, new uh, space philosophies coming, but these are some of them. So uh, uh, are we ready to move on to uh, our, I got five more minutes uh, before we go to Luke Jerem. Uh, I think if there are no questions, uh, any questions, any clarifications? We have, uh, uh, let me go and chat. <clears throat> Ken, any other questions? Uh, no, I don't see it. Uh, I think people uh, warm up and gradually ask more questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you, if you have any questions, you can put it on the chat box and uh, uh, Ken will, will be watching, so uh, he will and um, provide them to me, I hope, Ken. Um, but let us stay on time because I have a oh, feeling. Uh, Mr. Oh. <clears throat> James, did, did you? I, I have one question. Um, it says uh, from James Maddox, uh, what is your personal philosophy of space? Uh, thank you for asking, uh, James. Uh, I think, you know, when I began um, thinking about space long ago, it was all about the excitement of space and just getting into um, the, the group of people who are thinking uh, in, in exploration and uh, discovering the unknown. Um, as I've gotten um, older, um, I'm thinking more uh, that um, uh, this whole activity can, can bind us as a species. And um, uh, I like to think that um, space activity, I don't call it space exploration anymore because there is so much action going on in terms of all the people want, wanting to experience space. So um, it's my thinking that um, it, is a, it is an instrument of governments um, uh, to, to bind our, our peoples together all over the world. You know, as I mentioned, the moment you exit 
um, exit the planet. The way we do that is we go into orbit. And um, the moment you are in orbit, you are a citizen of planet Earth. Later today, you, know, you will hear from Brit, who will talk about being a celestial citizen. And those are the directions uh, in which uh, I like to think about uh, the philosophy of space. Thank you for the question, James. You're very welcome. Thank you for your answer. Atarsh, wait, wait, Atarsh, raise hand. Oh, others. Uh, good morning, others. Uh, hope you uh, and Pat are well. Did you have a thought uh, uh, or a question? Let me unmute. Ah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. I'm glad that you mentioned the cosmic word and the use of the word Brahman. That's right. I wanted to explain that is the philosophy we need to adopt since we are getting interplanetary now. And Braha means in Sanskrit, ever expanding. And Man means the mind. So it is the word that is, the problem occurred about 2300 years ago <laughs> when Zarathustra got so annoyed at the fact there was so much bad things happening. He moved away 200 years into from the Himalayas into Iran and he started Zoroastrian religion. He mm -hmm. brought in what is called Shaitan. Shaitan changed to Satan. And that's where the bifur bifurcation occurred, which was one was a good, which was called God. The other one was Satan, equal and opposite to God. And then when you, moment you create a boundary, there's gonna be hierarchy. That's my philosophy in the sense we have to close the loop to Brahman. And great that you brought it up very well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, others. And you know, when I look at uh, philosophies, even I, even I in high school, and in middle school, they taught Western philosophy in India. And it's only later on, and I think you know, uh, when we sat under the Ramakrishna mission, uh, under the lectures of uh, uh, yeah. the, the Swamis that, that you start to learn a little bit of uh, Indian philosophy. And so I, I would recommend all of you to look up some um, of the insights of Indian philosophy. Uh, Shankara's book is very, very small. It's called Viveka Chutamani. Uh, the um, uh, the crown jewel translates into the crown jewel of uh, of uh, discrimination. The thing to think deep enough to understand the meaning of life. Uh, it comes down to a simple precept: tatwam ase, which means you are that. Your connection with the cosmos becomes apparent in one little uh, little gem of a um, of a term. And uh, um, so there is lots of, uh, I'm glad that you brought up Persian uh, history. There is Chinese versions of it, the no, yin and the yang. That became and, Persian, but he was part of the one pe people who believed in only one. One, this is the important and, thing. And that's Brahman, but he separated out just 200 miles west, went into what's called Persia <laughs> from India. <laughs> Thank, anyway. th thank you, others. We, we love to chat with you. And, uh, Santosh, you raise hand too. Santosh. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, one of the questions I have is uh, how do we, as we move forward with this topic, how do you reconcile uh, with some of the fundamental belief systems out there? I'm not saying they're bad or anything. I'm just saying that they send, tend to reject this kind of thinking. And it's not just in the Western world. A uh, classic example is a Rabo, uh, Chief Petty Officer, Senior Chief of Rob O'Neill who famously was responsible for taking out Osama bin Laden, he was narrating a story with, uh, you know, which is kind of relevant right now with us pulling out of Afghanistan uh, of a translator in which uh, he said that, you know, he was kind of bragging that, you know, we as Americans, we put a man on the moon, you know, some 60 years ago or whatever, uh, but you guys are still doing whatever. And the translator's response was, you guys are so stupid. How can you put a man on the moon? It's the size of, and they showed like his two fingers because from their perspective, <laughs> the moon is this tiny little thing. And that's when it kind of hit him and, and, and all of us who heard about that story, that people have different belief systems and they're very much rigid in their thinking. So how do you reconcile that? Because sometimes, uh, you know, these have been the cause of wars, truth be told. 
we we don't reconcile you know I, you've heard the term east is east west is west and never the twain shall meet but it is our duty to make it um, ever not never ever the twain shall meet and these questions we will talk about uh, in uh, some more um, uh, some more detail uh, during the conclusion thank you for your comment um, shall we move on to our our first uh, uh, talk, uh, which is by none other uh, than Luke Jerem. Uh, Luke uh, is a, a, a well-known artist and a scientist of sorts from the UK. Two days ago, he emailed me and said his, uh, his daughter is not well uh, and Luke is sleeping with her in her hospital, um, uh, making her uh, getting a well. And I was so sad to hear that. Um, but uh, if you Google, uh, you will see uh, that Luke has done some extraordinary creative works uh, uh, dealing with the cosmos. Uh, the recent exhibit that uh, caught on fire uh, for the whole world um, is, the, is the Museum of the Moon, where Luke put up these very large inflatable, um, high resolution uh, moon um, uh, sculptures. And uh, he's, he's been hanging those well-lit sculptures all over the world. Um, yeah, the last one uh, being at the uh, cathedral uh, in Strasbourg. Uh, for those who have been there, uh, it is a beautiful cathedral. It's not the biggest or anything, but it's very beautiful. And uh, um, I did, communicate with them at that time, said it's spectacular, but it's going around the world and we want uh, Luke to bring it uh, to the US. And with that, I will ask Ken uh, to project uh, uh, some of Luke's uh, works. Uh, Ken, are we ready to go? Or do you need a minute? Almost. Okay. And uh, he's, an, uh, he's a very, very creative uh, individual. And, and the reason I wanted him to come early on is to show that space is much, much more than science and technology. Uh, it, is, it, it goes to the heart of, um, of the human existence. The first words that a child usually sees in the night sky and recognizes repeatedly when he or she is out is the moon. Look, the moon. So with that, let us take a look at the, uh, his Museum of the Moon. Do we have audio for this, Ken, or is it just visual? Look at the yes. look at the awe. You did that? <clears throat> you didn't hear the, the, the sound? I can't hear it yet. Oh. But that is okay. Yeah, you know, this is a very visual show. Uh, Maybe one second. Can you hear it? Not yet. It says it's seventy percent, but uh, the volume. Oh. Still don't hear the song. Uh, the sound. No, can I can't hear it. I tested it earlier. Um, no. Just give me one second. <clears throat> Yes, we got it. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept. It's a beautiful sunny day outside. 
people in there, it's dark, kind of blue, it feels like nighttime. Got families lying down, just watching with their kids. It's, yeah, it's, it's a very different atmosphere to the outside world right now. As I came in, my first reaction was, wow, absolutely wow. And then also the, the surroundings of the Great Hall, because, and to see the people all enjoying themselves and finding it interesting. I didn't expect to see people laying on the floor, just chilling out, which is quite nice. The idea behind the Museum of the Moon actually came from living in Bristol. Bristol's got the second highest tidal range in the whole of Europe. So there's a 13 metre gap between high tide and low tide. And it's the moon that's making that happen. The amazing thing about the moon is it acts as a cultural mirror. So every culture has different stories and mythologies uh, and stories to tell about the moon. The more you let your eyes just sit and focus on it, the more it looks real. It was amazing. You thought it was amazing, did you? Yeah. Why did you think it was so amazing? Because there was aliens. Because there were aliens? And it was very exciting and a very uplifting visual experience. It was really big. Was it? What did you like about it? It had lots of craters on. To it. And what did it feel like when you were underneath? It felt like it was falling on us. Did it? Really? I thought it was very peaceful and calming. I think it's absolutely beautiful. I think it's I've got this incredible, there's such a simplicity to the idea, but it's got this amazing imposing nature and it's just exquisitely to live with. I think it's a great piece. It's the fact that I've got the imagination going, it's fantastic, you know? It's really good. I actually saw aliens. You did see aliens, okay. She saw the aliens. That's great. Uh, yeah. Do we have a second video about the Earth, Ken? Can you can you hear me, Ken? Oh, sorry, I muted myself. Yeah, sure. I'm about to play this. Okay. Uh, Apollo 8, this is Houston. Uh, it's a good picture of the horizon. Uh, we can't see many terrain features as yet. Uh, Apollo 8, Houston. We're beginning to pick up a few uh, craters uh, very dimly. The whole thing is pretty bright. Roger, there's not much definition up there either on the horizon. We're now approaching. I was immediately moved to tears. My daughter said to me, why are you crying? I said, I'm not crying, I'm just humbled. It was very cool because um, it was really big and you could lie underneath it and have photos where you hold it. You come off the busy street and everyone just stops and there's like a sense of stillness as it's spinning around really slowly. I just felt really like proud in a weird way as well. All of your senses are, are, are involved. It was amazing. You know, you come from normal life and then you get this little glimpse of something behind the door and then you walk into this amazing dark room. My name is Luke Jerram and I'm the artist behind the Gaia Earth artwork. Humanity has been staring at the moon for 200,000 years. The moon has inspired so much music and mythology and literature and every culture right around the world. Whereas it's only been 50 years that, that humanity has been able to see our planet planet Earth from space as a, as a blue marble floating in the blackness of space. I was so mesmerised by it. It's quite awe-inspiring really. That mixture of fragility and, and strength that is there. We were thinking about how small we were. And it feels like I'm on, on, I'm on the moon and I'm looking at the earth. It makes us wonder perhaps what we're doing to our world, what it'll be like for our children's children. It's probably the first time that my son has seen the world in that sort of context. He doesn't understand yet but he will one day. It makes you feel very small. <laughs> I think we need to, to save the world. <laughs> I'm hoping when people come and see this Earth artwork, they'll realise the beauty and the fragility of our planet and that actually it's our only home and we really have to look after it. If we don't take action, the collapse of our civilizations and the extinction 
of much of the natural world is on the horizon. Together, we can make real change happen. All right, um, we have uh, three minutes uh, of, uh, of discussion time or uh, any comments or questions. Uh, I will take the prerogative and say that um, in just, in just getting a globe out there um, uh, for all to see um, you know, with the moon or the earth or even the planets uh, instills awe and wonder um, in uh, the uh, the young and the old alike, um, uh, you know, how do you explain this uh, in scientific terms? Uh, I have pondered this. I've I've, uh, I've heard people uh, talk about it. Uh, <laughs> the simplest explanation is it is beyond. It is beyond the uh, the capacity of the principles of science and technology. It's not in the charter. It's not in the dogma uh, of science and technology to answer such questions. And so it's about awe and wonder, and we'll hear about awe and wonder uh, later on in our meet meeting. Um, did we have a question? Uh, it, yes. Uh, Many of these um, uh, exhibitions were in the UK before it went to um, uh, the uh, um, uh, mainland Europe. And um, uh, Luke is planning to bring it to Southern California. So we are in touch with him. And he has presented in the US before. Uh, so you will get to see them uh, in uh, different parts of the United States and the continental uh, US and um, Canada. and. Uh, uh, we wish uh, 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 Luke that uh, his daughter is feeling much better now um, uh, and uh, hopefully they're back at home. Um, uh, thank you for sharing with us, uh, Luke. And uh, we are on to, uh, it seems at, at the University of Arizona, um, uh, Professor Coquinos did look at, uh, at uh, getting uh, the exhibition there. We'd love to get it at the California Museum of Science too. Um, so uh, we look forward to that. Uh, uh, thank you, Chris. So with that, we are right on time for the next uh, event. Uh, and uh, uh, that is from uh, Dr. Jacques Arnoult. He is um, the historian of the sciences and um, Catholic theologian. Uh, he is an ordained uh, um, um, uh, a minister um, and he is the ethics advisor for CNES, the, the French space agency. Uh, he is unable to be with us. He's on a flight uh, headed on this weekend and uh, he sent me a synopsis of, uh, uh, of his work which I think uh, you can put up, Ken, or shall I? Let me, let me put it up here. I have to do the same process again here, let's see. One minute. Is that good? Ken? Only see, see your folders. Oh, it's still? Okay. Let me go back.
We are trying to show his Word document, the one he sent. No, I'm showing the slides. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, let me hear. Um, Not coming up. Are you, what, what are you seeing now? I'm still seeing the folders. Folders, okay. Uh, let's see. Did he send you the slides? He did. No, okay. I made them. Oh, you made them. Okay. Hold on one minute. Excuse me, I have a problem for me here. Um, okay, and I'm getting all kinds of stuff here. Let's see, new share. What do we see, Ken? Still folders. <laughs> Stuck on the folders, huh? And you don't see this now, huh? Sure, no. it's paused. Okay, it's going to come up now. <clears throat> what about now? Now it's yes. Okay, good. I'm going to go full screen. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Jacques Arnold, as I mentioned, is the ethics advisor for CNES. And uh, he sent me this following. Um, um, short article I'm about to read to you. Space Oddity, a brief philosophical meditation inspired by David Bowie. Singer David Bowie was nicknamed the space rocker. This is no coincidence. Several of his works have had the theme of space. The first of these, and perhaps the most famous, is entitled Space Odyssey. It features Major Tom, recounts a space trip and his tragic end. David Bowie recorded the song in June of 1969, a year after the film 2001, A Space Odyssey from Kubrick and Clark, and a few weeks before the Apollo 11 mission. Space Oddity was even broadcast to accompany the BBC report on this lunar mission. Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield performed the song in a modified version on the International Space Station in 2013. And Elon Musk chose it to accompany the journey of his model Starman during the launch of his first Falcon Heavy rocket in February of 2018. I do not seek to analyze 
the place occupied by space oddity in Bowie's masterful work, but I'm inspired by it to reflect on the contemporary situation of space. I mean space activities. And I use the double meaning of the term oddity. Oddity can mean curiosity or singularity. Curiosity, the term seems appropriate to describe the current theater of space activities. The emergence of new space, the renewed interest and even the enthusiasm it arouses for space are already reasons to speak of a situation, if not curious, at least difficult to predict 15 years ago. But even more curious seems the coexistence of events and announcements which, without being contradictory, nevertheless seem to be in opposition. The first steps in space of Richard Banson and Jeff Bezos were generously broadcasted and commented. They are in fact ushering in the time of space tourism that no longer depends solely on the goodwill of space agencies. And for this reason, they have delighted space aficionados. The success of Branson and Bezos is indisputable, as well as that of Elon Musk, who chose Crew Dragon's capsules are the only ones capable of transporting astronauts from Cape Canaveral to the ISS. But these successes are not enough to consolidate the plans of manned space flight to Mars and the colonization of the settlement of the red planet presented by these space barons. The difference between the step of orbital tourist and the step of a alien settler or colonist is too big. The gap is wide. Even more curious is the diversity of links with the Earth, whose state of emergency we are increasingly measuring. Space provides much of the data needed to measure climate change and its consequences. This observation leads to a choice. Should we plan to leave Earth? to flee it and to look elsewhere in space for a place to ensure the survival of our species? Or should we rather commit our resources and our efforts to the concern, preservation, and restoration of terrestrial environments? Never has the debate been so real, more concrete between the supporters of an Earth considered as a spaceship that we must imperatively care about and those of the construction of a space arc. Singularity. The term is appreciated today by proponents of technological singularity and transhumanism. It then designates a break in our knowledge and techniques that would bring humanity into an era totally different from the one we know today without necessarily thinking of such a radical evolution, it must be recognized that space technology has influenced and even modified our humanity. Being able to reach outer space, move around it, explore it and use it, it is already a revolution for us Earthlings beyond the mere improvement of our daily lives. In this way, we have become dependent on space to a greater extent than we actually do. And we are only at the beginning. Whatever happens tomorrow in space or from space, the discovery of extraterrestrial life, the arrival of human crew on Mars, the exploitation of space resources, the intensification of the use of space technology, for our terrestrial activities, our cultures, our ideologies, our philosophies will be significantly modified because space is a real oddity. 
What should we think of this? What should we do with it? The debate is all the more open because so far it has not really begun. In any case, we cannot be satisfied with Major Tom's attitude. There is nothing I can do. We cannot, as members of human species, be satisfied with the choice made by a single individual as Major Tom, that of remaining adrift. These are two strange times to be satisfied with such an attitude. Space remains a real new frontier for us. Thank you, Dr. Jacques Arnoult. I think you've said it all. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, three minutes for questions, right? Okay. Uh, any thoughts? Uh, you know, I, 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 um, uh, Jacques has written several books on the subject, very spiritual, some of them. And um, I resonate with uh, some of these uh, points he makes. And uh, uh, I don't know if we have time, but I think we should play uh, the song. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, he stands out so much because of his uh, heterochromic uh, eyes and uh, was quite a figure. Uh, he used to be, uh, he used to call himself a showman and did not really think of himself as a singer. Uh, but uh, uh, David Bowie is special. Uh, did you want to play the song? It takes a little, you got two minutes. Uh, um, Turn 
Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Ken. Uh, now, uh, we are going to, th you know, it's a very interesting uh, time, 1960s, moving on into the 70s, uh, just in the rock scene. Uh, I recall the first paintings, uh, face paintings came out from David Bowie, and then went on to Kiss and to other groups, uh, the whole idea of uh, presentation on the on the um, on the stage uh, we don't have time for questions um, <laughs> you don't need uh, uh, questions for that act from david bowie and group i'm on to our next speaker and that is uh, dr mark wagner go for it mark all right i'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen and thanks madhu what a great uh, start to the gathering uh, hopefully you guys can see my slides and just my slides, right? Yes. yes okay, we fantastic. Well, I will uh, dive right in. Got a few minutes to talk to you guys about the Moon Village School. I'm really thrilled to, to be here to share this and forward to the questions and any discussion that follows. Uh, as all of you know, humanity's multi-planet future is fast approaching. Uh, NASA and SpaceX have plans to put people on the moon this decade and Mars the next uh, Elon Musk wants to put a million people on Mars. Bezos talks about trillions of people in O'Neill-style habitats. So the question is, uh, with that future before us, how might we, in the language of design thinking, uh, educate the first students on the moon? And I've been looking at this question from a lot of different angles, preparing today's students to, to be a part of all of that. Uh, I was looking at what would a school on Mars look like in one of Elon's first communities. And John Mankins, who's with us today, uh, encouraged me to look at the Moon Village Association's work and, and uh, think about what a school would be like in the uh, settlement that they're planning uh, on the moon. Uh, now, John's work is mostly related to uh, settling near Shackleton Crater at the South Pole, where there would be sunlight for uh, solar power all year long. There's water ice for mining. Um, and of course, you see the, uh, the moon hanging above the horizon uh, at all times for a great experience of the overview effect. So it would be a pretty fantastic place to educate students. So I first started thinking about this in ways similar to the way I was thinking about a school on Mars, where the time delay in communications would be pretty significant. Uh, at my desk, the latency here is about 26 milliseconds when I uh, ping a speed test server. Uh, anything under 100 is fantastic. Uh, anything up to about 300 is probably acceptable, but to the moon, uh, it would be a 2,500 millisecond round trip to the Earth, of course. Now, this is uh, totally acceptable for uh, text messages and web browsing and research, uh, though local caching might be convenient. Um, and it's actually acceptable for something like this, uh, given that there's some norms for communication so you're not speaking over each other. Two and a half second delay is not, not bad. Uh, if we consider bandwidth, Nokia is currently under contract to provide 20 megabits a second. Uh, for the, uh, the next constructions on the moon. I think we can expect uh, SpaceX um, Starlink satellites there by the time SpaceX is there or soon after, at least by the time we're developing a school. Uh, they're doing 300 megabits per second by the end of this year. They're shooting for a gigabit. And I imagine we can expect that on the moon too, which is more than enough. 
But if we start talking about uh, virtual reality and a small number of students on the moon are gonna benefit greatly from virtual reality or even artificial intelligence, uh, that 2,500 millisecond delay is pretty significant. You want that to be more like uh, 50 for virtual reality. Uh, you don't wanna turn your head and wait two and a half seconds to talk to Facebook servers with your Oculus before you see a change. Uh, so there's gonna need to be some sort of cloud-based uh, resources on the moon, perhaps uh, something like these uh, mobile Azure data centers that, uh, that fit into a shipping container. You can throw one of those uh, onto a Starship, right? So some cloud-based uh, local resources would be great on the moon if we're talking about VR and AR. But with a 2,500 millisecond delay, most asynchronous learning activities would work great. Uh, kids can watch videos, listen to podcasts, they can certainly do research online. And even a good number of synchronous learning activities will work again, like I said, with some norms for communication. Uh, kids could be communicating with uh, peers and experts around the globe uh, in, in real time. Now, if we look at this unique situation on the moon and start thinking about pragmatic things like school schedules, now the day is, is a month long or 28 days long uh, with two weeks in the sunlight, two weeks in the dark on most of the moon, it wouldn't be quite as bad uh, on the South Pole. But what does that do to kids uh, um, psychological reality, right? If you worry about kids in the Northwest, Pacific Northwest, uh, suffering from seasonal affective disorder in the winter, uh, what happens when they're inside all the time on the moon or there's uh, extended periods of darkness? Uh, if, if we look at the realities of supervision, because uh, in a lot of ways, education systems are, are babysitting systems. Uh, we learned during the COVID-19 pandemic so far uh, that busy working parents uh, have a hard time supervising their kids who are supposed to be doing distance learning. So would there be something like a one-room schoolhouse? Would there be pods where a, a small number of parents watch over the kids and take turns like a co-op? Uh, what would that look like? Uh, if you consider a learning space, so let's say we're going to make an actual physical school on the moon, uh, it would need to be a flexible space because presumably space would be limited with flexible furniture uh, as you find in modern classrooms. Uh, I started giving some thought to the fact there'd have to be really high ceilings so that the kids are not literally bouncing off the ceilings in the in the 16G. And you wouldn't need stairs or even gathering stairs, for instance, and something like a fireman's pole would be appropriate to go between levels. Uh, I, I uh, put some thought into a plan for three levels so that the uh, level above the classroom might be a, a space, a quiet space for study, maybe with some uh, glass conference rooms like you might find at uh, Google or Facebook. Uh, and hopefully a nice view of the crater out of direct sunlight would be fantastic. Uh, perhaps at the lowest floor beneath the flexible classroom, there might be a maker space where kids could work on drones and robotics. Um, perhaps there could be an airlock on this level where they could uh, get their creations out, uh, out of doors and test them that way and perhaps go outdoors uh, on their own as well. Now, I did a study uh, that concluded at the beginning of the summer on uh, what this school might look like if we look at the actual programs involved. Uh, and a lot of the uh, participant responses focused on the best of the one-room schoolhouse. So multi-age classrooms, uh, mentoring of younger students, uh, being able to work in small groups at your level, regardless of your age or grade level. Uh, a second focus was the best of distance learning. So uh, not looking at drill and kill and doing worksheets online, but looking at uh, truly uh, individualized, differentiated instruction, opportunities to create and edit and share on a global scale. Uh, and to connect again with peers and experts around the world. No reason that couldn't be happening uh, for the kids on the moon. Uh, I didn't mention, by the way, uh, they're, they're looking at an initial settlement of 125 individuals, multi-generational, and statistically that would be 20 to 25 kids of school age. So uh, those kids are gonna have to connect with teachers and peers around the world to get the most out of their education experience. Anyway, a third a theme to come out was uh, incorporating the best of international schools. So. Uh, a real cosmopolitan or super cosmopolitan, we can call it now, right? Uh, approach to schools, um, high expectations and the flexibility to, uh, to innovate. Uh, I did give some thought to uh, physical education. Uh, I, who knows, perhaps there would actually be moon boarding. There's a video game about it now. Um, and some thought to additional psychological challenges of kids uh, and physical challenges being exposed to uh, radiation and so forth or else uh, having to hide from it kids there would definitely need a degree of resilience. Uh, the positive psychology programs that are becoming important during the pandemic would certainly be important in a situation uh, on the moon, but it would be great for field trips for relatively little energy expenditure. Uh, students could get into orbit. Maybe they could visit Gateway Station. Uh, they could get a true uh, overview effect uh, of the whole cislunar system uh, from space. Uh, and if we're in a situation someday where we've got uh, man-made habitats 
uh, like O'Neill style cylinders or other uh, space settlements uh, in Earth orbit, uh, they could easily uh, travel between those for the, for the culture experience. Now going back down to the Earth might be another challenge. So uh, I do have a couple of minutes for questions, uh, provided I, I still get my full time out of. Uh, and uh, I've got one invitation for everyone uh, in attendance uh, when the questions are done. Yes, you do, Mark. You have your time. Go for it. Questions for Mark. You know, um, you know Mark, communication is very interesting. You know, I trained under Eb Recton, um, uh, who was considered the father of the deep space, deep space network. Mm. And he would smile at me and say, at the end of the day, everybody comes to the communication person and they yep. want a link because one of the fundamental heuristics in system architecting is, a space system architecting is loss of link equal to loss of mission. Mm -hmm. And it's a very important thing to remember. Um, go for it, questions for Mark. I'm looking at the chat. The moon is a harsh mistress, yes. <laughs> Space is hard. Yes, we had a, a, we had a student propose a, such a supercomputer nexus on the moon because we thought we'll have a lot of facilities all around the moon and, and the data pipe will ha have to be uh, on the moon uh, rather than having several beams uh, aimed at Earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know working in education technology in schools, if the, uh, if the internet's down, it's, it's very disruptive these days. So we, we couldn't have that. <laughs> yes, there have is. to be lots of backup. All right, it looks like there may be something in Q&A. Uh, Real-time spacecraft. Oh, yes. Oh, that'd be if you're talking about students controlling spacecraft, I think that's, that's one of the real benefits of having them there is they can easily launch something and, and do their own science uh, or be involved with science that's based on the moon, perhaps that their parents uh, are engaged in. That's right. All right, I'm going to go to my last slide, though, if that's okay, and, and invite everyone here, particularly the presenters, but any of you that are doing relevant work uh, to submit articles to the Journal of Space Philosophy. I spent the last year as a scholar with Kepler Space Institute um, and got to know uh, Bob Crone and, and Gordon Arthur, who have uh, been editors of the journal, um, and would love to invite on their behalf anyone here to, uh, to submit an article. And uh, you can go to the link there or reach out to Gordon or I. Um, and we'd be happy to, uh, to work with you on that. But thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to share some of my thoughts about education in space and uh, looking forward to collaborating with more of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I mean, uh, Bob uh, Cron is special. He's listening to us. And uh, uh, Bob and I go a long way back. He, is a, uh, he was uh, part of the uh, esteemed USC faculty for many years. Uh, where he trained uh, uh, people in space about space management. And um, uh, I've written for the uh, yes, um, Journal of Space Philosophy. And I always like to say, you know, we start to philosophize later on in life when most of our work is done, but we should start early because uh, as we mentioned in the beginning, um, uh, why we do something is far more important to communicate in a particularly complex organization, because many, many times, as Dan mentioned up front, you will be asked questions that are not in the book and you have to guide by the seat of your pants. It is the job of the manager. And I think, I think Bob Crone will tell you this, flying as a test pilot too. Bill Haynes used, used to be, I don't know if Bob knows Bill, Bill Haynes used to be in our um, community in AIAA and he would tell me some of the tricks that test pilots use because people would say, why do you need test pilots? We can use a robot. No, no, you can't because there's so much going on uh, uh, during a flight uh, of a test vehicle uh, that requires a human. Anyhow, thank, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mark. Delighted, continue, continue with your good work. Uh, it's very special, particularly for the children. Thank you, Mark. Thank, thank you, Bob. Uh, let us Thanks, go Bob. On. Glad you're here. It's uh, an honor to be with all this group here. Um, Bob, let's let's get a, a an issue. I think Gordon Arthur is also here. Uh, he's an incredible editor. Uh, let's think of getting a, a JSP issue devoted uh, uh, to this particular uh, event, Bob. 
let's do, and it can be a default issue. Okay, great. Okay, we are on time. And our next speaker is joining us from Naples, the wonderful um, um, part of uh, Italy. And uh, uh, he is none other than Dr. Gennaro Russo. Um, he is uh, uh, special uh, because he is also one of those uh, um, you know, one of those thought leaders uh, about about space activities. I've known his work for a while, and he runs um, the Center for Near Space, and uh, um, uh, he has some very special things to tell us. Um, uh, Reno, go for it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Madhu. Uh, good uh, good morning, everybody. I share my video, my screen. I mean, um, uh, Reno, everything. Am I uh, saying the right thing that you graduated from uh, La, um, uh, La Sapienza? I graduated from Naples University first, and then I got my PhD in La Sapienza. La Sapienza, very good, great. Okay, <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. So can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, very good. So good, uh, as I said, uh, uh, sort of philosophy, we are, uh, we are, uh, the Center for Near Space is a, is a voluntary association. So we do not have, uh, you know, static uh, structures, uh, thousands or hundreds of people or engineers or architects or philosophers working day by day. So uh, we are, we are, uh, um, uh, let's say, a dynamically changing group of people, uh, including uh, many kind of uh, uh, people from doctors to architects, from engineers to students and then old people uh, and things like that. So uh, and we uh, say try to imagine what will uh, what will be our uh, our future. So Cheese Lunar City is the mother of uh, I will uh, talk about. Uh, the word anticipation is something special for us. Anticipation is something uh, that goes, uh, let's say, beyond the, the, the foresight uh, or, uh, or forecast. So we try to, to imagine uh, the, the, the future, not the very far future, but somewhere, somewhat uh, a, a, a far future. Uh, in other terms, we are talking, thinking about the end of this century. Uh, our, uh, let's say, toys, our, uh, our uh, tools, if you want, uh, are the space culture, uh, the civil astronautics and the private uh, use of, uh, user community. And this is uh, the expansion of humanity into space is our, uh, let's say, philosophy, uh, going back to what Madhu was asking and was telling us before. Uh, and it is clear that uh, such kind of action is already is, is in place. I mean, it's already begun. begun. Uh, what we think, uh, what, what we do, uh, thinking about the future, is trying always to identify the technologies, how the technology will evolve. It is a not not the story, of course, to imagine how 3D printing uh, we, will evolve in uh, 40 years, in 50 years, uh, as well as other technologies. But we are trying to to extrapolate these kind of things. Uh, um, and for one of the first things uh, is the following: L looking at the present. Uh, the, the actual signals, trying to understand what, it, what, what will happen in the future. And for what concerns space infrastructure, the signals of today uh, uh, talks about uh, uh, just, a, just a, a position of modules built on Earth, brought in orbit directly from the Earth, and they're simply, in brackets, integrated. This was uh, done for the space station. This was done even before, of course, for Skylab, for other kind of, uh, of infrastructures. Uh, this is being done for uh, 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 you know, Chinese uh, uh, space, uh, space station. And this will happen uh, hopefully soon for what concerns the gateway around the moon, uh, uh, etc. Uh, so it's uh, just a, a picture of what is going on. And of course, one of the major, major issues is that uh, we are constrained by the uh, our present ability to bring things from from the uh, surface of Earth into 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 space. <clears throat> but this is, from our point point of view, it's a sort of uh, paleolithic, paleolithic stage because we are at the very first, if you want, uh, stage of uh, uh, space infrastructure building. If, if, 
to a certain extent, the very, very, the, the, the masterpiece of the International Space Station is not very far from the very first uh, uh, cars uh, of uh, more than 100 years ago, of course. Uh, we, we uh, at the Center for Neo Space, we created a, a group of people uh, and uh, we labeled this kind of uh, people uh, Orbitecture, the Orbitecture Working Group. Orbitecture is a, a neologism uh, standing for Orbital Architect Architecture that was coined by us to underline, to stress the importance of a multidisciplinary, integrated and synergistic approach in thinking about the future. And you can see uh, on the bottom of the, of the, of the slide uh, something that you will uh, see a bit more uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, this is a, 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 a possible, a possible, I underline the word, a possible, a feasible uh, infrastructure to be built with a new approach. And what kind of technical, uh, let, let me say, requirements we are looking for? We have identified uh, very philosophical, <laughs> if you want, uh, uh, requirements. So minimize the weight per capita of the infrastructure, maximize or anyway give more space per capita for uh, for uh, in the infrastructure, and integrate and take into account of uh, number of activities that are absolutely impossible, even inconceivable, to be, to be carried out uh, on board the International Space Station. International Space Station is a wonderful piece of, uh, of uh, engineering, it's a wonderful, wonderful piece of uh, uh, multinational activities and so forth. It's also, but it's a, it's a laboratory. Uh, it, it is very, very, let me say, impossible to live uh, over there at least for what concerns ordinary, ordinary people. So, taking this into account, we are imagining the, the Chisluna city, 2069. It's symbolically 100, 100 years after the first step of a, of a man outside the earth. We like to use this periphrasis. The first step outside the earth. And uh, you can see this is the last city for us is some uh, will be before the end of the century, more generically, will be a sort of uh, city, small city, thousand, thousand inhabitants distributed over a dozen, a dozen uh, uh, districts uh, with the distributed, uh, you know, main functions, uh, as, as you can see uh, depicting this, uh, in this uh, slide. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we are going to a bit study uh, each of these uh, districts. We have studied up now the the space hub and the Luna Fab, as we will see in a, in a moment. Uh, first of all, the macro functions uh, that uh, identified for the entire city uh, are uh, are listed here. I don't want to go into all words, of course, but I want to underline that the first. It is not a case. That is the first is industry. Then comes research and management. Uh, why first research? We will see. Also, we will see later on uh, concrete uh, elements for that. Uh, there is no possibility that uh, national governments or even the world governments in general could uh, could uh, uh, create a Chisuna city. The, the involved, involved costs are too much for, uh, for uh, the space agencies altogether, I mean, and even uh, the governments. Uh, so it is absolutely uh, in, in, important, fundamental, uh, fundamental to have uh, and to uh, simulate the, reality, the creation of a, an economic environment. So, so something must be produced, must, must be uh, sold, and things like that. Uh, let, let, let's touch some numbers. I don't want to enter the number uh, per se, of course. Uh, uh, you, you see here the, the, the districts, the 12 districts, uh, the, where they are located, uh, the main function of each, uh, of each district, and we have tried to estimate, uh, uh, imagine, imagine the population in each, uh, in each uh, district. You see, we have around 1,000 uh, people. And we then uh, also distributed uh, uh, this kind of people uh, uh, in uh, four different uh, categories. Uh, what I want to stress is, the, is that research, today space is essentially research. 
many people talk about uh, industrialization, mining, I think like that. But if you touch, according to what I know at least, uh, if you go into a bit uh, detail, uh, so very, very few elements, or, or even less than few, <laughs> uh, are, are available. Uh, essentially, you are still talking, we were still talking about research for years. And this is uh, a limitation, by the way. Uh, research in our viewers should be not much than 10-15% uh, in terms of uh, uh, pe people, of course. Uh, management is an, is an important uh, uh, action, uh, as we will see, as it, it happens on, on Earth, by the way. The Space Up, just, uh, just a slide on the Space Up, this is the, the uh, let's say, the, the uh, interchangeable, interchangeable uh, node, uh, interchange node, sorry. Uh, pull, uh, located into uh, Lagrangian point uh, L1. Uh, is, it, it is called uh, Space Up and uh, has been uh, designed uh, for under people the district, analyzing the functions, by the way, and uh, the anticipation approach brought us to what we call plane planetomorphic uh, 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 you know, configuration, something that uh, in a way recalls the, the, sh the, the shapes of, of the planets. A sort of natural configuration rather than uh, the uh, just up position configuration of the present uh, IAS. Uh, I don't go into all details uh, of what we have of this light elements. Uh, we have identified a number of um, fundamental. We have based our investigation on specific technologies, autonomous uh, swarms of robotic systems, and things of, of course uh, 3D printing uh, to a larger extent. Let me say. Uh, and you can see in terms of volume per, per capita and density per capita, we have, uh, we have identified a strong, uh, a strong step ahead with respect to the IS. Why, Why uh, the, the density is so small? Because uh, of the <laughs> volume uh, per capita. People must have space for, uh, for social activities, for their, their, uh, their uh, health, they, they, uh, they have to, to, to take care of their uh, simple life, apart from working. This is the second, uh, just a snapshot of the second, uh, let's say, um, district that we have studied. Luna Fab stands for, for Luna Fabric or uh, Lunar uh, Factory, if you want. It's 120 people district. Uh, and in order to minimize the impact of the structure with the soil, with the, with the, the land of, of uh, the ground or the moon, uh, we, uh, we uh, identified what we call an archaeological approach, exactly as we do it, uh, on Earth. You can see here a slow motion, which uh, uh, that uh, that uh, gives you an idea on uh, the modality, the process of building each of these cupola. Uh, just three three points of connection with the, with the ground plus a, a main one, of course. Then we will build. Uh, the idea is to build first of all the the, the upper part, and then from the top going down. With the, the uh, with the the uh, you know the rooms and then the the uh, production uh, location uh, ambience etc etc. Okay, now from uh, from what concerns the economic structure again, I don't want to go into into the detail, but uh, based on the functions that uh, <clears throat> that uh, I already showed before, we have identified a very top level. Uh, 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 structure of the economy of such a city, and you can see here the transportation system that is uh, that has to be complex. Having thousand people uh, in a city and distributed over uh, twelve district needs, you know, a, a frequent uh, you know, connection uh, between all the all the districts. The industrial system, uh, nothing to to add. Uh, uh, on top of what I've already said, tourism system and science and technology research system that is very much distributed, must be very much distributed, including, of course, the exploration mission towards uh, Mars and near-Earth uh, asteroids. <coughs> Sorry. 
So just a, a word about uh, situational transportation. These are typological uh, orbits. Uh, uh, we have identified uh, two important uh, uh, circle lines, and uh, what we call the Earth Moon circle line connecting continuously the Earth and Moon. And the second one is the Lagrangian circle line connecting the three used uh, Lagrangian points, and then there are point-to-point -point, uh, or side-to-side -side, uh, specific lines. A uh, few words about uh, the characteristics and the dimension that we have estimated. So we estimated under, uh, uh, under 20,000 passengers uh, per year over the different districts, uh, plus under 100,000 under, uh, uh, tons of cargo of uh, goods uh, to be distributed, including the surface of Earth, of course. And so we, uh, we uh, assuming as a reference uh, the, star, the Starship uh, you know, cost, uh, but assuming uh, is, uh, one single vehicle configuration for all the system in order to reduce the non-recurring uh, uh, cost, uh, you know, uh, we will have uh, something like 22 operational transportation vehicles plus five in, uh, in, uh, you know, in maintenance. Uh, and the full set of scheduled flight completes, complete, is completed every 1.5 terrestrial days. This is, uh, uh, this is uh, our, these are our estimations. The space economics, economics. Uh, again, I don't want to go into details, but I want to say that uh, I want to underline that according to us, the annual budget in 2070 it's expected at the, at the present economic condition is expected to be in the order of, let's say, 4 billion euros or 4 billion dollars is, uh, is the same. But what is important is that the infrastructure represents something like, like 90%. Infrastructure does not mean building the infrastructure, it means maintenance, managing and, and, uh, and uh, keeping the, the infrastructure uh, in good shape, uh, you know. In, in order to, to cover this, it is necessary that the system create revenues. And this, is, can, this can only be done uh, as, a, as a main uh, element from the industry point of view. You can put every kind of period, all the a thousand people staying as, uh, as tourists all the day, etc. and you can multiply that, that ticket uh, by 1,000, you will never get uh, this kind of cost. So, so essentially it is paramount uh, imaging that uh, the industry or find the way to, to uh, develop a, a, a real industry over there. Reno, we have to wind up. Yeah, okay. I think that, uh, that uh, I have completed. This is just uh, the indication of the overall cost, uh, cumulated cost uh, that is in the order of $60 trillion. Uh, uh, that is not far, not different from the estimation we got from the open literature. And uh, this is the, my concluding consideration that uh, uh, we, we think that uh, looking at the life cycle of the fusion grid technologies, we, uh, we are already in a new, in a new uh, grid, uh, grid technology that we call age of space industry. We are at the beginning of, of course, but we believe that this will be the, the near uh, cycle, the, the, the next cycle, sorry. So thank you very much for your uh, attention. Uh, thank you, Gino. A lot to think about in those slides. Uh, I thoroughly enjoy your orbits. Uh, uh, I'm an orbits fan uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, I, I mentioned in chat that once we put our populations into um, a cislunar regime, wars and wants will be obsolete, Reno. And oh. that is the plan. Thank you very much. This is, uh, this is the hope, at least. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Christopher uh, is next. Uh, uh, Professor Chris uh, Kakinos. Uh, 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 surprised me one time by uh, sending me a book and inviting me to review. And uh, that was the beginning of our connections. Uh, University of Arizona and Arizona State University are the nexus of some incredible 
space science activities. Uh, Chris is uh, involved in many of it, not to mention also a philosopher and a poet. Welcome, Chris. Thank you so much. And can you uh, can you hear me okay? Uh, well, we can hear you well. Do you have slides or just, are you just going to talk? I'm, well, I think I'll just talk. I have slides okay. at the end, um, but I'll also be mindful of the time as well. And I, I just, again, want to thank, um, thank you, Madhu. Thank you, Ken, uh, for asking me to be a, a part of this. The, the uh, book that, that you referenced, uh, I should have a copy to show, but it's called Beyond Earth's Edge, The Poetry of Spaceflight. Um, and I'll, I'll say a couple of things about that here in, in a moment, but I'm just, I'm honored to be a part of this, uh, this conversation, uh, being a part of uh, a, um, a discussion with, with some, some folks I've admired from a distance uh, and, as, and, and some voices that, that are new to me in this discussion of sort of the aesthetic and cultural and, and philosophical underpinnings of space exploration, space science, space um, settlement, all interrelated, but not necessarily the same thing. So I, I wanna to talk today a little bit about the arts in space. It, it's a huge uh, area. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'll try to keep this uh, uh, focused. Um, say something about you know, this, this notion of mission laureates, having artists embedded with missions, uh, robotic and crude. Uh, and then I have some practical considerations. I may even uh, read a, a quick poem as well, if, if you'll indulge me. <clears throat> so again, thank you. Um, and as we know, the arts have, have long been engaged with astronomy, with the night sky, and much more recently, of course, with space programs. I think most of us probably are familiar with NASA's uh, well-known uh, fine arts program that placed painters and illustrators such as Robert Rauschenberg and Norman Rockwell in the middle of launch facilities and training facilities and more. There's the long tradition of space art popularized by uh, Chesley Bonestell, fine arts photographers of late such as Michael Light with his beautiful book Full Moon have given their craft and time over to, to space imagery. And, and of course, many writers as well. In the modern era, um, and, and a nod to our, our friends uh, in Italy, uh, I think of Oriana Falacci with her, her book, uh, If the Sun Dies. Uh, and more recently, Margaret Lazarus Dean. And as co-editor of that uh, poetry book, Beyond Earth's Edge, The Poetry of Spaceflight, I know that poets have responded vigorously, if not always enthusiastically during the Apollo era, it's a whole story we could talk about. Much more recently, more enthusiasm uh, uh, with poets, in, at least in the English speaking tradition, in response to the space age. So there's, you know, there's a lot there, uh, too much to talk about in just a few minutes, but there's a really good overview of the visual arts and space agencies, in particular NASA and ESA, in a paper uh, by William Bazooka. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly for the Aerospace Corporation. I recommend you finding it online. It's called Space and Art Connecting Two Creative Endeavors. And his focus, again, um, as I think has been mostly the focus of space art ventures and art space ventures, is with the visuals. So everything from the Apollo 15 you know, Fallen Astronaut Memorial to um, uh, space art imagery, large installation work at, at various facilities, uh, films, classroom displays, art contests. And, and of course, you know, we await the, um, the billionaire curated art of the uh, SpaceX Dear Moon mission, uh, should that happen. So I, I just wanna say that there are a lot of arts that have gotten kind of the short shrift uh, when we think about the relationship between the arts and space exploration, uh, ceramicists, textile artists, we don't hear people talking about them, modern dance uh, choreography. Um, and in my case, I would say poetry, even though the number of uh, real and fictional astronauts who've, who've called on poets to be launched into space, uh, is, it's a long list, uh, longer than I have uh, time to, to share. I also wanna say just briefly before I talk about the Mission Laureate concept that um, later on this year for the Moon Village Association, I'm gonna have some other thoughts uh, as I sort of begin this exploration of space and arts and policy approaches. Um, the Moon Village Association Conference, I believe in December, uh, where I wanna talk about all artist analog missions here on the earth. But here uh, today, quickly, I wanna talk about Mission Laureates. Um, a laureate, of course, is, you know, refers to someone who's received an honor and it derives from the ancient Greek practice of putting a laurel wreath, which probably cover my bald head, 
uh, on, on the head of the honoree, the laurel tree was sacred to Apollo, uh, interestingly, interestingly enough. Um, and he was the uh, patron deity of poets. And I, you know, I think we're mostly all familiar with the countries having poet laureates, Britain, the United States. It's tradition that spread to towns and municipalities, certainly in, in the US. And these uh, write, poets, mostly, um, are asked to engage the public to write outward facing work, okay? So work that is in some respects for, you know, specifically for non-literary audiences. So it's, it's a form of public engagement. So I wanna talk here about a new kind of laureate, not attached to a country or a region, but to a mission, specifically missions to space. And in brief, these mission laureates would create work inspired by robotic probes, by crude missions uh, for wider public engagement. I'm not calling for art that is propaganda, which has been a danger in the national history of poet laureates, um, but work that provides new and exciting perspectives that can link a mission to wider currents in science and human affairs. Uh, we've, we've had some discussion here already about um, the, the challenges that we face here on earth. Maybe there's more to say about that in the concluding panel. So I think of these artists who would be interested in, in mission laureate possibilities probably, you know, because they're interested, they're gonna be pro-space, um, but they would bring nuance and complexity to, to um, describing and inspiring uh, what these missions might be. The philosophical foundation uh, it, that is aesthetics, uh, from imagery to metaphor, movement, symmetry, surface texture, visual field, all of these matter enormously to humans. And I think that artists are, of course, particularly well-equipped to engage those aspects of the human condition as we try to communicate the wonder, potential betterment um, and excitement of um, outer space. We're gonna press ahead here and say that there are some interesting arguments about why we actually make art, but let's set those aside and just note that we do, uh, that it is a deep impulse in our species. And uh, I think of the philosopher Martin Buber who use the term I thou, I am you, you are me. And I think of art as a way of creating those I thou um, uh, boundary dropping connections, okay? So in this vein, artists, for example, I think might be better equipped than others to articulate the green dream at the heart of space exploration and settlement along tomorrow of sustainability for the earth and beyond. That's hard, and we, I think we saw this this summer with uh, the Branson and Bezos flights, which I, you know, I'm thrilled that they that they they took those flights. I'm you know happy for for what they what they potentially pretend, but it might be better in a sense or easier for the um, artistic community to engage um, arguments for space exploration, the excitement of this. Um, it's harder maybe for 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 people to hear that from from billionaires, uh, valid as those arguments. Uh, may be that we hear from both Sir Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos. So if we're gonna continue to inspire the wider public, widen that public, the space community needs more organized approaches to positive artistic engagement. We need more than science communication TikToks, valuable as those are, and we need to expand artistic participation across multiple disciplines. So it's not just thought of as a visual thing. So poetry, music, dance, yes, the visual arts, I think it should be part of every mission's public outreach. And so my vision is one in which every NASA uh, mission, every ESA mission, all the missions from different space agencies and even corporations uh, that, that artists are embedded in those in, in some way or another. And I think that actually would be a real minimal investment. I'm gonna press ahead here and say that in part, I decided, uh, to promote this concept was thinking about this concept because I was inspired by um, the Viper mission. Uh, and I, I wrote a sonnet. It sort of came out of nowhere. I'm gonna, it's a sonnets are only 14 lines long. So I'm gonna read it and we'll move into practical considerations and, and I'll wrap up because I know we're, we're pressed for time here. But I, I, gave this, I gave this poem to the Viper team um, and I had spoken with them for uh, some journalism work I had done for Sky and Telescope. Uh, so this was an inspiration and a gift for them, but this is the kind of thing that I can imagine mission laureates doing um, across the globe. So this is a, a brief poem 
a loose sonnet and uh, it's for the, the Lunar Viper mission is the, uh, the, the rover that will be sent to the polar regions of the moon to under, understand, characterize the ice there. So this is called, we land to see what we haven't seen. That skein of light along the crater's rim, it never leaves. Strange dark slopes below, black gift of shadow, never change. The sun skims low relentlessly in this ever day. Molecules in thin slow rates descend scattered in craters of the poles. They stay ancient, crisp and cold, a winter season secret until now. We launch orbit land to see what we haven't seen before. Exo ice toward which the rover turns with grinding grace, spectrometers, lance, quiet regolith. We map the moon's locked waters, span and depth. This archive of ice tells our cosmic past. A lunar frost will warm to seed what's next. So I, um, again, gave that to the Viper team as a gift for, for them to use in any way that they, they see fit. But I'd love to see us take a more organized approach to this kind of artistic engagement. Science-driven, factual, lyrical work about space missions ought to be integrated into public outreach. So here coming to the conclusion, some practical considerations about this. There is no overarching policy from NASA, I'll just here focus on NASA, um, regarding artistic involvement at the center level or the mission level. It's left up to center directors and mission PIs. There's no specific budgeting uh, for artistic engagement within public outreach. Um, and I think we need an effort to change that because artistic perspectives can inspire, they can provoke wonder and open up questions that help us understand the promise and difficulties and even perils of the human and non-human future uh, on this world and, and others. So let me go to my slides really quickly and see if we can do that. And that's not coming through. That's just fine. I will just speak this through. Basically, what we need to do, if we're going to think about this in a practical way, um, the first step is to set up an advisory committee. Uh, agency personnel, artists, organizations like um, this one, uh, the Aerospace Corporation, the Planetary Society, National Space Society. We need a committee of interested parties to draft guidelines and the vision for what a mission laureate program could be. We need to address the type of artists. And again, I believe in casting a wide net. We need to think about how they would be involved. That's a difficult question. Are they physically in place? Are they uh, getting access to scientists and engineers? How many meetings do they attend? How does that interface with the engineering and science work that, that has to take priority? Are there stipends? Um, as a poet, I'm used to being underpaid. I would do it for free. Not everybody would. Um, liability questions, copyright questions. Who owns the work? How is that work shared? What kinds of value-added activities might be included? So if you're working on a mission as an artist at JPL, maybe you give a poetry reading or a performance there. Um, what other things can be done? Selection criteria, obviously, and then thinking about this advisory committee and the selection committees for different mission laureates with an emphasis on diversity, inclusion, and equity. So I'll conclude here with a quote from uh, William Bazooka in his paper. He says, the world abounds with tangible examples of the spirit in the work that connects art and space, from cases as simple as launching art into orbit to cases as complex as integrating artistic processes into the development of new space technologies. Space organizations that seek to identify and foster these connections may find benefits across the spectrum of space activity, while at the same time supporting one of our most fundamental activities, creating art. So with that, I would just end with you know, a call to you to, to take up interest in this. I hope, please consider me an ally and resource in this effort. Um, I welcome your advice and would love to begin forming some alliances to imagine uh, programs uh, to uh, have mission laureates actually um, occur at, uh, in NASA and elsewhere around the world. 
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, we will have more poetry. We will have more music. Music. We assure you that. And uh, that is what our task is at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, we are um, running behind time, but let me, uh, I, I take the pleasure of inviting our next speaker, uh, Michelle Hanlon, uh, who is the president of the National Space Society. Michelle is a lawyer and, uh, 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 um, you know, I had posted, uh, I had talked about uh, new paradigms in space and she is an innovator. Uh, she's uh, she's uh, blazing a new path, so to speak. And uh, um, Michelle and uh, uh, her spouse are well known to me. I kind of know the family too now. And uh, Michelle, uh, uh, please go ahead. And uh, let's see if we can catch up on our time here. All right, I will try and catch up. Dear Madhu, <laughs> thank you so much for having me and Ken and for organizing this. I'm going to share my screen. Um, so first, boy, what a tough act to follow. I, um, the poetry is beautiful. I am a lawyer. And so, uh, you know, sort of poetry is, is usually lost on me, um, but that, that was really spectacular. And I love the idea of having, um, you know, mission laureates. Uh, I'm gonna apologize in advance for my lighting. I'm actually moving house. Um, and so we're, we're two days away from the Packers coming in. And so we're just trying to get organized. So hopefully you can focus on the slides. Um, as Madge just said, I'm honored to be president of the National Space Society. I'm co-founder with my husband, Tim, of For All Moonkind. And I'm also the co-director of the Center for Air and Space Law at the University of Mississippi School of Law, which is uh, one of only four universities in the entire world that actually has a, space, a dedicated space law program. Um, and we are the only uh, university in the world to have a space law program accredited by at a, at a, an ABA accredited law school. But that's Michelle, not what we're you can, you can say galaxy. It's okay. Okay, <laughs> the universe. We are the um, for all mankind is the only organization in the universe <laughs> that is um, focused on protecting um, our our human heritage in outer space. Um, so let's see. Okay, so I, I start from the very beginning, right? Three and a half million years ago, um, one of our common ancestors stood up and walked on two feet. Uh, as luck would have it, the plane that that person walked on was coated in wet volcanic ash, which preserved their footprints. Um, their train of around 70 prints are widely considered to memorialize an incredibly significant human achievement, walking on two feet instead of four. Walking on two feet allowed us to do so many more things. Uh, this freed up our hands to make tools, uh, to draw, to write poetry, to write, to communicate with words. And it, it just our history is just replete with these sort of human accomplishments that we don't really think about enough. And we, don't, we, we need to remember that these are all human achievements um, that got us where we are today. Um, so for example, you know, we learned how to control fire instead of be afraid of it. We overcame our primal anxiety of open water and built boats to cross the oceans. Um, and it goes on, you know, back in about uh, 18,000 BC, um, a, a human, one of our ancestors, uh, picked up a, a baboon bone and started crossing hash marks on it. And uh, archeologists and anthropologists believe that these aren't actually just hash marks, but actually addition and subtraction. This is the first math we had. Um, we found glass in Mesopotamia from ages ago. Uh, That's the first glass we had. So what's the point of this? We don't get to the moon. We don't send humans to the moon unless we stood up on two feet, unless we figured out how to tame fire, unless we uh, quell our fear of open spaces and open water, unless we figure out how to do math, unless we figure out how to build glass. So when we talk about you know, sending a human to, to the moon, that wasn't just an American achievement. That was an incredible achievement for all of humanity. When, when Neil Armstrong set his foot down, um, he was basically the, the and, and captured um, all of our human history and all of the incredible events that got us there, all of the things we needed to build that technology. So of course, what I like to remind people is it's not just Apollo. There are more than a hundred sites on the moon that have human made stuff on them. So the very first human made object 
to impact another celestial body was Luna 2 from the Soviet Union. Um, the, Luna, uh, the Soviet Union also had the first soft landing with Luna 9 and put the first wheels on the moon with the um, Luna Cloud 1. Of course, we also have other um, sites on the moon. We have a, uh, now a number of Chang'e sites, but we also sent a lot more robotic missions, Surveyor and Ranger. So there are, there are an incredible amount of treasures on the moon. But what's really special about Apollo 11, and, and um, Chris was talking about the laurel and the um, this, this uh, gold leaf. So Neil and Buzz were um, offered uh, the opportunity to take their uh, personal items. And one of the things they took was this patch from Apollo 1, but they also took the medallions of the uh, Soviet cosmonauts who had passed away in this effort to reach space and explore space and reach the moon. So Neil and Buzz knew, hey, we're not doing this just for the United States. We are doing this for all of humanity and it is a human endeavor to reach the moon. But even more important than that were the messages of peace. So what did we, when we, when we went to the moon, um, our US State Department and, and uh, NASA reached out to the entire world and said, hey, we're gonna be landing on the moon. Would you like to send a message from planet earth? And 73 nations agreed to do that and sent messages that are now sitting on the moon. And I urge you to go to our website forallmoonkind.org um, and go to the messages of peace because um, we have uh, uh, typed them all out here. So you can actually see what everybody wrote and to hear Raman also did a beautiful book, um, We Came in Peace for All Mankind, which also shows all the pictures and sort of the handwritten, some of the notes were handwritten um, and also the stationery. But I wanted to share with you uh, the note from Guyana because I thought it just really captured so well exactly what was happening. So this is Guyana in, in South America um, and the, they, the president of Guyana wrote, uh, we cannot tell on the, what future day beings of our own kind or perhaps some other corner of the cosmos will come upon this message, but we wanna record three things. First, we salute the astronauts. So these are, these are the first two of our human race. And I note that um, it was interesting when I, when I was looking at this over this week, um, he's one of the few people who didn't say man or men. So very forward thinking from, uh, from the uh, Guyana president, but two of our human race who with faith and courage have voyaged far beyond uh, familiar limits of our earthly bounds, um, earthly home to the moon. It is certain that their mission ushers in the greatest adventure of life since its primeval beginnings on this planet Earth. This is the greatest achievement of humanity since we stood up on two feet. Um, second, as members of our human race, again, human race, thus thrust among the stars, we pledge ourselves to work towards ensuring that the technology which has made it possible and the resources which may be discovered will be used for the benefit of all humankind, irrespective of terrestrial divisions of race or creed or levels of development. Third, and finally, they want to talk about their small nation. This is 700,000 souls living in this nation in South America on 83,000 square miles. The ancestors came from nearly every corner of the planet um, and talking about how in a world in which divisions deepen and where too often one human hand is set against another, um, in Guyana, they are proud that we have given to our time an example of how out of diversity, we have made one people, one nation with one destiny. And that is what we are doing right now. We are creating this opportunity to be one people, one universe and one destiny. Um, and working out this destiny, um, the prime minister went on, uh, they developed institutions based on the recognition of equality of all forms of government. So this is talking about sort of the, yeah, and I'll let you guys read the, the slides later. Um, but the, the final thing is that um, it shall be the judgment of history, but we would be well pleased if on some later day when this is read, it is said of us that we strove greatly to advance the dignity of all humanity. These are the words that we need to keep in our minds as we continue to explore space. We want to advance the dignity of all humanity. Um, and I thought Joseph Tito and I put in the, um, the, the Yugoslavia because it was not a Western you know, dem democratic nation, Tito was sort of a singular individual, um, but he said, may this majestic fulfillment of the ancient dream of the human race, humans setting foot on the distant soil of the moon, the first neighbor of us all, bring closer the realization of the humanity's age-long vision to live in peace, kinship, and joint endeavor. So everybody, 74 nations, sent these messages to the moon. A bunch of other messages were sent but didn't arrive in time, but every single one of them, 201, 
talked about peace and about our kinship and about our human destiny and, and about the universality of this achievement. Nobody, there were people who congratulated the United States, of course, but it's really this, to me, this concept that no, this is a human achievement and that's what we really need to recognize and embrace. So again, I just uh, wanna remind you, uh, you can go and you can find your, your nation and you can read all of the messages of peace that have been left on the moon. So that, that brings us to why, why do we care about protecting the blueprint? Um, you know, we haven't yet achieved peace on earth, but there is hope. It starts with recognizing the universality of human achievements, like standing upright or standing on the moon. Those are both human achievements. We understand that well on earth. 193 nations have ratified the UNESCO World Heritage Convention. We know how important it is to protect our heritage. When Egypt wanted to flood the Nubia Valley, the, the world didn't turn their backs on Egypt. They didn't scold Egypt and say, no, you can't, you're gonna, you know, your development is gonna ruin these treasures. Um, considered you know, one of the uh, uh, cradles of, of humanity. The international community said, yes, these, these are treasures of humanity, not just treasures of Egypt. So we're gonna help you. We are gonna move these temples piece by piece out of the Nubia Valley so that Egypt, you can develop and we will all still continue to share our universal human heritage. So we recognize on earth that preservation is a compelling idea that can help unite people rather than divide them. It's an idea that can help build a sense of community among people throughout the world. And I, I like to sort of talk about, you know, bringing us back to why do we need to pr protect the blueprints? Um, we don't have a lot of an analogies to what we're doing now, right? Because we, we, we have colonialism, but we are, we are uh, traveling beyond the bonds of our horizons, much like the Polynesians did. They just built boats and, sold, and sailed out or rode out, sailed, I guess across the horizon, they didn't know where they were going. That's what we're like right now. We don't know where we're going. We don't know what we're gonna find out there. But what did they take with them, the Polynesians? They took their culture with them. You see these islands dotted across the South Pacific um, and you see a lot of the same rituals. Um, they took with them their knowledge of how to, how to grow things and they took with them the knowledge of how to build things. And so when we talk about protecting the blueprints, we're talking about bringing with us our culture that, that's so important, bringing with us all the things we need to thrive as human beings. Um, so we are like dwarves sitting on the shoulders of giants. We see more and things that are more distant than they did, not because our sight is superior or because we are taller than they, but because they raise us up and by their great stature add to ours. I think we owe it to those giants to protect their blueprints. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Michelle. Every time you talk, um, it gives us hope and inspiration and sometimes goose pimples too. <laughs> but, uh, uh, thank you fine. so much and uh, good luck with your move. Um, uh, we, if, you, if you are able to come back in at three, uh, yeah, fifteen or so. Oh no, you're stuck. You're stuck with me now. This is my oh, break. Great. I'm looking okay. forward to it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, and we will move on to the next. Uh, uh, th there are some things on chat that you may like to look at, Michelle. And um, I'll um, move on to our next speaker, who is none other than uh, John Mankins. Everybody knows John, and so I don't need to introduce him. John, are you with us? I am indeed. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, um, uh, uh, there, there he is. Uh, John uh, is, uh, uh, has a, um, a lot of experience uh, in the space agency, in the space industry, and now um, uh, also um, been supporting the international space efforts um, in a wide range of activities. You'll hear the name <laughs> in all kinds of places. Oh, did you talk to John? Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Here's John. So John, go ahead and, uh, and please uh, um, continue. Thank you so much, Madhu. It's a great pleasure to be with uh, such a distinguished set of speakers and to uh, follow on uh, um, uh, Michelle Hanlon's uh, excellent remarks concerning uh, the heritage of humanity. Uh, my subject is not unrelated today. Uh, and is something that I've spoken with Madhu about 
but uh, which uh, I very, I, this is a uh, entirely new deck. Uh, and so uh, if it's a little awkward, I apologize, but I only have 48 slides, Madhu, so I don't think it'll take too long to get through them. Uh, that's, a, that's a joke, of course. Madhu, you're on the mute. We, we'll watch it one way or the other, John, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> At any event. So today I would like to talk with you about the word sublime and what it means for those of us who are interested in and pursuing the future of humanity in space. So what is sublime? Well, it has several definitions. Uh, firstly, as a verb, mm -hmm. uh, meaning to elevate to a high degree of moral or spiritual purity or excellence. Uh, also in chemistry, uh, to change something directly into a vapor when it is heated. Uh, so uh, uh, solid going directly into a, um, into a vapor, and usually it goes from a vapor back to a solid. Um, and the same thing uh, may be regarded for our spirit going directly from uh, an inert state to a, to a state of, uh, of sublime consciousness. Uh, and it's also an, an adjective uh, of something which is of such excellence, grandeur, or beauty as to inspire great admiration or awe. Uh, some relevant ideas and words, something it, which is sublime might be regarded as awe-inspiring, as wonderful, as overwhelming, as almost a religious experience. Now this word comes from um, uh, the Latin. A Greek commentator during the first century of the Christian era wrote, uh, or, and there's of course, as in all things historical, there's some dispute about whether or not this person really wrote it or it was someone else. Um, but it is the idea that the first and more, most important source of something being sublime is the power to form great conceptions. Um, and that the concept of the sublime is generally accepted to refer to a style of writing that elevates itself above the ordinary, that it inspires great thoughts, strong emotions, certain figures of thought or speech, noble diction and thought, and dignified arrangement of words in terms of, a, uh, in terms of the Latin sublimus. So it's a quality of greatness, in, uh, including a, for the physical, the moral, the intellectual, the metaphysical, the aesthetic, the spiritual, or the artistic. Uh, and it refers to greatness, which is beyond calculation. We are accustomed during the past two, two millennia to the idea of the sublime in metaphysics or the religious, uh, both uh, in all the, all the major religions uh, in terms of uh, deep or profound conceptions uh, in the art of those religions uh, and in the uh, scholarship and the writing of those uh, religions and those philosophers. But in addition, there have been hybrids of the spiritual and the technological, which are profound in their impact on human psyche. Uh, for example, the oldest of these that I'm aware of being the Great Pyramid of Giza uh, and the associated pyramids, some 140 meters in height, comprising 6 million metric tons and being um, uh, some almost 5,000 years old. And these combined the spiritual and the technological in something which is so stupendous that even today, uh, people doubt that it could have been done by humans. Another such hybrid of the spiritual and the technological are the great cathedrals of Europe. And we tend to look at these as buildings because we've become inured to the, the, the constructions of the 20th century and, the, and uh, the last 200 years. But the great cathedrals like the Canterbury Cathedral were monuments to God and they were centerpieces of the society, stupendous in comparison to all the other structures and all the other artifacts of humanity in their vicinity, taking millennia to build, to rebuild, to reconstruct. And they inspired faith by the nature of their technological accomplishment. 
in the natural world, we are very well aware of the sublime, uh, seeing for the first time the Grand Canyon, uh, a, a depth of uh, 2,500 meters over uh, 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 distances of um, perhaps uh, 20 kilometers or so. Uh, and above all of us, if we can escape city lights, the sublime Milky Way, our galaxy directly overhead and all the other objects that we can see in the night sky, uh, particularly in reference to objects uh, and uh, the artifacts of humanity that may be uh, on the horizon. In addition, a new idea which arose first with a, a, um, a, a, history of Ameri a, a historian of American history named Perry uh, is the idea of the technological sublime. Uh, the Eiffel Tower is a very, uh, the modern technological sublime. This is a, a good example. The Eiffel Tower completed 130 years ago, a height of 324 meters, 10,000 tons of iron, and was regarded either as an eyesore or as this stupendous object, which has now come to uh, typify the city of Paris. I don't know if you've seen Hoover Dam, only 85 years old, uh, but with and with a height of 220 meters, uh, a, a mass of 6.6 .6 million metric tons, producing some 2,000 megawatts of electricity, uh, with a catchment area of 435,000 square kilometers behind it, and in, in, into which the water flows. Uh, the first time I drove across it when I was a young boy on a trip with my family, uh, I, I was awestruck. Such a stupendous uh, accomplishment uh, that it truly was sublime and it introduced me to the concept of the sublime uh, when I was a teenager. In addition, there are the great buildings, the uh, uh, Empire State Building of the same era some 440 meters in height, almost half a kilometer, uh, 30, 331,000 metric tons of glass and steel and concrete. And this instituted the race to be the greatest, the tallest, the most sublime technological, technological accomplishment and is epitomized by the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Uh, and again, I've had the, the uh, privilege of standing at the base of the, the Burj Khalifa and have seen the view on the right. This is now uh, almost a kilometer high, uh, 500,000 metric tons. Um, just the air conditioning of this thing is uh, 46 megawatts. And it is almost unimaginable when you're standing at the base of it, looking up at it, that it is a real object. And yet it is. And then there is the space technological sublime, which is our subject today. Um, who can doubt that the Apollo uh, stack, the Saturn V, the uh, command module, the uh, limb enclosed uh, during launch, uh, 111 meters, 2,800 metric tons, the power output of 85 Hoover dams, that this is a truly sublime accomplishment and yet dwarfed by the vehicle assembly building, almost 200 meters on a side, uh, which is still the largest one-story building in the world. Um, and beyond it, the accomplishments, which we've talked about somewhat today, but I will argue is also a part of the space technological sublime, uh, Earthrise, Apollo 8, seeing the Earth for the first time from the moon, a new perspective enabled by space technology. In the future, we anticipate there will be even grander accomplishments, including, as you know, I hope, solar power satellites, which will be kilometers in size, so that you may have the opportunity to stand at the, at the base of a solar power satellite and look up at an object that is 20 times larger than the Burj Khalifa, uh, almost 10,000 tons in space. And the moon itself will be a source of the sublime, even beyond looking back at the earth, but including looking back at the earth. This is the region of the uh, South Polar region, 
uh, near Shackleton, uh, the Gerlach, Sverdrup craters. And it is here that we've been doing this study for the Moon Village Association, thinking about a future settlement. Uh, just to remind you, coming in over this terrain and this, the, uh, the um, uh, Shackleton is 19 kilometers in diameter. The elevation differences between the depths of Shackleton and the depths of the permanently shadowed regions and the sunlit crests is 5,000 meters. So twice the elevation difference in the same horizontal traverse as the Grand Canyon. So these will be truly stupendous views if you can see them, if they are not shadowed in the darkness. And of course, there will be the creation of future settlements and oases during the coming decades and the view of both the moon, the great uh, uh, monuments on the moon of uh, the future and the earth on the horizon. And someday, the creation of uh, large permanent biospheres, which will uh, enable humanity to live beyond the earth. So what is the space technological sublime? I suggest to you that it is a novel perspective enabled by or involving an artifact of space technology that elevates to a high degree of moral or spiritual purity or excellence. And it is an adjective, a perspective enabled by or involving an artifact of space technology of such excellence, of such grandeur or beauty as to inspire uh, a admiration or awe beyond uh, one's normal experience. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, <clears throat> John. Again, I think others just with us, in the Sanskrit, there is a term that describes the overwhelming effect it has on the human physiology, literally on the body, when you see uh, the sublime. It is called Kama Muta. You, you, you burst out in tears, you don't know why, and it's happening. Uh, it is almost unbelievable. It's called Kama Muta. And uh, 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 the prepared astronauts who go, go to the International Space Station during rendezvous experience this. They are told it's a technological um, uh, event, but no, uh, it affects uh, the human mind and the body. And uh, the sublime is a, 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 is a real thing. Uh, uh, yeah. we, don't put, uh, we don't put math numbers on it, but it's real. Th thank you so much. It's a great presentation. Uh, um, we are now, um, uh, John, you have some uh, some things on chat that you can respond to, I suppose. Oh, great. Okay, so now we are on to our uh, next presenter. Uh, <laughs> it's very hard to describe uh, David. Uh, it goes by David. And uh, uh, he is a comet hunter. I've known him for a while, and uh, um, he has his own uh, observatory uh, out there. Uh, look, he's sitting right by the scopes. That is cool. And uh, um, you can read about his bio. Uh, uh, he has uh, discovered more comets than most people um, discover anything. Um, and uh, um, uh, David has lectured at the International Space University. And uh, David, before before you before you talk, uh, can you tell us uh, a little bit about you and the encounter with uh, um, uh, with uh, uh, Shoemaker uh, Livy Nine? Well, actually, I I would love to, but that's really a central portion of the presentation. A little well, bit more. Can you that. can you talk a little louder, uh, David? Oh, can you hear me all right? A little bit louder. <clears throat> okay, a little bit louder. I'm trying to say that uh, most of the conversation that I'm going to have with you today is going to be a lot of it is going to be about just what you've asked me. So I think I'd like to save that for my lecture. Okay. <laughs> Uh, can can you make it a little louder? 
I will, I will try. Is that any better? Yeah. Okay. Now we can try to turn on your volume. I can do that. Okay, good. Okay, go for it. Okay, thank you so much, Madhu. And it's um, really a, a real pleasure for me to be here. I will be here for this presentation right now and then for the, the panel coming up later on today and really looking forward to it. In thinking about space philosophy and in doing some research for the presentation, I came up with an awful lot of things that none of which really got to the heart of what I really wish to share with you today. But there is, I can begin by saying that there is nothing to me more personal, more passionate than the night sky. It is deeply, deeply personal with me. And I like to think that I have made two wise and good decisions in my lifetime. The first decision was to start searching for comets on December the 17th, 1965. I started then, I'm still doing it now. That's the second and most important decision. By far the first one was meeting and marrying Wendy. And uh, that, that definitely is the top, top of the list. But I, I became interested in the night sky when I, and before I go on, I would like to say that I am dedicating this entire presentation of mine to the memory of Carolyn Shoemaker, who passed away yesterday um, very suddenly and uh, at the age of 92. <clears throat> it is We're very uh, sorry to hear that, uh, David. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's something that Wendy and I are working through, and I think the world is working through right now. But, uh, but I won't wish to dedicate this presentation to her memory. And may it live on as a blessing for us all. <clears throat> anyway, I started the idea of looking up at the sky as a child. I was at a summer camp in Vermont, Twin Lake Camp. We were celebrating the 4th of July with fireworks. And being from Canada, I didn't know from the 4th of July. And so I, I kind of enjoyed it. And then on the way back, we're walking up the hill to our cabin. When I looked up at the darkening sky and I saw a shooting star, it lasted about a second. And uh, I looked around at the others and I said, did any of you see that shooting star I just saw? And they all looked at me and they said, no, we did not. And that planted a thought into my little eight-year-old David brain. And that thought was, was that little shooting star a message of some sort to me? And I kind of put it away for a while in a little box. And I think four years later, <clears throat> was on a bicycle riding to my sixth grade class picnic, turned onto the boulevard in West Mount, and I made a nice turn. And the bicycle did not quite make the same nice turn I did, and hit the curb. Uh, the bicycle stopped cold. I, however, did not. I went so ever so gracefully sailing over the um, sailing, sailing over the uh, bicycle and landing on my arm on the sidewalk. And uh, I went, I had to go to the hospital, got a cast, and somebody gave me a gift of a book called Our Sun and the Worlds Around It. It is a precious book. To me, it is precious of biblical proportions. I read it. I read it again. I read it again. And it just thrilled me to pieces that here was a book about the night sky, about the planets, about comets, and uh, so exciting and so wonderful. I remember my father saying one night at dinner that summer, you know, we've talked about astronomy last week. Don't, please don't let your entire life be dominated by astronomy. Put some room for what other people are interested in. Don't make astronomy the most important thing in your life. And that was his advice. And I said to myself, sure, I won't make it the most important thing. I'll make it the only thing. 
anyway, I um, <clears throat> I think even Dad didn't really mean that what he was saying that time, because he reminded him of a story that when he was young, he was reading a book, and it was called Coal of Spyglass Mountain. And it was a story, a Charles Dickensian type story about a very poor young lad who was uh, mistreated and brutalized by his father, who eventually sent him to a boarding school. At the boarding school, he met an, an astronomer who really got him interested in astronomy. Later on, he, he taught at that school, got himself an observatory, and built that observatory to, to make an absolutely lovely <clears throat> a place to look at the stars and the planets. One night as he's looking through that telescope on what he called Spyglass Mountain, he discovered evidence of life on Mars, intelligent life on Mars. As the story goes on, just at that very moment, someone breaks into the observatory with a rifle, starts shooting at him, and one of the bullets actually hits Joshua Cole doesn't kill him, but it knocks him out. And he's sort of lying down and they bring him to the bed and they're trying to bring him back to health. And he thinks to himself that all that I've done is wasted. At that very moment, someone comes rushing in with newspapers and said, something's broke. And uh, they're looking at the newspaper and dad is sitting there with this big smile on his face. And he says, I'll never forget the end of that book. American amateur astronomer proves professionals wrong, discovers evidence of life on Mars. And then dad looked at us and he said, the ending of that book is priceless. Coal of Spyglass Mountain, first to report discovery. Coal of Spyglass Mountain, famous in a night. Anyway, I... Uh, I've never forgotten that book. And as my dad grew older, as my dad grew older, he began to uh, lose his memory, began to lose his memory of things, of places, and of people. And on one terrible day, he forgot that I was his son. But he never forgot that wonderful story of the amateur astronomer. And I remember one day as we're walking together at his winter home in Florida, and uh, I'm thinking, I don't know this man. He's not the father that I had. I don't even know him. And he's talking as a word salad that makes no sense. When suddenly he stops, looked at me and said, David, did you ever find Colas by Glass Mountain for me? And I was absolutely in shock. I looked up at him and there was the dad that I used to know. And I had to admit that I had never found the book. And he laughed and he said, don't worry about it. I'm so stupid now. I couldn't read it anyway. I looked at him and I said, Dad, as long as you're my father, you are anything but stupid. <clears throat> and we embraced. It was a beautiful moment. Didn't last, but it was something I've never forgotten. As years went on, I relocated to Arizona. I wanted to stay here only until I would discover my first comet which I did in November of 1984. Those of you who know the sky might notice that there is an area just at the foot, at the head near the neck of Cygnus the Swan. Uh, in, and it is a part of Aquila. There are a couple of stars and a clustering of stars, NGC 6709. On that night in 1984, right next to the cluster, was a fuzzy spot. It turned out that that fuzzy spot was moving slowly, creeping across the night sky. And it turned out that was my first comet. And uh, if you've ever had a wow moment in astronomy, that was one for me. When I first realized that the night sky was, after was going to reward me from a lifetime of looking at it with something no one else had ever seen before. It was just me and the new comet. And uh, that was a taste that led me on. Found another one and another one. 
And then a few years later, I joined the team of Jean and Carolyn Shoemaker, which is what Madhu has been asking about. And we started observing together. And we observed for about a year. We were finding asteroids. And uh, one of the asteroids, in fact, was right in the southern part of the Pleiades, uh, an a asteroid that goes closer to the sun than Venus does, actually closer than Mercury does, then comes out to about the orbit of the Earth and then goes back as a period of about a year or so. It is one of the asteroids that has a possibility at some day in the distant future of meeting the Earth head on. But let's hope that doesn't happen because I just want to say and enjoy it. Anyway, we found our first comet together in November of 1990. 1991, we had seven comets discovered together. In addition to that, I found one periodic comet on my own. 92 is a little quieter. 93, on March the 23rd, 1993, we took two photographs of the night sky and those two photographs led the next in the next couple of days to carolyn's discovery of the comet that eventually became shoemaker levy nine the comet was abs was absolutely stunning to us because it didn't look like a comet it looked like there was something wrong almost as if god had made a mistake with the night sky and uh, we're wondering, because Carolyn's first reaction was, David, I don't know what I've just stumbled on, but it looks like a squashed comet. It looks like a squashed comet. Anyway, <clears throat> Gene had to come out and take a look at that. And I'll never forget the look on his face of absolute shock. We didn't know what to do about well, we knew what to do about it as a comet discovery. First thing we had to do is get someone to confirm it. We had snow and ice, so we got a friend of mine, Jim Scotty, to look for us. A couple of hours later, I called telephone Jim. He picks up the phone from his observatory here in Arizona at Kitt Peak. And he says, Who? And I said, Jim, is that you? He said, Uh-huh. And I said, are you okay? And he said, David, the sound you just heard is me trying to pick my jaw off the floor. And I said, Jim, do we have a comet? He said, boy, do you guys ever have a comet? It is the most unusual thing I've ever seen in the night sky. And that was just the start. <clears throat> I remember the next day calling my editor over at Sky and Telescope leaving a message on his phone saying, we're up at Kitt Peak, call me. The phone rang a few minutes later. He said, whenever you leave me that message and you're at Palomar, it's something big. And I told him about the comet and uh, I told him what was happening. And that was just the start of it. <laughs> on May the 22nd, we were at the observatory again, celebrating my birthday at the time. And uh, I was, uh, Jean was in the dark room getting the film ready for that night's observing. And I was, <clears throat> I was reading email that was coming in and there were two emails I noticed from the Central Bureau for Astronomical Telegrams run at the time by Dr. Brian Marsden. And I said to Carolyn right away, I said, there are two two new circulars from the IAU. And she said, well, you better look at them right away because the first one was about Comet Shoemaker of Levy 9. And I said, my goodness, they've established that it's a periodic comet and we now have nine periodic comets for us, which was, which was a record at the time. And <laughs> <coughs> excuse me, anyway, I should be wearing a mask because I don't want to spread asthma to any of you or COVID or anything else through the uh, wires here. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> what he said was an answer to a question I had asked him years earlier. 
how would you report to the world that a comet was going to collide with, with the Earth? And Brian answered, he said, well, I'll simply put in the orbit of the comet and the predictions of, the, of where the comet will be. And one of the sections in the orbit is called delta. And delta is recognized as the distance between the object and the Earth. And you'd see the delta getting smaller and smaller and smaller until it's less than the radius of the Earth. Then you know you're going to have a collision. That's exactly what he did, except it was RJ, the radius between the comet and Jupiter. But just to make sure, he came up with a second circular that day in which he said, this comet <clears throat> is actually uh, obviously going to come to uh, come to Jupiter's cloud tops on July the 16th, 1994. And uh, it will come to 0 0.3 Jovian radii from the center of Jupiter. And then in parenthesis, he says, Jupiter's radii, radius being 0 0.5. And then he talks about the possibilities of collision. And that sure happened. I remember the night before, uh, someone wrote an article in, I think it was Science Magazine, in which he said, beware, the great fizzle is coming. And I wrote to the fellow and I said, well, it might be. And he wrote back to me, he says, I'm so glad you wrote to me. Because right now I'm petrified. What if I'm right? Because I he's worried that the guy was right. He said, it might, what if the impact explodes very high in Jupiter's atmosphere? If that happens, we could see a heck of a lot of things. And he says, so I'm really quite scared about what's happening tomorrow. The next day, that's precisely what happened. And I remember doing our preparation, doing our preparation for the uh, first press conference. They're teaching us how to sit. They're teaching us how to talk and how to not to raise our voice too much. They're teaching us how to do all these things. And suddenly, uh, one of the astronomers comes rushing in from outside and simply gives Gene this message. And you know, I've always been taught that people yell, people talk, people can scream, but nobody ever blurts. There's only one word to say what Gene did when he saw that message. He had to blurt. And he stood up and he says, you mean they saw plumes? Anyway, that ended the preparation for the press conference. We rushed in. To see, to see messages from coming from all over the world about the, um, about the first impact. And as Madhu just said in the chat, <clears throat> the, the impacts were, a, were a, a visible. In fact, even that first one was visible even to someone with a 10 inch telescope. I remember some of the impacts later on that week were visible from the finder of the telescopes that we were looking through. I remember on the uh, 20th of July, I was at a press conference and uh, sometimes Gene and Carolyn were at the press conference. Other times it was me, this day it was me. And Gene comes in to the press conference and he's waving at me at the back. And uh, he's just sort of waving, come here, come here. And I'm looking at the woman sitting next to me and I said, nothing is going to take me away from this press conference. And then Gene comes up to me and says, David, we have to go. He said, we've been invited to the White House. And I looked at the lady and I said, accept that. <laughs> that afternoon, we did get to meet the president, but we really got to talk with Vice President Gore at the time, who not as a politician, but as fellow ast amateur astronomers. He was so excited that he had gotten to see the impacts the night before from the telescope at his own house, which happened to be the huge refractor at the Naval Observatory. And um, it was really a beautiful experience. And I'm going to- David, David, you make an incredible presenter. We could listen to you forever, but we got to move on um, to our next speaker. Um, you know, I can't believe the excitement that 
that would have gone on during that time. And, you know, I knew Jean and Carolyn, and they're some of the finest lecturers I've ever, ever heard. And you too, uh, you know, you, you talk like a, a movie that's going on and on, and we don't want to stop. But uh, we got to hold on to the schedule. We have to go on. Would you let me just finish? Okay, please. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, going back to space philosophy, space to me is total emptiness, nothing. But on the other hand, it is, it contains everything that there is. And I'm going to end with a quotation from Shakespeare. The quotation is from Macbeth. And uh, it's almost interesting when uh, he's writing these words, Macbeth has just learned that his wife has died and uh, he's giving up. And Shakespeare, I imagine, is trying to figure out what to say when there's a tap on his shoulder. He turns around and it's God. And God said, Will, take a break, get a cup of coffee. I got this. <laughs> she should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in its petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time and then is heard no more. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. And to which I add, signifying everything. Everything, Thanks. everything. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you so much, David. You know, uh, we, could, we could listen to you forever. Uh, thank you so much for um, uh, joining us. And uh, uh, please stay on, uh, we want you. <laughs> in the concluding session. And with that, I want to go to our wonderful and incomparable, um, beautiful uh, Neve Shaw. And it, uh, you know, don't mistake that spelling. Um, it, uh, it's spelled funny, but she's Neve. She's our beautiful Neve. That's right. Okay, Thank Neve, you. all our things in Strasbourg. And uh, uh, please continue and you'll have your time. Go for it. Thank you. Thank you, Madhu. I've actually moved to Granada now, so um, I'm involved in the space studies program. I've been working all summer. I've been kind of filling holes because, um, you know, because of the pandemic, the schedule has had to change. So I've got I'm pulled into to lots of different activities. But but let me let me share my slides. I'm a visual person, so I'm going to speak to you through slides. And and uh, and thank you so much, Madhu, for inviting me to speak about what I do when um, I've already heard such fantastic talks already and I'm looking forward oh, you're very to, welcome. to the rest of the day it's it's quite it's 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 late here but um as I say I'm in Granada there I am uh, we had a heat wave today and oh. when you're a ginger that's 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 doomed you're it's big trouble because we, we I can't I can't, I can't go up with the heat but <laughs> I've turned off the air conditioner for a few minutes because it's too noisy. But yeah, I'm, I'm, and you know, it's funny talking about space philosophy. We've been talking about space philosophy a lot in the last few days because I'm currently um, co-chairing the team project, which is the last part of the, of the space program. And it's about imagining um, the next generation golden record and what would we possibly put on that's different to the last one. I don't know if we, if we can really. So, so we've had lots of really interesting conversations around philosophy. But I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the most passionate about, uh, you know, as well as space, as, as we all are. And um, I'm a talker. I'm a, I'm, I, I guess, you know, I've, I've been many things in, in my career. I've been an artist and a performer and a, a theatre maker and, and a writer. But all of it kind of boils down to wanting to share um, all the things that I absolutely find fascinating. I think the biggest gift that I was given in my house was the gift of curiosity and the confidence to ask why and explore. I had inside ideas on our on the walls and um, you know before the internet and um, I wasn't a reader I, I just sort of absorbed information and as, as I went on through life and I met different groups of people you know when, when you hang around with engineers everybody's an engineer and and similarly with scientists, but when you then move into the arts world, you realize that the gift of curiosity is something that was unique to those communities that come. And I started to realize that 
without that confidence around knowledge, a lot of people feel that, that um, I hope my internet's okay. Um, a lot of people feel science is a subject and maths is a subject that's for people other than themselves. And it disturbed me greatly and it set me on the path of, of you know, sharing my own personal um, space stories and other people's space stories and trying to keep people up to date, you know, starting with the beautiful Earthrise picture, but also talking about that we have on the International Space Station and all this, the crews and all the stories that I collate and, and also about satellites and how, you know, we have to be careful about all the job, um, you know, that surrounds us as a planet and, and future plans, you know, the gateway and what's going on at Mars and, and people are fascinated. People find this stuff really, really interesting and asteroids and on and on and on. I, I don't need to tell you. Um, I get asked a lot to speak at um, festivals and, and uh, you know, uh, science events and I love them. But what I started realizing was, was that we were all kind of, I was kind of talking to myself in a way, kind of a version of um, the same reflection of myself in the audience. I was talking to children of parents who were encouraging their children, curious. So they didn't really need me. They need to speak to people like yourselves, more experts in the field. I, I'm, I'm literally a conduit for, for information who kind of puts a bit of humanity and a lot of passion behind what I do. And I realized that um, we were kind of missing whole community of people who feel that science isn't for them as I call them the disengaged and while it's hugely um, gratifying to speak at science festivals and uh, you know at space week events um, who was I reading to and I didn't really feel I was making actually any impact and I started really looking at new ways of taking the topic of space and connecting it with other things that um, we need to talk about particularly the climate, I, I sort of talk about, you know, this, this sense of, of balance um, our, 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 of our planet and how space can help us with that. But I also started thinking more about how can I connect with people that aren't in the room? How can I do that? And I went away and I studied, um, you know, the concepts of, of science engagement and, and why is it that people like myself and scientists and astronomers, why do we, why have careers science, and there's some lovely sociology around it and this notion of science capital is proposed by uh, University College London by um, my two key, key scientists there and after many years of studying they have they have proposed this theory that why people pursue careers in science or why people pursue a passion for learning about science whether it's formal or informal is because it is in their line of, it's their version of reality. It's their perception of the world around them. They're confident about their curiosity because more than likely as they grew up, they had influences of people who were also confident around curiosity. So they sort of normalized it. And so, you know, parents, they encouraged us. Um, we watched science, we watched Carl Sagan on TV, we watched David Attenborough. Um, my school was quite an academic school and um, my friends were, uh, we were all the same. And so it was normal for us to have science in our life. And then, you know, more my uh, world experience broadened, the more I saw that there are many communities across the world. There's in every country, communities with different social backgrounds who didn't necessarily have um, that relationship with information and it was connected with um, it was connected a lot around uh, who they're in for so the place that they grew up in their grandparents their aunties their uncle what they watched on tv what they were told by society at large about who they were is, is what they became so even a child that was extremely talented uh, in science in school had a very strong relationship with science the teacher a large a large amount and especially women on top of that and um, didn't pursue careers in science because to them they couldn't see anyone in their line of sight who was uh, interested in science and uh, um and it really got me thinking about well i i i have to respond to that uh, my passion for space is a fantastic entry point for people to break down barriers around science. So I don't necessarily just want to uh, talk at science festivals anymore. And I don't necessarily talk to 
young uh, kids anymore. I want to talk to adults and grandparents and and people from all different walks of life who feel that um, they have an interest in space, but they feel that if they were to talk about astronomy or something, they 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 wouldn't they wouldn't they wouldn't um, it wouldn't be for them. And the other thing that came out of uh, University College London is this notion about equity and information and um, the subjects of science, technology, engineering and maths shown that science capital is one way of looking at it, that it's the, it's the world around you, but also it's about how empowered do you feel in your life. Um, and so it's not just about women in STEM, it's about all minorities feeling that if they're not part of the majority, that that also influences whether they take up an interest in their curiosity, whether it's in space or science, or whatever it is, but, but, but having that confidence around really following what they instinctively know to be their, their ultimate passion. And I know with our own passions in life, that's the most, when you start to live a life that's, that's led by your passion, you know, do you ever work a day again? I, I certainly don't believe that I do ever since. So I've been really looking at this, this notion around um, equality, but not, not really equality, um, more equity, which is that it's not about giving everybody the same um, opportunity. It's about making up for a shortfall that other people seem to need and not necessarily making any judgments around that. And so I've been actively seeking out uh, new ways of, of talking about space uh, topics and I think are relevant to this society. And I, I think that every citizen should know about if we are to create a future where we don't bombard our, you know, our lower Earth orbit with, with tons of, of space junk, that we, we know when we um, colonize Mars that we've agreed together to do that not one person um, or that if we're going to put a constellation of a hundred thousand satellites um, around Earth that we look we're happy with that instead of somebody making those decisions and a lack of knowledge being the reason why it happened so the more we can inform people the better chance we have to enforce our governments and our leaders to embed um, a strategy for space that we all agree on because we're all um, citizens of, uh, of the universe. So I, I wanted to take you very quickly through three things that I um, have been involved where I'm genuinely trying to break down these barriers and think about um, audiences and putting space and, and science in, con in contexts that are different. To the model. So the first is I, I've worked with this uh, preschool this daycare centre in Jobstown and Tala is um, a region in Dublin and um, it would have a, it would be social disadvantaged, it would have a lot of um, immigrants and um, uh, there's a, a big crime um, area and a lot of drug um, issues there as well. Um, and the children that stay in this daycare centre are children largely of single moms who have to work. And some of the children have um, special needs. And these amazing women offer time for free to take care of these children, to allow the mothers educate themselves through virtual learning and other educational programmes that they have going on in this building called On Kasson. And they approached me and they said, we would really like to bring um, science and, and space to these young children they're like two or three years old and um, their parents don't have any um you know they don't have any backgrounds in this so so we're trying something new and would you do it and i said yeah okay okay so we realized that for kids you can really only kind of do five minutes or so so there was no point in me driving all the way out to tala to meet them we did it with skype and i have a little puppet a little muppet um called miss and and, um, and she, she, she's mad about space as well. And we, we did really simple things. We built rockets and we, um, we, we uh, had a few explosions and we talked about their favorite planets and they made rockets. So this is not cutting edge, but I have to say that it was probably one of the most rewarding, um, it was probably one of the most rewarding activities that I had done in, in a long time. And it reinforced my, need to keep pursuing and serve smaller and smaller niche communities that had no start in, in, in following on into their curiosity. And then the second um, example was on a much bigger scale and it was about thinking about things that families watch together or interact with together. And in Ireland, there's this big 
uh, baking show called The Great British Bake Off um, from the BBC. I, I, I think you've heard of it and I think there, it has gotten to um, your part of the world, maybe not. And so um, I had had to meet an aerospace engineer who was a contestant on The Great British Bake Off and a finalist. And I said, why don't we make a panel show about baking, but, but about living and eating in space? And he is obsessed about using um, the chemistry of baking to explain how materials uh, protect um, astronauts and, and how we build um, light materials uh, in order for them to travel far to great distance space. So we created um, Baking in Space, and it was a, a talk show that was live. We had tons of um, tons of demonstrations and we had audience get involved in experiments and we gave away loads of like we gave them uh, away um, a, a, an apron that said baking in space and there was sort of um, uh, activities we got made an activity book for, for children and we made a series of videos and we also had people involved in the space sector from the European Space Agency and Ireland that were working in space to come and talk about their work and their research and everybody everybody got to taste everything Andrew made at the end that was the, that was the baker and it was a huge success and it and we um it's our fourth year now that we're doing it and we're actually going to present this year at the european space agency's um space week and um, hopefully if all things come together and we had um so so what i realized from that and from the parents that came up created an experience that parents and children were involved in so that it would start this conversation that wasn't happening in the homes and it, and it, and it gave the parents something new uh, to learn and to share with their children and it began their own journey of curiosity and the questions that were afterwards by the families were incredible and it shows that they of course they understand space of course they understand science we just tune in to where their point of view is first and then everybody's off and, and hopefully they start a journey of, of curiosity. And these are just some ideas from it. And um, I won't play the video because I, I don't want it to, to waste into time. And then, and then lastly, and it was sort of a, a segue, I was asked to get involved with this really community in the Midlands of Ireland called Abbey Leaks. And um, they had funding from the Tidy Towns Committee. So that's like a small committee of about 10 that kind of keep community gardens clean and they sort of they sort of do fundraisers and they'd have like you know they, they'd organize like the farmers market and and um, they had applied for this funding to promote climate action in the region and they asked me as a communicator to help promote it and um, at this stage this happened last October and from my years of, of figuring out how to work with small communities I realized like you know it, it's really about starting with the community first and letting them tell me about what the, where the gaps of the knowledge were. And uh, it was right bang slap in the middle of, the, of our major lockdown because of COVID. So we couldn't go into the communities, we couldn't have in-person events, so we were stuck with Zoom like we are. So after many conversations, I said, what, what would work best? And they said, um, well, we just really want to reach out to the community and we want to kind of hide what we're doing and kind of get them to get involved in like cleanups and understand that that climate action is just about uh, becoming aware of, of the, you know, of the world around us right now. So I started with the space agenda and talking about the perspective of Earth and how space has helped us, um, you know, improve our, our sustainability. And I came up with this notion of having like a TV show like a magazine TV show on Facebook that would be live for the community every Saturday morning. And uh, we would have people on, on the show who were working in biodiversity or they were um, from Watch Ireland or they had some area of expertise that was related in some way to the natural habitat or space or planet Earth. Um, Abbey Leaks has a, has, um, a population of 2,300 and uh, the first episode alone we had about, uh, we had over a thousand people tune in, but by the fifth episode we had a viewership of about 23,000, we had tons of feedback and we had all sorts of communities asking me to set the same thing up um, for, for them. I'll just give you a little snippet of, um, of some of the content that we, we showed. So this of starlings and Ricky Whelan was just from from Birdwatch Island but it just shows you how relaxed it was and how it came from a space of community and just like let's just bring all this knowledge down to something that's really relatable to people on the ground. So they just they do this for you know 
15, 20 minutes before they just disappear into wherever they're roosting, whether it's trees or a reed bed or whatever. And over in Balakos, it's these conifer trees over behind the garage. And, and are starting seasonal, are they with us all year or do they migrate or what's their pattern? Yeah, good question. So there's about, about 3 million resident breeding here. Um, and then we have a huge influx from Europe, um, Eastern Europe, Scandinavia, and even Russia in the winter. So our, our population, we don't actually know, we don't know if it could droop. It's huge. We do know it's huge because of the significance of, of the size of these, of these, these murmuration flocks. So um, yeah, they're, 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 they're quite a mystery. And you see now these, these shapes. Are so it, it was just about like highlighting every things that people already knew, but kind of making these connections and and really breaking down um, space and, and science uh, to something very relatable and something that was specific to their region. And yet it, it's exactly the same conversation. And I feel so much happier now making the work that I do, even though I'm, I'm, I'm probably targeting smaller groups, but I, the impact I make around is, is richer and I really feel that long term, the, this approach that I have about finding audiences who feel that science isn't for them and listening to them and trying to figure out how I can make, how I can make an initial connection. That's all I'm doing so that they then develop their own path of curiosity. Hopefully it's in space because we all love space, but that's not my, that's not for up to me to say. And what's really the last kind of year I've been really trying to target people all around the world and that's starting to happen so i'm getting asked to speak and to and to kind of run workshops for really small communities here's a picture of, of a community in india but i am um, uh, later in the year i'll be doing one in lagos and and um, and and later in the year in ireland i'm working with um two schools from you know again other disadvantaged areas and we're creating something to letting them lead it because i really do believe Everybody has the right to an education. I was really lucky that I grew up in a house where it was given. And it's not education for all, it's education for each. So it's about figuring out what is it that particular needs at this particular period of time that they didn't get to help them continue to move forward. And it's not related to age or, or any sort of um, decision. Everybody is, has the right to have a lifelong education and jump into that at any age. So it's, it's all ages. And I think that if we really want to have a society that makes the right decisions for uh, us as a humanity, whether to, to leave Earth and colonize Mars, we need to make sure that everybody is on board with those decisions and we need to make sure that everybody understands what those decisions are. So rather than things happening to us, I think it's better for us to make sure if we can. Uh, increase the level of knowledge so that we all have a right to the table um, where these big decisions are being made. So thanks very much for your time. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Neve. It's late there and you're still looking very pretty and beautiful. And um, <laughs> I really enjoyed um, some of the key terms. I, I hope uh, I, we would love to have you send us a short script of what you said, Neve. I know you may have said a lot of things impromptu, but if you if you can, uh, we'd love that. Thank you so much. Okay. Good okay. night. Good night, and uh, <laughs> and uh, enjoy enjoy uh, Alhambra, and uh, um, uh, hope to see you soon. Which brings us to our next speaker, who is none other than this uh, architecture, and. Uh, uh, welcome, um, uh, Melody. Uh, Melody is a, a award-winning national space architect. Um, uh, he hello, and uh, good to see you. Sorry we are running a little late, but uh, uh, please take it from here. Hi, Radu. Hi, Ken. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, in a very unusual move, I'm not going to present any images. The images I don't think are really going to capture the concept. So I did okay. something, I, I did, and, and I, I admit I'm, I'm a very visual person. So you can feel free to close your eyes or zone out as you wish. What I've done is I've prepared a statement which I hope will capture in some way the significance of some of these ideas that I will be discussing with you. So I'll start with a preface first. 
on uh, space and philosophy and some of my thoughts regarding their interconnectedness and then I'll move into discussing my thoughts on envisioning of first peoples and what that actually means. And you can always get all the images you want from Google. <laughs> That's where they would have come from in any event. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Go for it. Okay. With every scientific breakthrough, innovation, or re revolution to alter the underlying principles and fabric of how we understand the nature of the universe, if we can even characterize it that way, so too is there an ever-changing impact to humankind's understanding of the cosmos and thus our understanding and knowledge of man's place within it. Just as cosmology studies and concerns itself with the nature of the universe, so too do scientific and technological breakthroughs alter and impact the relationship with other human activities, such as cosmology, cosmology and science, the social sciences, religion, mythology, etc. And here I would like to give credit to George Farr of Georgetown University, who had written a fantastic curriculum on these topics specifically. Uh, the more we learn, discover, and understand about the cosmos, the more we impact the truths and principles underlying all knowledge and being and thus humankind's place within it. There is a direct relationship between epistemology, which is the nature, origin, and scope of knowledge, and the rationality, belief, and astrophysical research. Any significant change in the scientific understanding of the universe will alter the philosophical perception of the relationship between Earth, and thus us, our inhabitants, and humankind within it, and the universe. Technology development, and particularly the development of instrumentation, have often stimulated and been the cause of changes in philosophical perspectives related to space. The most notable and fundamental example is probably the invention of the telescope in 1610, which permitted astronomers to observe space as never before, prompting philosophers to conclude that the naked eye could only likely perceive a fraction of the universe, and contributing to the dialogue on the finite or infine, infinite nature of the universe with the many philosoph philosophical implications that dialogue entails. In the 20th century, another revolution in instrumentation led to our current understanding of the electromagnetic spectrum, changing again our understanding of the universe as a much more complex entity than was previously perceived through visible, through visible light. Relativity theory and quantum mechanics uprooted perceptions of cosmological physics. It suddenly became clear that the spectrum components other than visible light Radio and uh, radar, radio, radio and radar waves exist beyond Earth's atmosphere. The initiation of the space program in the 1950s enabled astronomers to observe the full range of the electromagnetic spectrum. Satellites carried instruments to measure general cosmic radiation and later were capable of extracting extragalactic sources of X-rays and gamma ray emissions. These instruments contributed to a more sophisticated and still developing idea of the cosmos. Underlying these breakthroughs is the principle that empirical evidence provided through instrumentation and experiments, experimental procedures contribute to the body of work which is scientific knowledge and consensus. In epistemology, evidence justifies belief and determines whether a certain belief is rational. In philosophy of science, on the other hand, evidence is understood as that which conforms or disconfirms scientific hypotheses and arbitrates between competing theories. So you see, our knowledge of the cosmos has a direct impact on the way that we rationalize our reality on a daily basis, is what I would argue. Okay, part two, envisioning a first peoples. Today, the reality that we are becoming a spacefaring civilization is more real than ever. The universe is increasingly becoming a world within our reach. Ultimately, I believe that the spirit and the motivation towards exploration to uncharted and unknown territories is a constituent part of what it means to be human, so much so that it can be understood as a constituent part of our DNA. And this is an idea that Stephen Petra uh, Petranik has elaborated on extensively. Being human is defined as constantly innovating, constantly pushing to defy odds, to learn and to explore and to discover more about our world and the planets beyond. 
in pondering new worlds, new planets, new ways of living, and new civilizations beyond Earth, we also confront the question of our needs as a people and as a species to ensure that we not only survive the harsh and extreme extraplanetary environment, but also with, that we thrive within them. Often the urge to begin again, to start over in designing these new societies is fostered by a wave of hope and faith that what we now know or the knowledge we now possess will enable us to construct a better future. We will strive to quote, get it right this time and establishing the infrastructure and life supporting mechanisms environmentally and even sociopolitically from the beginning or from scratch. That's our hope. The irony here is that even a new planet is far from a blank slate when we as people have evolved to psychological and physiological needs over the course of 10 plus million years on Earth. We arrive to that new place as biophysical organisms and anthropological subjects fundamentally the same. Anthropologically as a species, we occupy a vulnerable, vulnerable position on this planet. I believe fundamentally that our technological and scientific capabilities and the enabling bureaucracies that will bring us to having a permanent presence on the moon and Mars and will, make, uh, will also make other planets inhabitable, but it won't fundamentally change who we are. The study of humanity's adaptations has traditionally been the domain of anthropology. We are entering a new era in which the focus on bioastronautics with the traditional focus on safeguarding the short-term health of individuals or a small crew is shifting towards plans that include space settlement by communities, raising many new issues. And here I'd like to quote Cameron Smith's Principles of Space Anthropology. Individual physiology is a different phenomenon than say population genetics and individual psychology is short term as short term adaptation is different from cultural adaptation by reshaping normal cultural norms in accordance with new circumstances. Uh, the scope of ex-anthropology then will be broad and Smith proposes it is an applied form of anthropology with the specific goal of evaluating the adaptive capacities of our species, both biologically and culturally, so that they must be so that they may be best deployed to assist in successful permanent space settlement. This projective capacity is very productive for thinking about future generations and the shape of future settlements in space. Um, Sa uh, Savannah Mendel has written on the benefits of space anthropology and overcoming sociocultural ba barriers towards living and working in space and designing societies appropriate for per permanent space settlement. But she's also keenly aware of the potential for inequality and wealth disparity to deepen, the to deepen following the commercialization of space. Undeniably, the imperialist and colonialist, colonialist undertones uh, of space exploration and settlement on extraterrestrial bodies cannot be ignored from a socio-historical perspective. Planetary protection is an important competing influence, and we likely have much to learn by listening to indigenous populations in the Americas, the Middle East, and elsewhere on the ramifications and effects of post-colonial life uh, and our connection or relationship to the planetary surface or to the land itself. As expected, I'll end with more questions than answers. What is the future of diversity, inclusion, and representation in space on the moon and Mars? Who are these first peoples? Geopolitically, what are the ramifications of laying claim to land in space or governing that land into deciding the fabric of the society and the community to come? And though daunting in their significance and ramifications, these questions and others I haven't mentioned, I hope will encourage us to assemble, to share, to collaborate on thoughts and responses, just as we are now, uh, but also to innovate, to design, and to imagine fearlessly and valiantly without constraint into a projected future. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Melody. There's a lot to unpack in there. And I'm so happy you 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 wrote this down. And um, could we have a copy that uh, we could? Uh, of course, you could take a time to rework or do whatever, uh, but send it to us, and uh, uh, we would uh, really appreciate that very very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Thanks we are so still much. running late, but uh, stay on, Melody. Will you stay on for uh, uh, the concluding uh, panel? Oh, great. Okay. Um, we are now um, off to. 
our good friend from many, many years, um, Leslie Wickman, uh, uh, who has done a lot of different things, moved on and on to do better and bigger things. And now I believe she's on to something even bigger and she's not telling us what. Um, uh, Leslie, are you with us? I am, can you hear me? Oh, yes, we can. Uh, uh, please go ahead. Okay, and I believe Ken was going to run my slides. Ken, are you okay. still planning to do that? Ken, are you with us? I can, I can do that if you okay. want me to. That would be good. I'm working on a very small screen today, so that would be really helpful. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, well, it's no good problem. to- I, I have it. Okay, yeah. I was just gonna make some introductory remarks while you're- Please do, uh, please do. That's a good idea. While Ken gets your slides up, uh, um, you know, I, I want to introduce uh, um, Leslie as a teacher and uh, as a designer, a very creative designer. But uh, Leslie, go ahead and tell us a little bit about you. Okay, sure, yeah. I have been straddling two worlds for quite uh, a lot of my career with one foot in industry and one foot in academia. And um, I've worked on, I've had the privilege of working on a number of NASA projects, uh, including the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, the International Space Station, as well as uh, teaching at several institutes of uh, higher education. And um, I really started thinking more deeply about the topic that I'll be addressing today a few years ago when I was asked to present a formal response to a lecture by Dr. Jennifer Wiseman, whose name some of you may uh, recognize. Jennifer, She's Jennifer is a wonderful, good friend of mine over many years, and I know Jennifer mentioned you as being part of uh, the American uh, um, scientific. scientific Society and uh, you were the executive director at some point, am I right? Yes, I was the executive director. Oh, the, the <clears throat> say hello to Jennifer, it's been a while. Yeah, so I had the privilege of giving a formal response to a lecture that she gave. And for those of you who don't know, she is the senior project scientist for NASA's Hubble Space Telescope program. And, uh, as I mentioned before, is a, a project that I also worked on. And she made the most beautiful mosaic of the uh, uh, of the Orion Nebula, which yeah. is out there for all to see. She has some really amazing photographs, as you can well imagine. <laughs> and another piece of my background, uh, which relates to the image of the book that you see on the screen, uh, is a handful of years ago when I was teaching astronomy at Azusa Pacific University. Uh, there was big news in the astronomy world about possible evidence for the gravity waves that Einstein had predicted. And I was asked to uh, write an op-ed article for CNN's website, um, which was titled very provocatively. Uh, and the, the title that the CNN editor um, labeled it with was, Does Big Bang Breakthrough Offer Proof of God? And as you can imagine, as a person of faith, as well as a scientist, I'm very careful with how I use that word proof because it easily gets misconstrued by people. So, but that, that article went viral and led to a book contract. Um, and that book is the book that's featured on the, the first slide here. I've also recently been involved with starting a new nonprofit called Starry Nights and the website is starrynights.me. So you can uh, contact me through that website if you have uh, additional thoughts or questions that you'd like to discuss. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so in order to give a little bit of context for my comments today, it has always seemed to me that wonder, awe, and inspiration are inextricably linked. Uh, and the night sky has always inspired awe and wonder in me. And as we've heard from some of the other presenters today, they've had similar experiences. Uh, but for me, as a young child, my father would take my brothers and myself outside on clear starry nights to look at the moon and the stars and the planets through his telescope. And that early experience really ignited my lifelong interest in science. And just by the way, clear starry nights were a somewhat rare occurrence in the rainy Pacific Northwest where I grew up. So I have especially fond memories of them. Next slide, please, Ken. 
And probably most, if not all of us, can relate to at least some of these experiences that I had as a kid. And I relive that experience every time I take a group out stargazing. Uh, gazing at the heavens on a clear starry night and seeing the thousands of stars that are visible to the naked eye from Earth, people both young and old inevitably start wondering about life's big questions. The same kinds of questions that have been asked since humans first inhabited this planet. Questions like, where did all this come from? How big is it? What's it all made of? How long has it been here? Was there anything before all this? Where are we going? How will it all end? And at least as importantly, the most personal question of why am I here? And these questions in turn prompt us to explore and search for answers. Next slide, please. Now our, our various space, space exploration projects have helped us better answer some of these questions, but really these questions are not just questions for scientists and engineers, but for all who inhabit the earth. Both Vincent van Gogh and Mark Twain wrote about this idea as well. For instance, Vincent van Gogh wrote to his brother Theo saying, the sight of stars always sets me dreaming. And Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn says, we have the sky up there all speckled with stars. And we used to lay on our backs and look up at them and discuss about whether they was made or only just happened. And King David of Israel also wrote in the book of Psalms, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Yeah. Night after night, they display knowledge. So long as the sky is clear. Exactly. <laughs> but another one. interesting thing when you start looking at, I'm gonna digress for just a second mm -hmm. here, but, but the, the fact that our planet mm -hmm. has a transparent atmosphere and allows us to see that. Can you imagine if we were constantly shrouded in cloud, uh, how limited our understanding of the universe would be? So starry nights do that to people. They make us think and feel and wonder and in turn explore the big questions in life. Let's move on to the next slide, please, Ken. Scientists and other observers, observers are perpetually amazed by the intricacy and complexity of everything we study, yet it all fits together seamlessly in a perfectly balanced synergistic system. The orderliness, consistency, and biofriendliness that we observe in nature makes us ask yet another question. Why is it that the universe we inhabit is one in which we can flourish and thrive rather than one in which we can only barely survive with each breath possibly being our last. Next slide, please. Another of our big questions has to do with the vastness of the universe. On the clearest night, we can only see about 2000 stars with the naked eye. But recent surveys now estimate that there may be 10 trillion or more galaxies in the observable universe and an average galaxy may have about 100 billion stars. So the total number of stars in the observable universe would, be, would come to about 10 to the 24th or a septillion stars in the observable universe. And the vastness of our universe is difficult if not impossible for, for us to even begin to comprehend. The observable universe is thought to extend about 46 and a half billion light years in every direction or 93 billion light years across. And the whole thing observable together with unobservable might be 250 or more times bigger than that. And if this place is so big, that leads to yet another big question. Are there other intelligent beings out there somewhere? But maybe that's a conversation for another day. Next slide. Peter Nichols, a literary scholar and critic, defines awe as a cognitive paradigm shift wherein we reassign a previous narrative to a larger framework or context. And Katherine Johnson, who's a psychology faculty member at Arizona State writes, any amazing or information rich encounter that challenges one's ability to comprehend can elicit awe. 
Awe is an emotion that arises when we try to comprehend or accommodate new information that challenges, disorients, or overwhelms our existing knowledge structures. Psychologist Dasher Keltner at the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley and Jonathan Haidt at NYU explain awe this way. Awe involves being in the presence of something powerful along with associated feelings of submission, a difficulty in comprehension, along with associated feelings of confusion, surprise, and wonder. Aside from the night sky and the universe itself, the awe response can be triggered by other encounters with nature, such as sailing on the ocean, standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon, watching cells divide through a microscope or any of many other natural wonders. And I'm sure that you have some of your own, some of which we've heard about today. Next slide, please. Now from an evolutionary biology perspective, science writer and self-proclaimed bioneer, Adam Sinecki postulates, you might see how feelings of awe and wonder, which inspire a fair amount of fear and respect could be useful for helping us to avoid potential dangers. We feel in awe of lions or other animals that are powerful and alien to us. And this might be one of the feelings that helps us avoid getting too close. We feel in awe of huge heights and perhaps this is one of the things that prevent us from jumping. Next slide, please. Bear in mind that our understanding of anything can be layered with various explanations filling in pieces of the big picture. For example, the question, why am I here, could be answered in various ways. The scientific explanation might re reference the union of ovum and, ovum and sperm and physiological development of the fetus in a mother's womb, while a relational explanation might reference a couple's desire for a child and a spiritual explanation might refer to a higher purpose or calling for a specific individual. The how explanation of the process does not negate the why explanation of the higher purpose. Next slide, please. Furthermore, I'd like to suggest that looking at the world with awe, wonder, and curiosity led to the early Greeks practice of natural philosophy which was simply the search for understanding through their study of the physical world. They believed that nature could be understood and that the diverse behaviors observed in nature were held together in rational patterns. Over time, practice showed that inductive reasoning in combination with empirical observations worked better in understanding the physical world than philosophical deduction that was used prior to this by the Greeks and this then led to the establishment of what we now know as modern natural science. When scientists wonder about something, they make observations and formulate tentative explanations and make predictions, do experiments and create models or theories to answer questions, all for the goal of obtaining a compelling explanation describing observed phenomena or evidence, which makes accurate predictions and leads to a better understanding of the universe. As King Solomon wrote in the book of Proverbs, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings to search it out. I love that passage. It is in our human nature to want to try to figure things out, to understand everything we possibly can. And again, bearing in mind that our understanding of complex concepts is usually layered with various explanations filling in different pieces of the big picture, may we consider that awe and wonder, in addition to their evolutionary roles, serve the purpose of engaging us in exploration of the natural world. Awe and wonder are a great starting place for inspiring us all to seek and learn and discover all we can about existence, life, and the very universe that we inhabit. As Albert Einstein wrote, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and science. Thanks very much for inviting me to participate in this fascinating dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, I just um, commented. Um, Einstein also said, 
all, you know, I want to know God's thoughts. All the rest is details, you know. Right, so, right. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, again, Mark. a lot to think. And uh, I can tell you have pros with you. We'd <laughs> love to have a copy. Um, yes, thank you so much. And say hello to Jennifer. It's been a while since I talked to her. Absolutely. Well, and it's been a while since you brought your students home. You know, uh, it was delightful to meet them when, when you did that. And uh, do you, are you still teaching? Yes, I am. And now that we're supposedly going to be on campus again, um, it will be easier to do that. We've had kind of a virtual learning experience for the last year and a half, as most people have experienced. Yes, USC's and all the other institutions are, are wrangling the same thing right now. And uh, we all want to be, um, if uh, you know, uh, looking at each other rather than virtual. Absolutely. Thank you, Leslie. And I hope you get a nice, beautiful kitten. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, if you stay with us, we'd love to have you for uh, our, um, our um, concluding uh, session. Sounds good. Uh, thank you. Which brings me to another uh, wonderful person who uh, I first saw lecture uh, when I was a student. And you know what? He looks just as handsome. Uh -huh. um, I want to say hello uh, to Frank White, who got hello, us all hello, involved, <laughs> who got us all involved in this pursuit of, uh, of looking at planet earth from without and and what does it do uh, to us and uh, um, frank uh, has written several books i have your autograph book from that lecture <laughs> it's worth a lot <laughs> <laughs> many 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 years ago yeah uh, frank take it from here Hope you and Donna are doing well. Thank you, Madhu. All right, let's see if I can get my PowerPoint going and it looks like I can. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Yes. All right, let me clean this up a bit. Okay, so I have to build on what Leslie said. I'm just in awe of the brilliance of the gathering here, uh, Madhu and Ken. I think we should make it an annual event. I'll just say that for starters. I, I am uh, too. I am too, Frank. <laughs> and all the people who came together. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. It, it's really fantastic. I wish I could comment on everything that everyone has said, but I can't. So I'll just do my best to add a little bit. And my topic is on becoming a space philosopher. <clears throat> there are three words there that are critical. Becoming, because I don't think I'm there yet. I, I feel like I'm in the process and I try to be a better space philosopher every day. Uh, the second word is space. I come at it from being engaged and awed by space exploration, space migration, all of the things we're talking about. I do not come at it from being a trained philosopher, which has both its positive and negative aspects. Let me move on here. I always like to look at the definition of words before I talk about them. And I went back and looked at philosophy and as Madhu said, uh, it is certainly the study of, fun of the fundamental nature of knowledge, reality, and existence. A lot of people today have commented on that. It is also a theory or attitude held by a person or organization that acts as a guiding principle for behavior. I'm really interested in both, but I'm really focusing today on the second definition because I believe what we need today is a new philosophy that will guide humanity's departure from planet Earth. And by that, I do not mean abandoning of planet Earth, but our expansion into the solar ecosystem. And let's not forget the Earth is a part of that ecosystem. 
before I go any further, I've got to stop and uh, give a tribute to Stan Rosen, who's going to speak next. Uh, you know, I coined the term the overview effect. It is true. And people often wanted me to say I discovered the overview effect. I said, no, I'm not sure of that. People were experiencing it 25 years before I published my book. And in fact, late in the process, I found that Stan had been conducting research on the astronaut experience in the 60s and 70s. He really described what we call the overview effect after interviewing astronauts and other NASA employees. He published what he found in an essay called Mind in Space, another one called Space Consciousness. And I really just want to acknowledge Stan here today. He deserves a lot more recognition for this work. And I tried to give it to him in the fourth edition of the overview effect. All, all of us read uh, Stan's uh, uh, papers. Uh, Very good. Said. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, that that's really important to me. So thank you for that, Perhaps Stan. Gave a hostage to I want to hold this for a minute. So what what made me start thinking I should be a space philosopher instead of a social scientist, which is how I was trained? It started in 1986, shortly after the Challenger accident. All of us were shaken and we were in mourning over that. And philosophical questions started to be raised, like, why are we doing this? Oh. NASA said this was going to be routine, but look, people are dying, so we need to question why we're doing it. And I was finishing the first edition of the Overview Effect, and I was watching uh, This Week with David Brinkley. It had George Will, a columnist and commentator. It had Tom Wolfe, author of The Right Stuff, and of course, the great Isaac Asimov. And George Will asked a question that set me on this path of not only exploring the overview effect, but beginning to think about space Fortune philosophy. That, sense, that as we began to justify the space program in the most banal utilitarian ways, they said we ought to go into space because we got non-stick frying pans out of space technology. Maybe do we need a new vocabulary to discuss space? You put your finger uh, right on it, George. Uh, NASA has never, uh, let's, the country, let's not put it on NASA's shoulders. The country has never had a philosophy of space exploration. So that hit me really hard. And I said, well, we need a philosophy of space exploration. And I didn't know about all of you. I hadn't met all of you. I thought, well, maybe I'll give it a try. Um, and I have been working on it ever since. A lot of us look back at fictional efforts to create a philosophy of space exploration. Many of us were inspired by Star Trek and the Prime Directive. It's a good start, I think. It, the right of each sentient species to live in accordance with its normal cultural evolution is considered sacred. Jean-Luc Picard said the prime directive is not just a set of rules, it is a philosophy. And if you watch Star Trek, you, you know it's not complete and that Starfleet captains often contradict or disobey the prime directive. But when I talk about space philosophy, I, people say, well, what do you mean? And I often refer to the prime directive in Star Trek because Star Trek represents a vision of our future that I think many people find uh, inspiring. What about the overview effect? That's, that's the core of what I've been working on for 35 years or more. And it, it is imp important and, and, and significant. Uh, this is the image, of course, of the blue marble taken in 1972 by Apollo 17. I think it's pretty clear, and again, Stan's work confirms this, and my research confirms that there is some kind of shift in awareness, identity, and cognition that astronauts and cosmonauts report 
when they see this, they see the earth as a whole system, interconnected and interwoven. We're all in this together, they say again and again. So it changes their perspective on themselves and on our planet. Now, recently, I want to share with you another idea. It's not philosophical, it's sociological. It's the concept of the overview effect as a boundary object. This is an idea that was developed by a sociologist named Susan Starr, appropriate name for our world. A boundary object is apparently a theory or an artifact or entity that has internal coherence, but is plastic enough in her terms that many communities can make use of it without necessarily agreeing with one another on everything or having consensus. Over the years, the overview effect theory has become a boundary object, in my opinion. Philosophers are using it, psychologists are using it, artists are using it, and they're not necessarily talking to one another. And yet they're developing this kind of philosophy of human expansion into the rest of the solar system uh, without necessarily doing it all together. And yet it's all contributing to this new way of thinking. My own effort to really formalize this philosophy started again in 86 as I was finishing the overview effect. And I thought to myself, if Tom Wolfe is right, how do we start building a new philosophy for space exploration and migration? The first reality that occurred to me is that almost every argument for humans leaving planet Earth are anthropocentric or homocentric. It's all about benefiting us from nonstick frying pans to better computers to even the overview effect, which benefits us in terms of consciousness. I'd heard of the Gaia hypothesis, which tends to put us in a more mutual relationship with the Earth. And I thought, isn't it amazing that four and a half billion years have created this species that can, in fact, become a spacefaring species? How is it that the universe or cosmos has nurtured us to this point? And, you know, Carl Sagan said that we are the universe becoming aware of itself. And so the hypothesis is that our function, our purpose ecologically is to bring life, intelligence, and self-awareness to the cosmos on a much broader scale because we exist as part of the cosmos and we're already fulfilling our purpose. But perhaps the entire enterprise of space exploration is to do that on a vaster scale. One thing we have to do is be kind of humble about this. In the overview effect, I wrote about the explorer fish as the, the first fish that flopped up on land and then went back into the water and tried to convince the other fish that this was something important and they should explore land. And of course they were res resistant to that. But in any event, that explorer fish was convinced that this was important, but she could not have realized what it was gonna lead to. And our astronauts are like that. They're trying to tell us what it's like out there, but we're gonna have to go for ourselves. And even so, we have to be humble we don't know where this is going to lead and our descendants uh, may end up our descendants may end up being as different from us as we are from the fish still we have to try and one of the efforts i've begun and i got this uh, uh, from the idea of a central project for all of humanity Central Project, John Mankins, it's essentially what you were talking about. The, the Gothic cathedrals were a central project, the pyramids, Apollo. It's an effort to do something in physical reality that has moral and spiritual transcendent meaning. So I have formed the Human Space Program as a nonprofit 
organization. And our goal is to ensure a sustainable, inclusive, and ethical evolution into the solar ecosystem. And to echo what some other speakers have said, we want to make sure that voices that haven't been heard on Earth are going to be heard uh, as we evolve outward. I believe we're at a point where we have to make it absolutely clear we are not leaving Earth to its own devices and escaping it. Too often when we say, I'm a space organization, that's what people hear. If you say I'm an environmental organization, people hear saving the planet. So the human space program is an enviro, enviro space organization. Just to summarize, thanks everybody for listening. You know, space exploration and the space program has not been about philosophy, but it's changing our entire philosophical outlook. The overview effect is creating a paradigm shift, but we need to go beyond it. We need a new philosophy of space exploration and migration as we move out into the rest of the solar ecosystem. Groups like this can be critical to that. And I hope all of us will contribute. After today, I know we will. The last point I would make is that there will be unintended consequences, positive and negative. The first astronaut I ever interviewed for my book, Joe Allen said, with all the arguments pro and con for going to the moon, no one said we should do it to look at the earth, but that may in fact be the most important reason. So there are probably reasons out there uh, that will elude us and, and that will probably still uh, help us fulfill our purpose as we try to develop this new space philosophy. Thanks everybody. It's been an honor and a pleasure to be with you today. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Frank. It's, it's wonderful to hear your voice. Uh, it's been a while. Yeah. Uh, um, stay in touch. I do get your a newsletter and announcements to join your, um, your gatherings. Uh, I hope to do that too, uh, because right. uh, we have to keep this keep this um, going, and uh, you're doing a great job at it. <laughs> thank, Thanks, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Will you stay on? I thought you said you would. I'm, I have to step away for just a minute, but I'll be back. Okay, great. Yeah, Madhu, Santosh raised his hand. Do you want to take a question or later? Um, do we have time? Shall we move along and take the question later? Uh, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll take it later. I'll be happy to do it later. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Talk to you soon. Um, okay. Now we are on to our good friend, uh, um, uh, Dr. Rosen. And uh, um, I can tell he's enjoying a relaxed time at, at Lake Tahoe. Um, uh, Stan, take it over. Um, you know, the way I came across your works, uh, I think it was published uh, uh, the, from the US Air Force. Am I right to think that? Um, um, of all people, Rod Pyle sent it to me. And uh, then I scanned it. And then I realized that you had been uh, publishing quite a bit on this matter um, uh, um, in the 70s. So uh, uh, please go ahead, uh, uh, Stan. Uh, uh, Stan is a, a reviewer in our studio and uh, makes some very sharp uh, uh, <laughs> observations and critiques. Um, um, it's good to uh, uh, know you and Anne. Um, Stan, please go, please, uh, please proceed. You, you are muted. Still muted. You want to increase the volume perhaps or? Can't hear you still. Keep trying. Can can we do something? Uh, let me see. It looks like it's normal. Okay, I, I can try this. Let me try this way. Yeah, he's not muted. 
It's unmuted, okay. Um, now, his microphone is on, but let me mute, mute, and then try to do it okay. again. Keep talking, Stan. Now it says, now I, I see uh, on Stan's screen that it's muted. Now it's on. Okay, go for it. Still. Uh, I <laughs> can't hear you. Okay, let, let me try another way. Try another way. This. Keep talking. Can't hear you still. Yeah, because he, he logged in from two parts. Okay. Okay, so maybe this way. Uh, we are starting to, it's crackling. It's crackling. Keep talking, Stan. We could hear you for a little and then it's gone gone quiet again. Can I have a suggestion? Hold up a sign or put up something and send him a message on the screen. So he sees it because he's probably not. Okay, we can message, message you. We can message you. He may not be seeing the message, so maybe better just to go to share your screen instead and type the message so it's visible to him on the main screen. Can't hear you, Stan. Another way is, is to uh, sign up and sign back. One more time? Back. Oh, you could, yeah. you could phone in, right? But I think he can hear us. He just, he just, yeah, he can hear us. Yeah. So my suggestion is to sign, sign off and sign back right away. Sign out, okay. Yeah, it's audio setting. Yeah. I see. If you can hear us, can you give a thumbs up? Uh, let's see. Yeah, I don't um, think you can hear us. We, we hear a crackle from time to time, Stan, but not. That, that's cracking is Santosh. It's, it's oh. not from, uh, the Santosh is trying to give some suggestions. I but, it actually. But his voice is breaking up. But he's talking about a button and lower right. Uh -huh. So I think for, for Stan is that you, you maybe temporary sign off, leave the meeting and the, uh, sign back again. That uh -huh. typically will be, yeah. What I believe will, going on is that his webcam is not assigned as the microphone and he doesn't know that. So what I would recommend is you stop the sharing, share your own screen and type a message to him to tell him to do that because he probably is not able to see or hear what we're saying. Can you hear us? Can you give a thumbs up? No, he can hear us. Can he can yeah. hear? Yeah. Okay, go to the bottom he right. He can hear us. That's not a problem. And check the settings for Zoom. And if you go to the audio settings, you can actually specifically assign the webcam as your audio if that's not if it's assigned to something else. No. Yeah, I think it's better to sign off. Sign off and sign back in. Typically, that, that will resolve this issue. Uh, that could, but he still needs to double check his audio settings to make sure that it's assigned to the right audio input. Okay, let, let me ask him, uh, Stan, do you want to do you want to reboot and see if it'll help? Yeah, give me uh, one or two minutes to sign okay. back. Yeah, because when he signed in, Zoom will ask him to select the, the audio. That's okay. the part that he can solve it right away. Yeah, let us, let us hope so. And uh, who do we have here? While we're waiting, could I ask my question to the previous uh, presenter or mention well, my If If Frank is here, I think he's offline you step, now. step out a little bit yeah yeah but uh, no worries but did you want us to hear the question to you yeah i'll just mention it right now i mean i can always ask it again but basically it's not really a question more of a comment uh 
I don't know if you guys have heard of uh, James Stockdale, Vice Admiral. He was a POW. Yes. He yes. started out as a uh, graduate of the United States Naval Academy. He was a naval aviator and carrier fighter pilot, and he yes. attended Naval Test Pod School. I Interesting. Know, I know yeah. He was uh, tutoring while at Test Pod School a, a little known Marine officer by the name of John Glenn. So his uh, credentials in engineering are unassailable. But the interesting thing about him was before he left for Vietnam, he had enrolled at Stanford University to get his master's in aeronautical engineering. But he took on a whim encounter a, uh, a class on philosophy and changed course to change his master's degree uh, to philosophy instead of aeronautical engineering. And he said that that's what saved his life throughout his ordeal as a POW in the Hanoi Hilton in Vietnam. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating arena. Many of us in the professional areas uh, miss a liberal education, particularly philosophy. You won't believe it. It was like five years ago, the first time I heard of uh, Plato's cave, you know, and uh, then I had to go in and read it up to see, see what they were thinking, you know, um, Plato and Aristotle and the classics. Um, uh, many of us miss that background, uh, uh, Santosh, and uh, uh, <laughs> I prescribe a good dose of uh, liberal <laughs> education for all our students. Uh, I wonder how we could do that. I think we could do it much better now because of, um, of the availability of media, as opposed sure. to having spent five years just doing philosophy. Um, you know, um, what's his name? The uh, um, the uh, founder of um, of Palantir, uh, uh, who is now in Los Angeles, um, um, uh, uh, the the investor uh, from uh, Tito. Um, uh, the name again, Peter Thiel. Tito. Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel. Yeah, Peter Obviously. Thiel. Um, uh, he uh, is a philosophy major, and. Uh, and the angle they bring to uh, our discussion uh, is, is very, very wholesome compared to uh, uh, the very constrained uh, philosophies of engineering or, or the sciences. And uh, it's always appreciated. I think um, it's a very good, a good thing to do. One uh, our irony is that uh, the, the places that actually do balance the liberal education and the philosophy are United States are US military academies like the US Naval Academy and the right. US Air Force Academy. Yes. They are required to have a liberal education. So they've reduced some of the technical course load compared to civilian universities. And among that uh, at, at Navy is uh, they're required to read uh, Admiral Stockdale's works, uh, the Stoic Warriors Triad, uh, mm -hmm. in which he talks about the Stoics back in the, in the, in the, in the Greek times, as well as uh, there's another book uh, called the, the the philosophical thoughts of a fighter pilot, which he talks about. He kind of reflects on the philosophy, his whole experience going to Vietnam, being a prisoner, and so forth. Okay. So they, they did a really good job of merging the two. Yeah, in case all of you are listening, um, Santosh referred to the Stoics, and one of my questions at at uh, meeting strangers or at dinner table is, "Are you an Epicurean or a Stoic?" And uh, uh, it always diverges into very interesting um, interesting thoughts. Um, you know, um, one thing, uh, Santosh, that um, we don't pay attention to is the amount of literature and the philosophies that come to us from the um, Eastern cultures. And, uh, and that requires only another five years of learning. Uh, so between all of that time, you'd rather become a deep thinking philosopher or do the karma and the work karma uh, in our lives. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a choice that we have to make. Um, hopefully it starts so in the future. Are we getting closer, Ken, to a resolution or did we lose? Uh... No, 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 that has been waiting for two or three minutes. Well, okay, okay, let's uh, do it. Uh, yeah, but hopefully his audio is okay now. Okay, can you hear us, uh, Stan? Yes, I certainly can. Oh, Great. that's wonderful. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Loud and clear. clear. Very clear. All right. Let me let me see if we can make this work this time. <laughs> of course you can. Rebooting helps always, huh? But it does. It does. Exactly. Now we should be able to see the screen. 
You, oh, yes. you good? So yes. first of all, let me uh, we, we, thank, we see uh, you. We see you, but not the screen, not your, not your PowerPoint. You're not seeing the PowerPoint. Okay, let's do that. Probably have that green button on the bottom. It says share. No, do it again. Oh. Yeah. Little artwork to get oh, started. Perfect. Perfect. Little perfect. artwork. Yeah. I just wanted to take a minute to thank Frank White for the nice words of recognition. We've all, uh, you know, been inspired by Frank's work for so many years, uh, uh, in so many areas, including the overview effect, but going way beyond that. I'll talk a little bit about some of how his other concepts inspired me in this direction. But Frank, thanks very much. I'm, I'm just touched by your nice, your nice gesture and your nice words. And, Madhu, and I'd also Stan, like to thank and, you and Stan, for organizing ready. this. Uh, Madhu came in and he said, can you talk about space philosophy and limit it to you know, five or 10 minutes? A giant topic, <laughs> hard to do. You've done a great job, Madhu, and I want to thank everybody that's participated in this session so far. I've been totally inspired by what's come along. I'm not a philosopher, so I'll try to say something of interest in here for a few minutes and then move on. Let me start by doing a little philosophical exploration, a little experiment. And my question for everybody here is, where are you and what are you? Now, if I had my chat up, I would ask you to put it into chat, but I can't see chat right now. Are you in your body? All right, well, if I cut off your finger, is that any less you? No, that's you without a finger. What about your hand? or both hands, or both aren't, where does the you start and stop? It's the real you. If you lose your hand, your arms and your legs, where are you? Can you, are you still there? So the you that's part of your consciousness is the you that I'm going to address today and be talking about a little bit from a philosophical standpoint, because the potential to change the way that you are humans express themselves and manifest themselves may be on the verge of a revolution, accelerated biological evolution. We know that the assumption we've all made is that we've evolved over millions of years to live in the Earth's environment. Uh, but space is a very different environment. And so the body and the consciousness and the system that exists to support human life is a different environment. As one of the prior speakers, I think it was Melody, or maybe Leslie talked about the fact that we happen to be able to live in this universe, but not well beyond the confines of the Earth's atmosphere for these and other reasons. So the premise I would make that changing human biology may be an alternative assumption about how to evolve off the, uh, the surface of the earth, rather than bringing earth-like environments with us into space, like O'Neill colonies or lunar surface colonies or bringing different aspects of Earth's environment with us, change the way human biology exists. That's a real possibility for exploring space and look at where the technology is. We already know about artificial limbs. That doesn't change anything. Robotics and the ability to send our mind into space, well discussed. Cyborgs, in fact, the combination of humans and robots have been well discussed. Now, some of this started in, in science fiction, but may go beyond science fiction. And now with genetic engineering and other biotechnologies, who knows what we can do to encapsulate the real you the human essence, the human consciousness, and take it into space independent of the human body. Now, yeah, over, over millennia, a lot's been written about the fact that generational evolution and genetic drift could occur, but I'm talking about something that could happen much quicker. And this is not just my idea. This idea of transhumanism is being well discussed. And look at some of the references that you can look up and people that have talked about this idea of moving into the cosmos, moving off the planet um, without taking the human body as we currently know it, going all the way back to Bernal, who's 
did a lot of work on this. Even Arthur Clarke talked about his idea that he thought the way that humans would go into space as machina sapiens moving into a more machine-like entity. Dandridge Cole, you mentioned Freeman Dyson earlier had talked about it. Even Frank himself has written a lot about homo spatians. And uh, I'd hoped he'd be able to talk more about that today. I encourage him to, but maybe during Q&A, we can hear more about that. Martin Rothblatt, uh, even now, speaks a lot about virtually human in her book in 2014. So there's a little bit of a chronology of people that have talked about the fact that we may explore space and evolve into space without taking the human organism that's evolved on Earth as the vehicle for carrying human consciousness. Now, Frank already mentioned that in a session like this, we want to ask, what is philosophy? So I won't repeat everything other than to say that uh, I mentioned also George Foray there. And uh, I think it was Britt who talked about George Foray earlier. And I want to thank her for mentioning that. Um, there are other definitions. Let's look at the last one, just from Wikipedia. The study of the general and fundamental questions, such as those about existence, reason, knowledge, values, mind, and language. Well, let's look into those in the context of moving into space. What are the implications for those elements of philosophy? Metaphysics, the topic of existence, as we change the nature and the form of life, what do we mean by existence? And our ability to understand the philosophical implications of how life evolves into the, into the universe and relates to the universe will change as we biologically may change life. Logic, the ability to use advanced thought processes in combining human thought with artificial intelligence changes the dimension of what we mean by thought, what we mean by reasoning, and the very logic that we we'll use to conceive of reality. That will change. Knowledge, the epistemology of how we understand and translate what we sense into models that, that describe reality as we increase our capacity to know, to change the human mind, to change human senses, to change humans' ability to interact with the environment. The whole epistemology of what is reality, what is the universe, will change in and of itself. What about the moral aspect of philosophy and the values that go along with the changing priorities that we'll take with us as we look what benefits human nature as human nature change? The values that will benefit and move humanity in positive directions may take on entirely different dimensions. And I mentioned these just because, yes, we could spend hours talking about each of these philosophical aspects of transhumanism, expansion into space, expansion into new forms of human biology. But as we move beyond biology, the human mind, the human mind's ability to conceive and understand nature around it and the way it provides a framework for interacting with reality will all change. So with only five minutes to discuss this, I'll leave those on the table for future discussion. But when we talk about aspects of philosophy, if space settlement does in fact radically accelerate the evolution of human life, these basic tenets of philosophy will certainly need to be reevaluated. So let's stop there with the short time we've got and leave the rest for Q&A. Thanks, Madhu. Uh, thank you, Stan. I also noted you had referenced uh, Farr and uh, Ben Finney. Uh, these are all people uh, we are familiar with. And there's, there's yet another uh, philosopher by the name of um, uh, Schwartz. Have you seen his works uh, on, on space philosophy? Some, because not a lot, but some, yes, my dear. Yeah, because if you ask a real philosopher, like I did, uh, they blink at you with, what do you mean by space philosophy? Uh, it's not a uh, established, <laughs> established branch of philosophy, but I think there's a lot of beautiful points you make here. And uh, the mind beyond, you know, the question that came to mind um, immediately is that 
there is a heuristic um, that's been quoted by professors. I'm sure um, uh, Chris Kokinos knows this, but uh, in, 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 it's called the surgeon's, uh, a corollary of that quote is called the surgeon's uh, heuristic. I think it was first uh, quoted by Chris Robertson. Uh, he says that the eye cannot see what the mind cannot comprehend. And uh, it, it, this goes on uh, in all of surgery when uh, uh, you know uh, the surgeon is about to enter your body and do what he or she is supposed to do. Um, they don't have time for for looking at other things that are happening, um, uh, except do the job and get get out. It's like uh, any mission uh, in the uh, in the forces, you know. You have a very specific target. You don't have time to philosophize. Uh, but anyway, uh, thank you very much. Dan, how are we doing on time? Uh, Thanks, Madhu. Good food for thought. <laughs> Good to see you, Stan. Um, OK, uh, uh, we are ready for uh, um, Reverend Downing. Uh, is he with us? Yes, I am here. Oh. Oh, we are sorry that uh, everything has been uh, delayed a bit, uh, uh, Larry, but we are so happy you're with us. Give us your take on, uh, on spirituality and religion. Give, it, give us the hard dose. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try. The lighted candle that propels uh, Okay, Stan, you want to, uh, uh, do you have, uh, uh, Larry, do you have, uh, okay, there you go. I don't okay. have any slides. You don't have slides. Okay. All right. Please, please go with your talk then. Okay. We can hear each other okay? Oh, very clear. Okay, good. The lighted candle that propels an alien vehicle and its cargo out toward infinite space provides the information that tells us something has been created that forever changed how we understand the earth. This home of ours for the multiple millenniums and the cosmos of which the earth is a part. Within us lie forces that nudge us to reach beyond the boundaries and define and confine our activity. Historians, sociologists, and others of their kind have sought to tease out what drove those from an earlier time to test their abilities and set about sans reliable charts, instruments, and base support to experience and explore lands beyond. Today, when a spacecraft leaps towards the stars, the technological gadgets packed within that craft boggle the mind. The humans aboard, surrounded by all the wonderments, may be an interesting attachment. But in fact, the human is not infrequently teamed, termed a passive interlooper, not an essential component to the mission. Settled smug among the engineered parts and systems, the human presence from our perspective makes all the difference in the world. It is the human factor that excites and thrills the soul and catches firm our attention. The human, unlike fabricated contrivances, has the ability to observe, reflect on what is seen, ponder how what is observed impacts life and the generations yet to come, and opens to us the consideration of concepts now unknown and awaiting discovery. Questions begin to form. Conclusions are reached, some discarded, others incorporated into one's worldview. We've mentioned Frank White and his overview effect that he gave us information after interviewing the astronauts who once trod the endless cor corridors of space and returned back to the home planet. That yes, indeed, that experience forever changed their lives. Conclusions were reached that they never would have imagined. What comes clear is the perspective from space had a profound impact on all who viewed Earth and the cosmos from a vantage point few have witnessed. Questions percolated through consciousness that sought answers. There were times of doubt, feeling of isolation, struggles to tease out meaning and purpose for life, thoughts of beginning, thoughts of ending, it is reasonable to assume questions like these will arise from others who inhabit space. Machines will not provide answer. The human factor has pertinence and purpose 
as humans soar toward and enter the beyond. By tradition, major events call for some form of ritual. Who will be responsible to be that one who performs those rituals? What training or experience will initiate appropriate action? Those who design and monitor journeys that reach towards space do well to consider how best to provide meaningful response to the events, beliefs, practices that await or are valued by passengers and crew. Expect there will emerge concepts and theories that will shake one's soul. Who will be present to support and guide through troubled times? We can expect marriages to occur. A woman may get pregnant. Yes, birth control will be prescribed, but none of them are fail safe. Ask your local obstetrician. Sterilization may not be a welcome solution. Who will be assigned to provide support in such circumstances? Disruptions between and among passengers or crew are to be expected that may escalate to dangerous levels. Divorce is possible. Who will have the skills to mediate? Should someone die or an infectious disease surface, the entire community will respond. People do not venture into space to die. When death occurs, what is the protocol? A slot in a space vehicle or other form of disposal for those who die in space? Will that be the deceased at end of time? Will that be the exit from the ship to join the other orbiting bodies? When humans venture beyond Earth, it is reasonable to expect those in space will value the arts, entertainment, literature, music, associating with others, and recreational activities. All of these practices and innumerable others like them are part of our humanness. The challenge for those who plan, implement, and monitor monitor the space ventures is to nurture the qualities that enhance our unique qualities. Resist with vigor the Spocky and ideals. Societies and countries have attempted to function by enforcement of strict rule, cold logic, and lockstep obedience. The results have been catastrophic to those who resisted the mandated thought or behavior. The authors of Hebrew and Christian scriptures and other ancient documents describe places and events that take readers to venues far removed from Earth. The writer describes scenes that occurred in worlds far removed from ours with the same ease as we describe events next door. The human inhabitants of heavenly places as reported by both sacred and secular writers were plagued by the same insecurities, jealousies and frailties that affect us today. Gilgamesh, the hero of the second millennium BCE Akkadian myth, survived a worldwide flood. Fear, doubt, bravery, and eventual triumph over the natural events were part of the story. In the end, when the water subsided, the survivors were accepted by the gods. How exactly the first inhabitants of a space community will adapt to a challenge far different than humans have ever encountered staggers the imagination. Not the least part of the puzzle relates to the question, how can those who journey beyond Earth create a society that will benefit all? And how will that society be maintained? These questions and others like them transport us from the realms of science and verification into the fuzzy venues of philosophy, epistemology, morals, ethics, faith, hermeneutics, religion, and anthropology. Will such philosophical quest evolve into a new religion or belief system? Numerous terms have been created in an attempt to identify the mysterious powers that lie deep within the human mind. In Hebrew, that force is orach. In Greek, pneuma, from which our word pneumatic derives. In English, we speak of soul, spirit, breath. Whatever term is selected, there is brought to fore life's mystery. Protect and nurture that powerful force that alone is ours. It is not possible to predict with accuracy what life will be like for those who first establish a self-perpetuating presence beyond Earth. What we can predict with some degree of accuracy is that challenges that test our abilities will continue. Some expected, others not. Likewise, we can expect human nature to evidence self in the far off places in a similar manner to which we now experience on earth. There will be situations where greed dominates, violence breaks forth, 
and other maladies that impact our earth and our lives, these will be evident. Likewise, we can expect to find acts of extreme kindness, unselfishness, care, and other positive human responses. The existential questions will continue, perhaps even intensify. Why am I here? What is the meaning of my own life? Why evil? Why destructive behavior toward others? Why do we humans behave as we do? When I die, what awaits? The response to these questions and others like them will provide the framework upon which an ethical and moral value system rests. And those who venture into space do well to have been prepared to deal with such things and to have people who are sympathetic and open to discuss the matters that may arise. Components of our humanity serve to remind us of why it is essential that those who venture beyond earth promote and practice ethic and moral systems that value good over evil. There will be respect for those who practice a faith system that meets their spiritual and emotional needs and assurance that people who inhabit far space can live in accordance with their conscience insofar as that belief promotes the good. These principles will not assure a successful soldier, but without them, one can expect eventual failure. Thank you. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Yeah, just as I said, uh, uh, you, you gave us the hard dose of being human. And uh, um, it's uh, <laughs> a lot of questions. Um, and I think, um, I think you put uh, science and technology in their proper place, uh, because I too think that, uh, uh, that they are just, um, just tools we use and since uh, since the primitive times you know when we started shaping flint tools and now we use now we do genetic engineering and uh, um, you know, but the heart of the matter remains i think i, I recall a quote from albert einstein uh, just after uh, the manhattan project uh, before the bombing of hiroshima uh, he had a he had an inkling this was going to happen so he mentioned that um, uh, everything changed uh, with the um, uh, with the release of the energy from the atom, except the thinking of man. And uh, 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 we have to grapple this. You know, I think Bob Crone and others and you, we are all thinking optimistically about a new future. Uh, Frank, uh, all of us in this group now. Uh, we want to push us beyond <laughs> the warring uh, uh, cannibals we are, <laughs> but uh, we, yeah. probably, <laughs> we probably will. Uh, I think space is one arena where we have clearly shown that uh, 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 recycling water, um, uh, looking at planet Earth as a finite resource, um, you know, using clean energies, are all coming uh, online, though we'd like it to have happened 20 years ago, it's happening. Hopefully those things will make us a more refined and sensitive species. Thank you so much, Larry. Welcome. And, uh, please stay on. Uh, uh, we are going to our next speaker who is none other uh, than uh, Hank Rogers. Uh, you have read his bio, so you know where he's coming from. Once in a while, when I get into discussions with Hank, he will tell me, Madhu, Madhu, I'm really a game designer. I'm here to uh, entertain people and enjoy life. But, but the first time he pitched this idea of uh, promoting uh, life beyond Earth, uh, it caught us all uh, off guard. And uh, I would like uh, Hank to take, uh, uh, take the podium. Hank, go for it. Uh, can you mute? Can you unmute, Hank? <laughs> Great. It's like it's the first time I'm zooming. <laughs> um, well, thank you for having me, and uh, and thank you for putting me after this amazing speech that just happened. Uh, 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 right down. Really, right. really, really, <laughs> you do that to me. I'll remember that. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk about why we exist, uh, and and uh, that will sort of happen at the end of my speech today. 
Um, I'd like to start with talking about what do we do. And uh, if you look at the history of, of, uh, of humans, uh, we have always, always explored and we've always settled. We have settled every place on this planet that is possible to settle. We left Africa some 60,000 years ago. We found Australia some 50,000 years ago. That is a long time. So in a space of 10,000 years, we managed to find Australia. The Americas were more recent discovery, uh, maybe 33,000 years ago. And um, Hawaii, Easter Island, New Zealand uh, is as recent as 1.1 and 1.0 and 0.9 thousand years and 900 years ago we found New Zealand. You know, I, I don't consider the voyages of the Europeans as being voyages of discovery and settlement. They're more uh, voyages of, of conquest and enslavement, which is not, I think this is not the uh, exploration uh, and settlement that I'm talking about here. Uh, when we go back, we tried to recreate the voyage, and I, I've been on this voyage. I, oh, I should do this. I sailed on a, um, I sailed on something called uh, Hokulea, which is, um, which is a Polynesian a recreation of the, the voyaging canoe that this, that found Hawaii back, you know, 1.1 thousand years ago. Um, how does how did they do this? I mean, we're talking about a canoe, a double hull canoe that's made out of like single dugout tree trunks, two of them, and then masked in a deck. I mean, this lashed together without any metal. So if you go back in time, this is an amazing achievement. And, and, and they sailed thousands of miles across open ocean, thousands of miles across open ocean, fine, uh, Hawaii. And how did they do this? Well, they say it's celestial navigation. So we, we sailed by the sun, the moon, the stars, the wind, the waves, and the birds. And by the way, birds, especially certain kinds of birds, are going somewhere and coming from somewhere. And that is some indication of where land could be. In fact, there's a certain white bird that only flies 10 miles from shore. So we know we're within 10 miles of an island when we see this bird. So the thing, is, the thing that we learned, that I learned uh, when I sailed with Hokulea, isn't just about celestial navigation and, and uh, teamwork and camaraderie and all that, which is all necessary for space exploration. But we, we try to understand the mindset of the original explorer. And so when we go to a new location, when we go to a new island or a new land, we basically stand in the water on the beach and we humbly ask the native people of that place for permission to stay in their in their land. This is the mindset that we need to have when we go into space. We need to go with humility and respect. And I just can't, you know, we can't go there with the military like conquer. Let's, let's take this territory. No, we must go there with respect and not destroy any place that we go. So Let's go, let's take a, a bigger view of, of, of this whole question. The earth was formed 4.5 billion years ago. I'm told DNA or RNA uh, appeared about 4 billion years ago. The Cambrian explosion, which is when all of, all of today's species got their start, that's 450 million years ago. Humans, we've only been around like 300,000 years. And spacefaring humans have only been around for like 60 years. So if you think about the time it took from the time that the Earth was created to the time that we actually, or take the when life was first created or, or appeared to the time that we actually left the planet, that's some good 4 billion years. So I'm from the computer game business. And what basic, basic thing in, in, that we do is we make backups. Earth does not have a backup. Life as we know it does not have a backup. And this is the thing I believe that is our central mission, the mission and the reason that we exist. Let's, let's look at life, life as we know it. Now, I believe that life as we know it isn't a whole bunch of little creatures crawling around like ants. No, life as we know it 
is one thing. And when you look at the earth from uh, from from space, basically you can see this is one thing. This is not lots of little things. It's one thing. It's just like our brain cells or are, are, these are not individual living beings. We are a living being and the earth is a living being. Let's give this light, this, this thin skin that lives on this rock, which is only like, I don't know, maybe a mile thick. Let's give it a name. Let's call it Mother Nature. Well, I believe that Mother Nature is pregnant. Mother Nature is pregnant, and we are we are the solution. She's having morning, morning sickness, by the way. That's why the whole place is getting hot. And when we go to space, and when we bring life as we know it to another planet, it will mean that Mother Nature, or life as we know it, has had a baby. I don't claim that we that I know of a place where we can actually do this. Yep. Probably not the moon. Hmm. Maybe Mars. Uh, probably there's there are going to be more Earth-like planets in in other places. The problem is that they might already be occupied. But be that as it may, our reason for existing is that we must make a backup of life by going to other planets. So it's not so much about humans in my in my my belief system. It's about life. And life can eventually create other humans. So maybe it's about sending microbes and they eventually will evolve. But we, our job is to make a backup of life. Thank you very much. Would you, would you say this is intriguing at the least? Uh, you know, this is one of the freshest angles I have heard in conferences in the past few years, and I'm so thankful that uh, uh, Hank uh, uh, is able to say it as he would did today. Uh, Hank, there is uh, Lisa Lockhart is with us from Hawaii, and she says that the, that the way you ask permission in Hawaiian is called Oli, and uh, and uh, it, is a, it is a spiritual term. Uh, it's part of a ritual, I suppose, and I'm sure you know about it. Um, I would like you to meet uh, Lisa. Uh, she works at the Shamanad University uh, in Hawaii. Okay. The, when, you, when you can touch with her. Oh, she just wrote a beautiful <laughs> chapter on space architecture. Uh, we are just reviewing it. And so with that, great. Um, uh, Hank, you got a couple of comments. You can look at chat for now and stay on with us. Uh, I'm going to go over to somebody who is, who is drinking a lot of coffee <laughs> and in the wee hours uh, 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 to us from uh, uh, Istanbul, Turkey. Um, hello, Aisa, it's so pleasure to see you. Um, 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 uh, uh, Aisa Oren uh, uh, is also uh, an artist a designer and an architect. Her, back, her education is in architecture. And now uh, she designs anything uh, from uh, uh, wearables. And uh, uh, all you need to do is go on her Instagram and you'll see what she does. Uh, good to have you with us, Aisha. Sorry we are running late, but uh, you know, every one of these talks is so precious uh, that uh, uh, I feel I'm so happy to have been part of this. Um, go for it, uh, Aisha. Uh, tell us uh, what you have. Show us what you what you what you talked about. Uh, uh, what you sent me in the uh, earlier emails. Hello, Matu. I hope you you hear my voice. Yes. Oh, good. Uh, I didn't drink so much coffee. Uh, apple apple juice was enough for me. Oh, and okay. <laughs> It's just one, one o'clock in the evening in Istanbul. So hi from oh, hi okay. to everybody. Okay, good. And uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, well, I want to start with the imagination and the meaning of imagination. Um, because everything starts with imagination. And it's actually um, occurred and uh, just a minute. 
I have to reorder my stuff. Sorry. I want to start with imagination again, because uh, it's the most important uh, creative pr process of mind. It happens uh, in mind between the perception and understanding. It occurs in the space. And uh, it has nothing to do uh, with knowledge. It creates its own image. And uh, it's different from other mental processes with this manner. And when we are talking about the uh, architectural imagination, we pay a lot of attention to the form, how it is looking like. And uh, there comes an inspiration, a shape, an idea to our minds, not related to any restriction, any investment, anything at all. Uh, I, uh, Aisha, do you, do you have slides or you're just talking? Um, yeah, I have also slides. Um, oh, well, we, you're not screening them yet, uh, I just... I thought you were just talking, but uh... desktop one, maybe. Push the green button, share screen. Sorry about that. I, I did not know because you were talking so fluently and nicely. I thought you did not need slides. <laughs> Open them. Okay. Hmm. How can I? How can I share it? Open the system preferences. Matu, I think it's not working. I'm just trying to just a minute. I should you should be able to share. What, what do you see on the bottom of the screen, uh, Aisha? Do you see a, a share screen, a green? Um, yeah. Oh, oh, there you go. You got it. We got it. Oh, you want to start from the beginning. I want to see those slides, and you can quickly go up uh, to the first. Oh, sorry for everybody. OK, so <laughs> I, um, I, I want to start again. Okay. Um, OK, let's talk about the the full screen. Presentation. Is there another... Oh, put it on presentation mode. You can, you can expand the slides. Bottom right corner. Do you see the right hand bottom corner, the arrows? Yeah. Push on it. Bottom right corner. Do you see the right hand bottom corner, the arrows? Yeah. Push on it. Not there. Down, down below, all the way down the screen. Uh, go to the go to the right, and you'll see two arrows. Yes. Down, down below, all the way on the bottom of the screen, uh, Aisha. You see the 43% and then you see the number five and next to it, you see um, expansion arrows on the bottom of the screen. Yeah, go down to the right and down. You see the arrow or you don't? Yeah. Push on that. The expansion the, arrows, the two expansion arrows. It's I between don't... the question mark and the five. Between the question mark and the five, right? Yeah, okay. I see it. Can you see it on the screen or no? No. Okay. Or alternatively, hit the present button on the upper right. There's a present button. Um... Just move your mouse to the right corner. Up top. Okay, go to the left a little bit. Down just a... a, a, just a just a tad to the right, or to the left, rather. Up, or uh, right. The uh, arrows uh, are going uh, all down. A little bit down. A yeah. little down. bit down. There it goes. Click. 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 Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> OK, now go all the way <laughs> down to the bottom. Now all the way down to the bottom. Down, down, down. And OK, go to number 43%. 43 percent yes okay then go then go to the right go past five 
and then you see the double arrow? Yeah, yeah click on that. Huh. Ooh, we got it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, perfect. And I'm seeing also my stuff. Good. Okay. okay. Um, okay, I don't want to start from the beginning. Uh, we talk about imagination and it is, yeah. uh, it's in the space between perception and understanding. And it's the basis of creativity and it's the basis of architecture creativity. And uh, when we are, and, and uh, we have to think about, uh, it, it, actually this is the start of architecture. We dream about a shape, we inspire. Something is taking us from something inspire us and then comes the reality. The reality is related with knowledge. And uh, and uh, um, and especially in moon architecture, uh, when we talk about reality, a lot of restrictions is taking place, and uh, it's not something we used to see. We used to live in. It's something full of restrictions. And actually, the, the new moon architecture uh, will rise from its restrictions and will create its own rules. And uh, actually the rules create the knowledge. I want to give for Matu this example because he was the uh, creator in Venice. Venice is a very good example of constructing with rules and it's still standing after all these years. And uh, so then also if we're going back to knowledge, knowledge is, uh, knowledge is something interesting also. There is data data transforming information and when information comes together that creates knowledge and uh, knowledge is uh, i mean human cognitive process is able to change information into knowledge and it's actually still a little mysterious uh, but of course we're going to discover how, how we're turning it into knowledge and um, yeah, um, well, actually, maybe how humans evolve in time is uh, is how related with knowledge. We collect books, we collect knowledge. The cats, the animals. I don't see any any other animals reading books. So knowledge is important, um, and. Um, Hmm. And in the beginning of uh, moon habitation, as you mentioned, I've been working with smart projects, Internet of Things, and uh, I've been dealing with technology. So as an architect, I have an intense relation with the smart technologies. And when we think about architecture and uh, space, maybe the form is going to be primitive, but the technology inside this form is going to be very high. Uh, there will be a huge number of monitors, sensors, and all kinds of equipments collecting data to understand what is unseen, unknown. We have to understand, we have to collect the data, turn it into information, turn it into knowledge, combine it with our imagination to create the new, uh, new language, new codes, of the space architecture. And so maybe the form is going to be primitive, but the technology and the data, the sensor, the smartness is going to be high. In Earth, after the 60s, after the digital, the digital age, by the beginning of digital age, we are now moving on smart cities. Now it's turning into responsive cities. Still not enough. We have to turn into wise because if you think about nature, nature is wise. So smart cities is not enough even. Responsive cities are coming, but it's not going to be enough. We have to turn it into wise. But if you are thinking about the space architecture, the infrastructure of what is unseen, most probably will create the the physical uh, uh, the physical form. Uh, of the space architecture. I mean, space architecture is so wise. 
I'm talking about, of course, about lunar uh, lunar surface architecture. Um, so we are talking about primitive architecture, but what is primitive architecture? Inflatables is seemingly as a good chance. Um, but if you think about human history, um, when we immigrate uh, with horses, no technology, we were immigrating with our tents. So tents, and we even use uh, inflatables in aviation. So people are used to live in their tents. People hey. used to live in their yeah. cave. Um, uh, used to. The one you, you just sent me. Okay, the, the timing is the timing. Can, is can somebody mute? Can somebody mute their uh, mute their system? Uh, you're interrupting the talk. Oh, I thought it was a question to me. Sorry, I don't sorry, I don't, um, so we are we used to live our with our tents, and if you go even further back, we were living in the caves, and so we were digging the ground. So underground architecture. When we are thinking about underground architecture, our ancestors were living in underground architecture, and they had also a lot of technology. So living underground, uh, also on moon, has many beneficial effects. For example, some projects are thinking about creating cities in space. But if we think about human history, cities was evolved much more later uh, in the human history. Cities are the most amazing creature of us. It's like the reflection of human body on a landscape. So maybe we are now talking about smartness, responsiveness, wiseness. As we learn more, we are reflecting our, uh, like the city is a reflection of human and cosmopolitan. And if you think about the earth, maybe uh, to living uh, in a united uh, in bay can be, the, can be the solution to create better cities, better uh, civilizations. And I always like to give as an example, Cappadocia from Turkey. It's an underground city uh, with seven stories down, dig the, dig the ground. And um, it has many advantages. If you're going to build something on, on the also moon in underground race, uh, it will, it, it is going to make uh, the extreme conditions much easier. It's going to save us from the uh, micrometeors, direct sunlight, maybe radiation, and uh, many other things that maybe we don't know at this point. And, um, but how we are going to build underground cities? If we're going to, uh, before the underground cities, we have to use the lava tubes and more primitive forms. Uh, in my idea, uh, to create an unfolding, expanding super light system as an outer skeleton, skeleton. And there will be an inflatable inside with multiple membrane with wavelength, with wavelength uh, rejecting layers and aerogel installation can be a short term solution for underground architecture. And uh, why I am taking the, uh, this expanding, unfolding super light uh, material from outside this, if you go even before the human age, insects, if you look to the insects, insects are better survivor than us because their skeleton, or uh, let's say the hard part of their body is outside. So it's protect us. Inflatables are a good solution, but if we take the skeleton outside and uh, in an unfolding, expanding manner in a diagonal, and then if we put another diagonal that, uh, in each other, then we will we are going to have a, a diagonal shape, and then going to create inflatable inside. 
then that we can use environmental and uh, other mechanical concerns by holding uh, the, the, by attaching from uh, this diagonals. And uh, it's going to, if, it, if we can able to put it inside the level tube, it's going to um, create um, enough shelter for the primitive uh, living of humankind. And after we are available, after we can transform our vehicles and other architecture stuff, that is 3D architecture is promising, many other architectures promising, and then we can start to carve the moon. But to, 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 to that process, I believe in inflatables with an outer skeleton covered from outside. And um, everybody, most of the readers, most, most of the speakers today actually read, uh, read poems, some poems. And um, I didn't know they had any poems, but today I had that impression to bring to bring a poem from very past so from Lycian times 3000 years before our time uh, i find a poetry one of the earliest poets maybe uh somebody writes i i i i somehow want to translate it into english and uh, it was like this don't feel sad if you can't find me. You will find my crafts, the stones I cut, the road I made. You will find the sculptures I have. Uh, sorry, what I have worked on. And you will see thousands of years away our fingerprints will touch each other. Thank you for listening. They're very touching words, uh, at least for me, uh, Isa. Uh, it tells okay. you, uh, it tells you uh, that the human imagination can transcend time and space. Uh, uh, you know, when words can do that, uh, I, I'm sure uh, Christopher Koki knows. She says it's a lovely poem. And to think that this was um, thought of so long ago. <laughs> I mean, I mean I, that tells you what imagination can do. That is so beautiful. Uh, thank you. Have you been to uh, Go, Gopeki Tepli? I, I haven't been to Gobek Tepe. I am so inspired from Papadokia nowadays. Okay. And uh, this is actually how we touch uh, with people who live thousands of years ago. And uh, so I want to carry this idea to further yeah. uh, into space, as you understand, um, so that maybe we can carry it uh, much further. So our... Yeah. Fingerprints is going to touch uh, absolutely our, our uh, future generations. Maybe they will find us somewhere, huh? Yes, and you know, I think many places in the world people live underground, uh, um, Asia, and uh, particularly in Australia, there are there are mining areas where people have large townships. Uh, thousands of people live underground, so um, uh, there is a problem within our industry that thinks everything has to be hyper uh, technological perfection. Um, when uh, some things are right under our nose and uh, we don't use it. And living underground uh, saves you approximately 90% of the energies uh, used in heating and cooling uh, uh, normal surface structures. And that's just the beginning of it. Um, you, you can stay away from the fires and uh, the earthquakes and all of that uh, mm -hmm. surface phenomena. And all of these things um, have been uh, tested and tried. So to think about living in lava tubes on the moon uh, is quite, quite fascinating. Thank you for your insights, uh, um, uh, Aisha. Good to see you looking so nice and cool. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, now we are going to uh, our next speaker. 
uh, who is uh, none other than uh, Major Sean McLean. I see him there. Um, you know, uh, um, uh, I don't know if you, Sean, did you know a name by the name of, uh, by uh, um, uh, the name uh, Colonel um, William Haynes? Did you know that name? Does it not ring a bell? That name does not ring a bell. Okay, well, um, uh, um, you know, William Haynes, I mean, Bill Haynes uh, was uh, very involved in the AIAA here in Los Angeles. And he was a reviewer in my class and he was a test pilot out of Edwards Air Force Base. And, um, and uh, we used to get into, um, uh, get into debates about, you know, why do we fight? Um, you know, why can't we all be a cosmopolitan and understand each other and do the kind things? And, and uh, Bill uh, sent me uh, a speech and that was written by a general uh, 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 talking to West Point. Uh, he said that uh, we sleep in the night because some of us, very few of us, are staying awake uh, for us. And um, that hit me at that time and said, you know, uh, there are things we cherish uh, within our uh, nation state paradigm. We call it um, cultural, we call it uh, um, uh, our civilization. And as long as we run in between those lines of uh, nation state paradigm, uh, uh, wars will be inevitable. I don't want to get into your talk, but uh, uh, please, uh, um, uh, please tell us more, uh, Sean, um, uh, what you have in mind. Sure, let me just share screens and get set up. I am, uh, I'm just glad I was able to get on because I came online about 30 minutes ago and had internet issues with my router. So oh, I'm just okay. glad I was able to fix that. But you're sounding clear and you're coming through very well. So can, I, can everybody see that? Okay. Yes, we can. Uh, we can go full screen and we should be ready. Okay. Everybody good? Everybody yes. see that? All right. So again, I'm Sean McLean. Uh, I am active duty in the United States Space Force, but for the purposes of today, I'm just speaking for myself. Um, I was asked to do this. Here's my disclaimer. Um, so it's, uh, it's lawyer speak, but it just basically says these views are my own. Um, I'm going to be talking about my uh, master's thesis to an extent, and then specifically what Madhu asked me to talk to again with uh, search and rescue or personnel recovery. And uh, just want to make sure that, that point is reflected up front since this is being recorded. All right. Um, sorry, I kept this. This is also uh, just kind of a, a general. Uh, outline that set up from a previous speech that I recycled this from, but I think a lot of people just have questions maybe that aren't quite sure why we have a Space Force and a United States Space Command, which are two different things. Um, but all this to say that there were a lot of historical um, trends that were happening, a lot of events that happened. Just It, it wasn't just a thing that happened a couple of years ago in the previous administration. It was something that was driven by about 40 to 50 years worth of uh, events and trends and things that we took to value in space. And that's really what the bottom part is that, you know, if I just clump together the things that I get out of space into space power projection, uh, that's what we derive as a nation state. So space power is essentially what we get from missile warning, SATCOM, GPS enables billions of dollars worth of gross domestic product. It's an aid to, you know, financial transactions. Almost anything and everything is using GPS to some extent now. And that just basically goes to say that it's a form of soft power. Space power is essentially a form of soft power for those that are into the geopolitical, social sciences, all that. Um, it gives us the quality of life that we as a nation expect. And that's just it in a nutshell. Space is important, but it's hard to explain directly like the other forms of warfare. So um, my background and my thesis focus on space domain awareness. How do we know what's going on in our environment? The context and analogy that I use in my paper and what I often use to kind of illustrate and, and tell people what it's like being involved in space domain awareness, it's kind of like knowing what's going on in, in the polar regions today. Um, and it's actually the same difficulty with space. Uh, 
not a lot of people go over the Arctic or Antarctic. Uh, typically, they, they choose not to or they just can't get up there. There's no reason to go to for most people. But there are things up there that are valuable. There are things as a result of global warming that are making resources, routes, fishing, all these things that are becoming um, more uh, economical and giving incentives to other nation states to go to these regions that were previously just considered remote or not worth it. And all that to say that now that there are incentives to go there, economic incentives, there are also other incentives to uh, potentially protect what we might find up there. And all that to say that the polar, uh, the Arctic and the Antarctic regions, I think will be considered litmus tests for how nation states treat the cislunar domain between us and the moon. How do we handle things on the moon? How do we solve disputes? A lot of what we are talking about uh, in the space community for lunar issues, I think are gonna be um, drawn from uh, legal lessons and other lessons that we gain from these two regions. So uh, I'm just gonna show you a bunch of pictures from my thesis. I don't wanna get too deep into these. I spent a lot of time on these just trying to uh, make an intuitive graph for those that don't really understand the cislunar environment that is the space between the, the Earth and the Moon and the orbits, uh, the potential orbits that are around that, how th that space can be used. Um, a lot of this is derived from orbital mechanics, physics, et cetera. And I just wanted to lay out the art of the possible in a physical layer so that I could start building what's possible with an economic layer. And then I wanted to say, what can I see? What do I need to see? Where can these sensors be? Where can all these different sensors with different phenomenologies, uh, electro-opticals, you know, the, the naked eye, infrared, different wavelengths, um, just different ways of detecting different types of activity going on. Where can those things be? And how, how would they contribute to an overarching SDA, space domain awareness architecture? That was the point of my thesis. And all that drove this final slide at the end of my thesis to say, this is essentially what can be around in the next 15, 20 years if we choose to develop certain things at a certain number. I didn't put any numbers in there. That's just what this was. So this is just to say this is possible. Okay. And then the reason Madhu brought me on was one of the, uh, the uh, driving points that I said for why you would want to have this space domain awareness architecture is you're potentially gonna have the need for in-space personnel recovery, which really only a few people even in the Space Force are talking about right now. There aren't that many people living, uh, there's no one living beyond LEO and there's not even that many people living on the International Space Station. But if you take something like Elon Musk's Starship and some people in the community call it the Starship Singularity, that's essentially you know, uh, an uncertain uh, variable that if it becomes a reality, that's going to open the doors for a lot of different things that right now just aren't possible. They're not planned for, they're not practical. There's really no um, practical reason right now to have capabilities for in-space personnel recovery because there aren't that many people out there to rescue. So it's just one of those basic resources. It's not justifiable right now, but it could be justifiable. It might be very justifiable in the near future given how many humans are expected to be in space at any given time. And that's really how this next consideration, I think this discussion, if you will, philosophical discussion should be had. It's not a question of if this can happen, I think it's a question of when this will happen. And I think it really, at that point, you're just arguing over specifics, how many people and when, and that's really how you could frame this. So I'll just give you a little bit of um, explanation, you know, you can go Google some of these. This is uh, the definition in the military for personnel recovery. And there's a nice blurb up front. Um, but really, it just goes to show that there's, there's a psychological um, comfort that comes with this idea of having a personnel recovery capability. Soldiers that are un under combat in a stressful environment, if they ever become isolated, if they are ever captured, it is nice to know as a military serviceman that there is a capability, there is a network, there are things in place to bring you home. And I think that is something that is pleasing, not just for the service members, but also for the service members, parents and family and loved ones and, and everybody else here stateside. So um, if you think about it in those terms and apply that to space, I think it kind of becomes just 
immediately self-evident. I think I really need to argue this point with anyone, but if we had that same capability in space, wouldn't it make the space exploration missions that everyone is talking about with the manned component, human spaceflight, going to the moon, Mars, beyond, if we have these capabilities in space, then I think it naturally lends itself to making space seem more accessible, but also generally safer. If, if, and at least in the sense that if something goes wrong, it doesn't mean that you're going to die. It just means that help could be on the way. It doesn't guarantee that you will be necessarily helped by something like this, but it means that if there is the idea of having different mechanisms in place to save people, then that goes to lend a realm uh, or an aspect or a feeling of being secure in an otherwise hostile environment. And I think that just adds a huge psychological um, comfort to any would-be astronaut or anyone conducting human spaceflight activity in the near future going forward. It just makes it an easier proposition, something where people might be more risk averse, suddenly find themselves, oh, okay, as long as I have that safety network, safety blanket, the safety net, then anything that I'm considering doing, I can now do because now I know that at least there's some semblance of having a safe environment to operate in. Um, with the other domains and the way that the DOD breaks it out, they have the, excuse me, I'll go back one, they have the preparation, planning, execution, and adaptation elements to this. Um, and I don't, I don't profess to be an expert on this. This is not my background per se, but that I do think that there are lessons that can be taken forward. I think the only thing that I really um, can, can kind of start inserting and injecting some of my background is that big yellow circle in the upper left of the preparation that says situational awareness. That's where my background will come in and say, you need that to kind of inform all these other things that you're going to do to prepare for that um, eventuality. And then the other things, planning, that's just a regular staff function, military people and on certain at certain levels in certain offices do planning for various things all the time. That's just a, a typical routine function. Execution, same thing, provided there are capabilities, personnel, and, and resources to do the mission, then execution is just the part that happens when it needs to happen. And then adaptation is what happens afterwards. Once the event has happened and it's over and hopefully the people got back or not, but then you figure out, okay, what went wrong, what went right, and then how do you move, how do you evolve the mission? How do you make things better going forward? So I think the execution piece and the adaptation piece are not there yet. We haven't had an event yet like that. Um, maybe Apollo 13 would be the closest example I could come to to say that we had a personnel recovery event in space, but they got themselves back. So they, they just got the aid via uh, Houston and the, and the rest of the world to kind of help them. I guess a similar thing could be said um, with the movie The Martian, but I don't want to go into the details of that. But, but the idea is that there are certain things that we have now, and there are certain things that we would want later. Right now, we don't have a lot in the way of hardware capability, but we have time and we have the imagination and we have the idea of what we think the, this scenario would, would look like. And that allows us to preparate, uh, to, excuse me, to prepare the environment. So we start having these conversations across the space community. We talk about what kind of situations or scenarios could come up. And then we start writing those down. And then we start sharing notes. And then we start saying, oh, okay, I can see the common thread here with all these scenarios. Maybe that should be the driving thing that becomes a requirement that says, this is what we would like to have if we were ever to have these scenarios then we can start having a conversation about resourcing for a capability down the road. And then that's something that the military can start planning against because then it becomes a little more realistic once they have a better idea of what it is that they're actually supposed to plan for. Um, and I think in-space personnel recovery also becomes an expression of soft power down the road for all the reasons I just stated. I think any nation state that has this capability going forward is going to bring a lot to the table and be very attractive as a, a partner for any um, middle or lower tier nation in terms of attracting um, partners and just in general having any kind of uh, economic or other activities or partnerships going forward, not necessarily in space. But if you have any, and if any of your um, citizens in space, wouldn't it be nice if you had a major power that could say, we have the capability to protect your people and save them in the event that they have an issue in space. I, I think that would also go a long way towards diplomatic relations. 
on any other number of fronts. It's just another way of attracting partners. So that's kind of my reasons. And this is also a notional reason, or excuse me, a notional scenario that I use in my thesis uh, for how I would get uh, a starship like large vessel back, how I would plan for it, what would I need? And that this informed a couple of slides ago what I would want in my cislunar space domain or in its architecture. So hopefully that wasn't too all over the place. Um, I don't know how left or right or off center this was to any of the other talks. Again, sorry, I, I really only logged in about 30 minutes ago and listened to the last two lectures, last, last two presenters. Uh, for those that are interested, I have uh, a slide here. The slides become available. The, um, the notes page for this particular slide gives links to all these things that are on this slide. If there's any interest in military doctrine, military uh, important works, I would say recent publications in the last couple of years, I think these are the ones that you would want to read if you're just generally curious what's going on to the, the, the DOD space community. And with that, I will open it up for questions. Uh, th thank you so much, Sean. I really wanted you in this lineup because uh, sometimes, in fact, all the time, practical mat matters take precedence over idealistic matters. And uh, uh, this is something you mentioned, the na nation state paradigm. It's only 500 or 600 years since the time of Machiavelli, um, but that is how we govern. And uh, you know, it's our values versus somebody else's values, protecting our culture and our children. Russians have their children too. I think it's Sting that sang that song, right? So all, all nations have this issue. And uh, um, see this uh, person, Parabellum. You know, uh, I think I remember uh, that part from um, Richard Harris in Camelot, and when, he's, when he says to himself, might, for power or, or power um, or might is right, you know, might for right. Remember all of those little- um, Was little it might makes right? Might makes right versus- Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, this is very important to know. And uh, um, so we are in that kind of a, um, I wouldn't call it a straight jacket, but that is how we as we have structured governance. And so it is very important to note that this, um, uh, this common defense um, attitude, I mean, we spend the most money on it uh, in, our, um, in our budgets, you know, I think it's closer to 700 or $800 billion um, and uh, healthcare doesn't come close to it. Um, so it is, it is cherished. Um, so um, uh, now what I want you to do is stay on, Sean. I know you have a baby and a spouse, but if you stay on, we'll get a little bit of discussion after the next uh, two speakers will be very short. Please do that. Th thank you. Thank you very yep. much. And Me, there are some uh, questions too on, on chat that you could, uh, you could respond to directly, Sean. Okay, was there somebody else who mentioned something? No. So we are on to our next speaker, uh, who is Wes Jones. Um, he is an extraordinary architect and uh, teaches at USC in our school. And uh, uh, I'm so glad that Wes has taken time off from student engagement right now. Am I right? Or... Well, yeah, school's already started. That's right. We're, we're uh, doing the boot camp now, which is sort right. of around the clock for two that's weeks. Right. I'm so happy to see you, Wes. I hope uh, you're doing well. Uh, uh, please go ahead and uh, share. Okay, let slide. me. Yeah, I, yeah. I, let me try. I don't, don't want to uh, tell them what you did, so you can do. You can do that. Right. So let me try this. Uh, I hope that my position at the end here doesn't have some kind of metaphoric relationship to the subject matter that I'm it going does. to talk about. It does. I play. Oh, you. <laughs> okay. Well, I will be talking in much more generally. Uh, uh, than that, but let's see if I can't actually uh, get my screen to uh, share. Uh, so let's see, do you guys see anything now? Uh, do you see a desktop or do you see, I'm trying to show some PowerPoint, but fortunately when I play the 
it goes into the yeah it goes into the uh, presenter notes rather than the slideshow itself because uh, it's on another uh, screen. So maybe let me try this. If I disconnect the second screen, it will come over here. Do you see blackness now? We did, we did a moment ago, but now uh, you're back on screen. Oh, really? It was wow. working the first time. Huh? Now I can't even see myself. <laughs> no, it was working. It was working just before. Just before. Is it yeah, working now? We, we saw your screen, but now, not now because you disconnected it. Okay. Yeah. So the weird part is, is that when I do this, so right now, let's see. I will do the share screen thing again. Okay. Desktop two. There. Now, as soon as I go to here. What do you guys see now? So, we see you. What? You did something different this time. Oh God! Yeah, I had this problem earlier with class. Um, so, okay. you, did you want to reconnect? Click on the screen you want to share. No, I did. I did do that, but because I'm uh, trying to show a slideshow and I have a second screen connected it goes into the presenter view uh which makes that screen uh inaccessible and uh so let me see if i can't well if you cannot pull the screen from the second um you know screen maybe temporary unplug the hdmi cable for the second display well, okay, so yeah, the setup is laptop and a second screen. The uh, PowerPoint show is on the laptop. Oh, I see. You need to look at the note. I see. Okay. Well, no, I have the notes actually on a, on a separate machine here. Okay. Um, but the problem is, is if I try to run the slideshow, um, so let's see, let's try it this way. Maybe I just have to... Uh, Okay, so that's there. And now I want to share my screen. And I, I do that. And are there video set in Zoom that you specify which screen you want to share? Yeah, so you're supposed to be able to speak the screen, but PowerPoint is cleverly defeating that by uh, making the second screen um, only in theory, only visible to the uh, audience, but not to you guys. What if you switch and put the notes on your primary and the slideshow on the so side? Are, yeah, so I have no notes uh, on my on the uh, machine that is actually being used for Zoom now. I suggest to use shared desktop and uh, not share the slides desktop. Right. And then this way, so that's yeah. because nothing. Yeah, OK, there okay. now that's my desktop. Okay. Yeah, and then pull the your slide into the desktop area. You don't have to even have well, full actually, screen. Well, uh, actually, okay. So you see the? Do you see the uh, slideshow now? You know the the blank. slides are blank, except for the second slide or the third. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So so you did you oh, see that you change go. right there? Yes. 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 Okay. So that is what we're stuck with now. In theory, in in, in um, uh, Zoom, I'm able to simply draw on the screen if I can now uh, get out of that and uh, just highlight this part, which unfortunately makes the screen smaller, but uh, does allow you not to see the other stuff. I guess I could just do this. Yep. Kind of crude. What happens when you go to presentation mode? Is it sticking it to the other display? Yeah, it sends it to the other screen. So if I try, like say for example now, let's see what happens if I just try to do the slideshow now. Okay, so let's see. Does that work? Okay, that'll work. It's working. Yay. Okay, let's pretend. 
As with ISA that we're just starting now, I'm the last one, so I guess I have kind of less time well, pressure than the others. Well, well, you do have some pressure, Wes, because- No, no, I know. I'm, yeah, no, I'm not two, trying to. Yeah, two I'll other just, speakers. I'll just go faster. Okay, then no, okay, take it so down. Anyway, um, you know, I always uh, wonder where to start these kinds of things, but I like to start uh, assuming nothing, you know, like Descartes, uh, and, and doubt everything, but I'm not going to doubt everything, but I am going to start assuming uh, assuming nothing, um, because I'm trying to get from here to the moon and beyond, I suppose, in this talk. Uh, and the first thing I would notice uh, in assuming nothing is that there are three things in the world, uh, us, uh, nature, and um, the things that we make. These things that we make, we place uh, between us and nature, and these things are technology. That is to say, Everything that's not us or nature, including language, logic, society, everything is uh, technology in this view. Uh, and really, if you want to, um, if you want to get technical, there are really only um, two things: uh, technology and nature, since we are strictly ourselves a part of nature. And for me, then everything follows from that. My career uh, in architecture, in fact, has been consumed with this realization and uh, with its implications. Uh, the first of which for me is that architecture is technology, but it's not building or engineering. Architecture is elective, it's not essential. When we elect to make architecture rather than just build, we are deciding not to make a building more beautiful, as a lot of people think, but rather to invest it with meaning, beyond the meaning uh, that drove the need to build in the first place. And that meaning uh, comes through the thing's form and the space that it makes. And this limits then what responsibility that architecture can legitimately take for the so support of the species as an example itself of technology. In other words, it's not planning, it's not programming, it's not life safety, it's not physical health or well being, which is to say, uh, social or environmental justice are not architecture's responsibility, but social respect and environmental dignity are. Preventing you from falling off the balcony is not architecture's responsibility, but giving you reasons not to jump is. In fact, even keeping rain off your head is not architecture's responsibility, but keeping the rain off your parade is. So I'm overstating this obviously to make a point about the difference between architecture and engineering or between architecture and art or even construction. And this is because our technology is leading us into a world that is new and unprecedented and as it always has, architecture is being asked to place us there. And it's not obvious how this is going to work out. But before the Acheulean ax in the previous slide became the mouse, and this image here records, I would say the high point of that time before, it was all pretty clear. We are after all meat objects in space. Uh, that's how we understand everything. It is, in fact, in our DNA. And this is the base meaning that all of my work uh, offers, to place us in a world where companionship with the machine is understood and technology is an expression of our humanity that is felt to be every bit the equal of any art. Even out here, in the environment shown in this image here, facing the most severe test possible, it's not just engineering. It's not just form follows function. And the proof of this is in the different styles of technology, using the word style here as we would use it in architecture. And that means that, as I'm sure you're all super aware, American stuff is different from Russian stuff or European stuff, or Indian stuff, or Chinese stuff, even when those things are 
uh, let's just say emulating the usually original American stuff. And when they're not emulating our stuff, a lot can be read into such national differences. In my practice over the years, I've tried to make this point by discussing, discussing say, for example, the difference between the hot rod and a Ferrari. And without going into this in great length, which constitutes whole lectures otherwise, uh, in this image here, we can simply show, see how the image on the left, the American hot rod, is sort of cataloging the contributions that each element in the technology is making to the uh, uh, performance, to the production of speed here, while the image on the right, the Ferrari, is more illustrating what speed looks like. It's sort of blurring the edges. And this happens also in the most matter of fact objects. Here are two street sweepers, an American version and a European one. The one on the left is just matter of fact doing what needs to be done. And there's a certain handsomeness to that while the one on the right is really excited about what it's doing and trying to show off how it is doing that in a different way than the um, hot rod, I would say though, though this distinction is a little finer uh, to make. It's really kind of showing off all of the um, uh, expressing the movement of uh, cleaning and so forth. Um, and then even in architecture, uh, the difference between American stuff and European stuff, in this case, uh, uh, Foster's Hong Kong Bank, Bank is a difference between what I would call the oat tech or the European version of the high tech. And again, pardon my French, but I'm trying to pronounce H-O-U-T-E um, and technology presented in the more matter of fact manner as Saarinen's um, John Deere uh, headquarters in Moline. Okay, so this finally then brings us to the Astronauts Memorial, which was a competition uh, that was held in the late 80s uh, after the Challenger uh, disaster. Um, uh, a lot of entries, our entry, which was, this is the uh, competition board, uh, was overlooked by the jury, which was looking for little Greek temples and so forth. But one of the jurors' uh, uh, sons uh, was walking around looking at the schemes with them and noticed our rather, uh, we called narrative, he called comic book uh, explanation of our scheme and called the jury over uh, to look at it. And when they started to actually read it, they began to understand what we were trying to do with it. And ultimately uh, we prevailed and uh, were selected uh, the winners. Uh, the Astronauts Memorial was to uh, memorialize not only uh, uh, the astronauts who had fallen with the Challenger disaster, but all the previous um, astronauts who had fallen in the line of service uh, and therefore, and also be capable of accommodating future uh, unfortunate uh, events like that, of which there have been, as we all know, sadly, uh, several since uh, the early 90s when the memorial was completed. Um, so now really all I'm gonna do is go through and uh, show you uh, what the uh, memorial is and uh, invite you to understand it as a uh, uh, illustration or embodiment of that attitude toward technology uh, that I was talking about um, uh, previously. In particular, this idea that um, technology here is being asked to contribute to the memorializing event almost as if in atonement for the failure uh, that occurred that led to uh, the disasters. Now, of course, uh, they're not all uh, technology's fault. Many of them are um, uh, human error uh, and, uh, and so forth, but technology is there beside us as our companion in each of those environments and, uh, you know, and also went down, uh, so to speak, with or as the ship. So the astronauts memorial is basically a 400 ton slab of granite that rotates throughout the day uh, uh, to track the sun. Um, let's see if I can actually do some annotation here. That would be pretty cool. Um, nope. Okay. No, wait. Uh, you, can you see my mouse here? Yes, we can. Oh, cool. Um, Okay, so anyway, uh, it tracks 
the uh, 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 sun, which is basically kind of um, going across like that. Uh, these in the back here are mirrors that direct sunlight through the names, which are cut through the granite face, which is on the other side. And then the granite face has a mirror polish finish uh, that reflects uh, the sky. This is a drawing, sadly, um, a, a scan of a, an old hand. This, this thing was uh, designed back when we didn't use computers yet. Um, and so you can see the mirrors back here. The sunlight would come down through here and shoot uh, the light through. The whole thing rotates on a huge um, uh, gear um, uh, uh, wheel contraption. It has a very uh, small motor, 6,000 to one gear reduction uh, ratio and two large screw jack actuators, uh, which tilt it because of course, as we know, the sun is at different heights as it uh, uh, passes uh, throughout the day. And you can see here a little bit of the sense of the motion of the thing as it, uh, it goes through the day. And then this is a, a sort of a schematic image of the sunlight coming down, bouncing off the mirrors in the back, uh, being passed through the mirror face uh, granite, through the um, names, which are backfilled with a acrylic diffusing medium. The mirrors were designed uh, by uh, a consultant from Stanford University, Lambertus Hesselink, um, to create names that glowed so brightly they would leave an after image on the eyes. Um, the client, uh, the Astronauts Memorial Foundation, deemed that to be not a very smart move. Uh, and so they asked us in the end to put a filter over it to cut down that, um, that brightness, uh, sadly. But I thought that the idea of uh, people walking around uh, with uh, images of the people's names uh, floating in their vision for a while afterwards uh, was a pretty cool idea. Anyway, so here's the memorial itself after it was built. Um, on the other side of it, it has uh, several uh, ramps and, and, and means of access up to it. Uh, there, here you can see the mirror polished black granite. These are the original uh, uh, names that were on there when it was first built. You can get a little bit of a sense of uh, the reflections. This photograph here is like 30 odd uh, years old. And, um, uh, and so uh, it's, it's, you know, it's actually scanned from an old optical slide, which is why it's so crummy. Um, this is an image of it today. Unfortunately, um, after the, you know, within uh, a couple of years after it was uh, put into motion, um, the uh, client decided to fix it in place so it doesn't actually track the sun anymore. And now the only way the, the names are lit are by uh, lights that were originally designed just to keep the names lit at night. And now they're only lit by those lights. So it's not really uh, as dramatic, uh, but you know they still sort of show up and they, it still reflects the sky uh, when there's something to reflect here. Again, you can see how dim the, the names are that, the, uh, uh, that it no longer attracts the sky. In front, you know, one of the biggest technical challenge was to create a handrail system here that would allow you to walk up to the uh, memorial and place offerings there at the offering rail and protect you from falling off. And these uh, railings went up and down depending on whether the uh, memorial was facing you know, the east, the west, here it is uh, facing uh, what would effectively be high noon there. Uh, and here is a sort of a difference between the level of reflection uh, when it was first built and actually tracking the sun um, interestingly, it also kept the sun off of the face of the memorial, which therefore allowed it to reflect the uh, clouds a lot better. And on the right, you see an image of it nowadays with uh, the, some of the additional names that have since um, been added uh, to it. And a view from across the, um, uh, the lake that is adjacent to it. Um, the, what's sticking out towards you now in the front is the a ramp that would lead you up to it from the underside there and off to the left is the what we had assumed was going to be a list of all of uh, the uh, donors and everything but the astronauts memorial foundation appropriated that for a description of itself and its officers when the thing was built uh, here is a more contemporary uh, view of it taken a year or two ago again you see it fixed in position there um, in the in the noon uh, view, uh, depending on the uh, time of day, you would in this view see the granite, or you would just be seeing the back of it. 
And then at night, this is again a view from uh, its original installation 30 years ago. And you can see how the lights would have kept uh, the names lit uh, at night uh, uh, so that they would basically be lit 24-7. Uh, um, the idea you know, of its movement, of the lighting of the names is to keep them in connection with uh, a, a sort of a more cosmological uh, standard of um, memorialization rather than something that would just be uh, related to us and our experiences here on earth. And that's it. Thank you. I was just typing um, uh, this comment to Ash that uh, human space flight is risky business, at least the way we do it now. And nature is not good at PR or, or negotiating uh, in the law and simply does not lobby well at all. <laughs> you know, you got to, um, you got to play by, by nature's rules. Uh, yeah, nature uh, wins the game always. <laughs> always. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you so much, Wes. Now, sure. uh, uh, um, if you, uh, uh, you have to go back to class. Or uh, no, no, I, I made an excuse. <laughs> okay. Um, let me uh, bring you the next. We have two more quick little talks before we get into uh, discussion. Um, the ending talk really is in two parts. Um, we have some slides uh, from uh, um, Bob Crone. Professor Crone sent some slides. And uh, who wants to take it? Uh, Mark, uh, are you there? Did you want to speak to him or do you want me to speak, Bob? I'm fine with either one of you. Okay, I've got the slides here. Let me go with this. So now <clears throat> I want to let you know about what Bob has been doing uh, these past several years. Um, uh, he's been methodical. I mean, Bob is a fighter pilot, <clears throat> so so he's a uh, uh, he's a go-getter in many ways. He's um, been in the Air Force for many years, flown uh, different um, fighter aircraft, and then went on to um, uh, teach at USC and uh, in Australia and. Uh, um, Bob, did you work with uh, Petak, Bill Petak? At the, oh. do you remember Bill? Oh, I certainly do. <laughs> okay, Bill Petak lives here, so I see him sometimes, and we talk about the safety management, the program that was a big program at USC for many years. They had a system safety management uh, building near the. Uh, um, Cromwell Field, that was uh, uh, part of this program that supported our defense forces um, in management issues. Um, 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 Charlie Bolden was a student, Administrator Bolden was a student there. Were you there when he was a graduate or graduating? That's right. <laughs> so so, um, so uh, Bob knows all of these people. And, um, you know, it's been a delight since he started this um, Kepler Space Institute. He edited so many uh, books uh, on human space flight. And then um, he instructed me uh, to write some articles for him and pulled, him into, pulled me into various conferences uh, from the NSS where we discussed things like planetary defense. And then we talked about uh, spirituality and I had written a little article on, on, on CNN and that we refined and published in the um, Journal for Space Philosophy. Um, and uh, it got me thinking that, you know, philosophy is important because um, it is vital in complex operations because as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, um, there are many times when a manager in the middle of a very complex operation like a, an expedition or a mission, a space mission, um, has to guide by the seat of her or his pants because the rule book doesn't give you an answer to the query from 
uh, down the command the chain of command. Um, so philosophy is the only thing that can lead you. And I mean, leaders know this, but they don't talk about it. So when Bob started the Kepler Space Institute and pushed us all to think about it, uh, you know, I thought this is a very important thing. And uh, since then, uh, you know, Bob has been moving up the ladder and uh, making new ideas happen. With that, let me run through some of his uh, closing thoughts here. Um, uh, let's go, Ken. Well. My first closing thought is that Ken and you and all the presenters have just produced the best space philosophy meeting ever, in my judgment. <laughs> the idea that we should do it every year is, is a very good one. Okay, do you, do you want to talk to your sl slides, Bob? No, 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 no. I, <laughs> unfortunately, I, it doesn't work too well right now. Okay, so okay. Good. Okay, so, uh, so um, Bob has um, um, gathered together a, a whole bunch of people. Uh, every one of them is, uh, is a luminary and um, has been talking at, uh, at the Kepler Space Institute. And um, he sent me these slides here uh, saying that a colleague of ours, uh, Howard Bloom, uh, who is also online now and who will, who will share some thoughts, um, uh, had some things to say. And uh, um, so um, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So philosophy, as we all agree by now, is the oldest academic discipline, studying the fundamental nature of human knowledge, reality, and existence. It studies uh, the theoretical and actual basis of Earth's space knowledge. This is for, um, um, you know, uh, uh, is part of philosophy. Space is part of philosophy, even though some of the philosophers I talk to, they go like, what is space philosophy? Uh, but space is part of philosophy. Every um, uh, culture, every civilization discusses space as a, a philosophical uh, construct that they need to uh, deal with because we need to talk about uh, the origin of life, um, origin of life in the cosmos, on planet Earth. It's all part of space philosophy. Next. So the continued studying and analysis of space philosophy is essential to be a valuable contribution for the future purpose and effective development of global space decision-making. This is an increasingly complex subject with the exponential rise in commercial space activity combined with space Earth problems. You're absolutely right, Bob. And the important thing is that commercial space activity is, is just taking win, wing and it is doing remarkably well right here in Southern California. Next. Now, Howard Bloom's career legacy will be a gift to humanity. He is a leader championing all our improvements here on Earth. And as humans begin to settle in space, he has suggested such massive space philosophy ideas as greening the solar system. As you know, our, our different forces now talk about the near Earth domain, space situational awareness uh, is very close to us as Sean mentioned. Um, but um, uh, soon we'll be thinking about solar system uh, Howard is already way ahead of us and perhaps galactic system and talk about Kardashev and so on. Um, so uh, that's it. Right. Let's go to the next slide. Human cognition and philosophy account for the progress humanity has made on earth in spite of huge human mistakes along the way. Without future intelligence, 
intelligent space philosophy, human destiny is in peril. Uh, this is the this is the dual-edged sword that we are faced with, and Bob is exactly on target here. And I hope, Bob, in the last few presentations, um, we all have an optimistic view of what space philosophy can do for human destiny. And, uh, uh, you know, I just look at some of the technologies that the International Space Station is doing and attempting to do, and it already tells us things like um, if we reduce, reuse, and recycle, uh, we can go a long way to supporting um, our population. And then um, if you uh, use clean energy, I mean, station has been using clean energy for, for uh, 20 years, over 20 years. And it's only now that Elon and others, and of course, China is uh, pushing it uh, in a big way uh, to make us clean energy. So I think this works well. Um, good point, next. That's it. So uh, now, without further ado, thank you, Bob, for these slides. I want to introduce uh, none other than, than Howard Bloom, uh, who keeps on <laughs> writing books and sending me Hello, uh, articles. And there he is. Uh, uh, good to have you, Howard. Just in a few minutes, would you like to tell us what you're up to? Um, well, very quickly, uh, Bob, thank you, thank you, thank you. Bob brought me into the space movement roughly 15 to 20 years ago, and, uh, and I flourished in it. When Bob is talking about my philosophy, he's talking about a, ma a visual manifesto I wrote for the future of life and the future of humanity called Garden the Solar System, Green the Galaxy. And this is where Space philosophy comes in. Why do we need a space philosophy? A civilization only goes as high as, it, as its dreams. A civilization that looks up goes up. A civilization that looks down goes down. Science fiction has always been the leading edge of our imagining of the future. Science fiction since the 1960s has been all about cataclysm, catastrophe, post-nuclear ages. Um, science fiction is not guiding us well. Space philosophy tries to take this problem of what is our future in space on with logic. The Garden of the Solar System Green the Galaxy says that once upon a time there was a poison pill of a planet. It was a ball of stone that whipped around its axis every six hours for three hours. Every, I mean, this is the mother of climate catastrophe. Um, every day for three hours it was exposed to something poisonous called radiation. And for another three hours it was exposed to something equally poisonous called darkness. Um, the temperature went up and down roughly 88 degrees every three hours. What's more, this poison pill of stone had a tilt to its axis, and it went through massive climate changes that we know today as summer, fall, winter, and spring. And life had the audacity to start up on this planet roughly 3.85 billion years ago. And it's had the audacity to stick around through roughly 142 mass extinctions. But life does not simply hang in there. Life does not simply survive. Life thrives. Life is exuberant. Life is growth-oriented, massively growth-oriented. The whole project of life is about kidnapping, seducing, and recruiting dead atoms, dead molecules into this massive project called life. And life has barely begun on this planet. You can tell that when you take a plane from LA to New York City. Um, for the first two thirds of your journey, you are flying over brownness where there is very little of the green stuff that life likes to plant. These are empty areas waiting for the richness of life. But this is the planet in which life got its start, but that's just a start. Life is imperialistic, life is colonialistic, life is ambitious, life is anxious to capture other poison pills of stone and garden and green them. Um, and, but it's the civilization that sees the possibility of gardening and greening those other balls of rock above our heads that is going to own the 21st and 22nd century. And we have in many ways turned from utopian dreams, which involve moving out into the solar system 
um, to dystopian dreams. If you go to Asia, I'm the co-founder and co-chair of the Asian Space Technology Summit, which took place in Kuala Lumpur about three years ago. If, when you go to Asia, you don't sense this impending doom in the imaginations of all of the people who surround you. You sense impending astonishments. Go to the Beijing airport. The Beijing airport architecturally, as Wesley was saying about architecture, gives the sense that the Chinese own the skies, that they own the sun, they own the clouds, they own the blueness, and they own all that is beyond that. Um, for humans, uh, we, we talk about the carrying capacity of your environment, and those of us in the West, most of us who are commanded, commandeering philosophy, pirating philosophy right now, um, say that we are the, at the end of our resources. We have reached the carrying capacity of our environment. We have to pull back. No, I am sorry, we don't. All those treasures up above our heads are just waiting for us. And there is one thing that differentiates humans from any other species on the face of the planet. We think that our riches and our astonishments um, or our desecrations um, come from uh, our ability to research and development develop and create new technologies. Well, we're not the best at that. Uh, the microbial world is just as good at that as we are, and it's demonstrating its powers right now with the Delta variant of the COVID virus. The one thing we can do that no other species on Earth can do is take this grand project of life beyond the atmosphere, out of the gravity well, up to those poison pills of stone just waiting, aching, um, for life to invade and take over. And that is our obligation. We only go as high as our dreams. Space philosophy is about putting those dreams in a logical form so our fellow humans cannot avoid stumbling over them and perhaps being infected by them. Thank you, Bernard. <laughs> and I want you to know, I, I, I think my do went by a little too fast <clears throat> on that paragraph, you have, I think you're in your seventh book now. Each eighth one. Book, working on the eighth one. The eighth oh. one, by the way, Bob, is the case of the sexual cosmos, everything you know about nature is wrong. <laughs> every, every book he does. Is... All, of you, all of you may like to know that Howard was <laughs> behind uh, the marketing of several of the famous uh, rock stars. Uh, Howard, did you have any contact with David Bowie? Um, no, I only had yeah. indirect contact, but the people that I work with, look, I'm a science nerd, and I got involved in science at the age of 10, microbiology and theoretical physics, and I was taken seriously in science at the age of 12, okay. of all the absurd things. And I had nothing to do with popular culture whatsoever. But okay. I wanted to, want, my field is uh, mass behavior from the mass behavior of quarks to the mass behavior of humans. And I wanted to get an opportunity to see what is going on in the dark underbelly where new myths and movements are made. That meant moving into a field I knew nothing about, popular culture. And Good I found- stuff. Biggest, Good stuff comes to mind. Well, I founded the biggest PR firm in the music industry and I worked with Michael Jackson, Prince, Bob Marley, right. Beth Midler, ACDC, Aerosmith, Kiss Queen, Run DMC, <laughs> Billy Joel, Billy Idol, Paul Simon, Peter Gabriel, David Byrne, et cetera. So that's the experience you're talking about. And when Bob alludes to the necessity of using PR to make Americans dream, to make Westerners dream, he's talking about that experience to a certain extent. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. It's so nice that you could come join us and uh, spill your uh, uh, holes of wisdom. Um, and thank you so much. Uh, and now uh, we have one more person who has joined us. Um, when I was at a summer program uh, at MIT uh, many moons ago, uh, uh, the International Space University uh, had just started. It was their inaugural program. And uh, we oh, had... No, no, no. Can, is somebody on the microphone? So we had... Um, um, uh, you know, split our group. I think there were 100 students. Um, and we had split our group into um, uh, team projects. 
And uh, I was um, uh, put into uh, the Lunar Base Project. And each team had a team leader. And uh, our team had uh, Wendell Mendel, who is a well-known uh, uh, human space flight scientist out of Johnson, he's retired now, and Larry Kuznets. Larry is known uh, uh, in the Apollo uh, um, program as the um, designer uh, of the Apollo spacesuit. He was involved in it and studied it, did the engineering behind it. And now uh, he has been teaching also at the uh, at UC Berkeley. Again, spacesuit design is his uh, area of interest. But now uh, he's here and I'm glad that he just texted me and I'm happy that we got him here. Uh, Larry, would you like to take over and tell us uh, uh, what is going on? Is Larry here? There he is. Can you, can you unmute, Larry? Okay, I unmuted. Hi there. Okay. So, um, well, I don't know how much time I have. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, ten, do... 10 minutes, that's all we got, Larry, and then we got to uh, wind up. Okay, I've got a lot to say, like in, in four topics. Uh, <laughs> you, uh, if you miss all this, it'll be repeated or reprised at the, the Explore Mars, a Human to Mars conference coming up September 13th. Oh, that's right. That's right. So, uh, each one of these topics is going to go for an hour. So getting it down 10 minutes, I'm just going to skim over it. No slides. Uh, first one I want to talk about uh, is the space shuttle and the legacy of the space shuttle. And it's kind of timely. I've just completed a book. And I'm, a I'm actually scheduled to be featured on uh, BBC National Geographic uh, special documentary on STS-1, first flight of the space shuttle and the tiles of the space shuttle. Uh, spent uh, half my life with the space shuttle from beginning to end. So I know quite a bit about it. And uh, I don't want to get into that. You can read the book, or you can watch the videos for all that stuff. But what I want to leave you with is the legacy of the space shuttle. Uh, some people view it as mixed. I view it as uh, an incredible legacy, uh, primarily for one big reason, and that reason is reusability. So reusability was not even in, in, the, uh, in the lexicon when the shuttle came along. Uh, and in a nutshell, what happened to the space shuttle, it never should have been retired. In fact, I, I initiated a last ditch attempt to save it because it could have been profitable had it not been for Ronald Reagan, believe it or not. It's a very complex, long story. Uh, you can read about it or find out about it. But in essence, uh, it was retired prematurely and its parts were taken uh, and, uh, and used to build the space launch system. Now the space launch system, uh, we were we were not granted use of the space shuttle to show its profitability uh, because we were told they needed all those parts for the for the space launch system. We're talking 2012. We were only going to use one space shuttle for a couple of years to prove its profitability. Now they said they needed they needed all the parts for S for for a space launch system. So here we are, 2021. Space launch system still hasn't launched, uh, but. Take a close look at the space launch system, the biggest rocket ever made. It's about to go up uh, later this year. It's the keynote, keystone of the Artemis program and Orion and the NASA's vision of humans to Mars. However, those wonderful engines, those magnificent space shuttle main engines uh, are gonna be dropped into the Atlantic and destroyed. Oh, <laughs> how, how, do you, how do you make any sense out of the notion of reusability, NASA obviously didn't learn their lesson, but guess who did? Elon Musk. So where, if you ask yourself, where did SpaceX come from? Where did Elon Musk come from? Where did the philosophy come from? Hey, it came from the space shuttle. The whole notion of reusability. Now there's a lot between where where it began and where it ended. I don't have time for that. And again, it's, it's a, you go on for hours about it and uh, go to explore Mars, human to Mars for, if you want to know more. And the second topic I want to talk to you about though is the hubbub that's going on about uh, the Artemis XEMU, the $1 billion cost overrun uh, related to spacesuits. Well, everybody knows you do not 
walk outside without a spacesuit. And uh, the, the, the group that's building the Artemis spacesuit called the XEMU was the group I started out with at NASA back in 1967. I know all those people. I know their fathers. I know their children. I know all those people. And I can tell you the way NASA does business, is, which is the same reason why the, those wonderful main engines are gonna be dropped in the Atlantic, is everything is looked at as an evolution. There's no such thing as a neat, clean sheet of paper. And there's lots of reasons for that that have to do with bureaucracy and time sheets and, and project codes, no time for that either. But I will tell you that about two years ago, um, I, was, uh, I was in a meeting with the, the director of Collins Engineering at the Johnson Space Center. And the Collins Engineering is uh, the entity that used to be Hamilton Sense, the Sunstrand and Hamilton Standard that built all the NASA spacesuits since the 1960s. It's one of the biggest old boys networks their relationship between NASA that there is. And two years ago, uh, when I was there to talk about a, a spacesuit for Mars, which is a whole other topic, and that's going to require a complete break in the way we think things. And again, I'll talk about that at the Mars conference. But point being is that in trying to present why spacesuits had to be different uh, to, to the uh, Collins, Collins uh, people, and to get a, a hearing as to why they should be seriously considering a different way of looking at spacesuits, turns out that I was informed they couldn't meet because they had just been asked by the Crew and Thermal Systems Division to give them help with the XCMU. This was two years ago. Two years ago, when NASA was trying to build an in-house spacesuit for Artemis, they were already in trouble two years ago. They asked their old boys network that they had this relationship with of servicing shuttle suits and ISS suits that had an ongoing contract, come to their rescue. And now we find a situation where there's a billion dollar cost overrun. The suits are not gonna be ready, even with the help of Collins Engineering and ask me if I'm surprised. NASA has taken so many steps back since the days when it was a can-do agency. And it pains me to, to say that because I was one of the biggest NASA uh, jump up Hey, hey, wonderful, I'm up here. I was at Mission Control during Apollo. I was a vision, you know, I helped build the shuttle, all that stuff. It pains me to see where the agency has gone. But the one good thing is they recognize the importance, absolutely recognize the importance of uh, commercial uh, entities like SpaceX uh, to do things a lot better and cheaper and faster. Okay, so the last topic I wanna, I wanna address is really philosophy, because that's what this, this meeting is about. And I think, I, I, you know, I've given a lot of talks about Mars, about Mars spacesuits, about how we, why we should go to Mars and all that stuff. But it's only recently that I came, I think, to an understanding of what Elon Musk is really thinking. And what he's thinking, I believe, I haven't talked to him, so I can't tell you that for sure. But what I think he's thinking is, A, Artemis, the moon, is a temporary place. It's just a stepping off place to go to Mars. Now, NASA says that too. But if that's true, why are they investing billions of dollars in an infrastructure, including spacesuits, to go to the moon when it's just simply a hopping off place for Mars? Why would you want to build a whole bunch of moon spacesuits when that's not your destination? Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. So what, what is the reason? Well, philosophically, as we get older, we look at, the, we look at life in the face and our mortality in the face, and guess what? We realize what's gonna happen to us when, when, the, when the great uh, casket in the, sky, in the sky comes to us. So I think if I was Elon, maybe he thinks like me, maybe it isn't, is that uh, you realize that if you look straight up in the sky and you go from where you are right now, the distance from Houston to Dallas, maybe only Austin, Texas, which you know is very easy to drive in four or five hours. If you did that straight up, you'd be dead in 11 seconds. But before you died, you'd look out and you'd see nothing. It'd be all black, be no sign of life, there'd be no anything. And then, uh, and then you'd say, holy cow, uh, where I'm at is a rock. And that rock has got on it all the colors we see, all the sounds we hear, all, all the odors we smell, all the technology we build, all the animals, all the plants, everything 
we see and sense when we open up our eyes is on this rock and it's protected by this tiny little atmosphere, right? And we also know, because we're human, it's a miracle. Basically, the point of all this philosophically, it's an utter and absolute miracle. My words to you, you being able to listen to them, you be able to, to wake up today, hear, smell, talk, all this stuff. Incredible, utter miracle, right? And uh, you, then you say to yourself, that miracle has got a limited lifespan. And uh, that lifespan, we know, when the sun starts to overheat several 10, 15, 20 billion years ahead, everything that we've done, all the arguments we get into with our wives, with our friends, all these discussions will have disappeared and vaporized. There'll be no history of it whatsoever. It's like we did not exist. That's a very sobering thought. So what, how, do, how does that make you feel? It, and, and by the way, it's not that sun. We think we know a lot about the sun, but uh, we don't know enough to swear that a supernova is going to take out our sun tomorrow or next week or a year from now. We don't know enough to absolutely know that with certainty. And just like we don't know enough to know that the next pandemic is going to, is going to be much worse and wipe us all out. So to say that we've got plenty of time to go to Mars and establish a multi-species, multi-planet species is daydreaming. It's just not looking reality in the face. This is the most important thing the human race can do if it hopes to survive. It's kind of like when you're told if it's a hurricane coming or how do you get out of Dodge if all of a sudden there's a massive earthquake? Have you prepared, have you listening to this prepared? Do you have your escape route? Do you have your backup power systems? Do you have enough gas and fuel and food to last? Have you already got your head in the sand like 99% of the people say, oh, it ain't gonna happen. Well, I'm here to tell you all of this can happen. And I think that's where Elon Musk is coming from. And anything he talks about regards to the moon, he's kind of laughing out one side of his mouth. He doesn't need, he doesn't need Artemis, by the way, to get to the moon. He doesn't need any of a gateway. He needs none of that because Starship can land on the moon by itself. It's got enough capacity with the heavy lift uh, booster that's part of it to just leave Earth settle down on the moon, dump everything it's got to dump and not have any need for Orion, not have any need for a gateway, plus deposit probably several hundred people. Uh, so um, anyway, that's a lot to say philosophically in a very short period of time, but I needed to get that off my chest as a test drive because I'm going to be saying this again. So if any of you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. You did, you did very well, Larry. I think that is a very good ending, ending note for reality and uh, to add to it i will also say that elon musk does not need even starship to send people to the moon because he has the tools and wherewithal right now with his um, with his falcon block one and the uh, the uh, crew dragon all he needs is refueling capability in earth orbit and he can do magic he doesn't have to wait for Starship. But anyway, thank you very much. Good to see you. I can, you. See, I can see you're worrying more than me because, because you are grayer than I am. <laughs> okay, okay, Larry. Thank you yeah. so much. Hi to you and Angela. And okay. uh, now, Ken. Uh, Madhu, oh. uh, I think Bob oh, raised wrong. hands. Bob oh. raised hands. Okay, somebody has raised hand. Who is that? Dr. Crone. Bob, Bob. Okay, Bob, um, go ahead. Bob, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Do you want, uh, you're, you're, uh, you're muted. I asked him to unmute. Okay. Please. No, all we have to do is. It's, it's, oh, we something. can he hear you yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Go okay. ahead, Bob. You got me now. <clears throat> I just have one more comment. We will publish this uh, entire conference, maybe it will have to be a little edited because we've gone on and on in the Journal of Space Philosophy. Now, in the first journal, what was interesting was 
in 2012, I said, here I am, a doctor of philosophy, and I'm, I'm teaching a philosophy program. And yet, I have, uh, we have never really defined Kepler Space Institute's philosophy. So we did a very simple in the first journal, 2000. We said, here, number one, humans will settle in space. Number two, in ethical civilization. Number three, implemented by the policy science. Now that article goes on and explains those, but that's our <clears throat> fundamental three position philosophy. And thanks very much. Uh, thank you, thank you, Bob. Um, any other hands up? Uh, <clears throat> no, no, no hands up. Okay, now uh, we'll directly go to concluding uh, um, uh, slides, uh, um, unless um, somebody has comments. Uh, um, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, so, you know, in our discussions, it's very clear to us that many of us, though we are professionals and teachers uh, in the technical disciplines, um, it's very clear that um, the culture and the humanities uh, play a, a very a vital role uh, in, uh, in humanity's quest for, for uh, space exploration and space activities and space settlement uh, moving on beyond. Next. So um, what are the aspects of um, culture, uh, um, you know, I think it was uh, Martin Rees who was cornered by a BBC interviewer, or was it a Guardian interviewer? He had just won the, the Templeton Prize and uh, they wondered why is it, uh, and the Queen's astronomer uh, uh, who, who has never written anything in religion, uh, uh, how did he win uh, the, uh, the prize? But the question was, a little bit uh, twisted, uh, uh, the interviewer asked him, uh, what is your opinion on religion? And uh, um, Martin says, it's part of culture. It's my culture. Um, I, have, I have nothing else to report. It, it's part of my culture. Um, so uh, people have different viewpoints on it, but I think when you distill it all down, it ends up with the term we call spirituality and it does not need it does not need um, um, figureheads or people to understand that there's a deep seated nature in all of us and uh, um, uh, 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 nature is telling us things uh, that we are just too dumb to listen to and uh, uh, I think uh, the space philosophy uh, helps us um, to refine us and make us more sensitive as a species. Next. Next slide, Ken. Um, you know, uh, the Olympics are just over, you know, uh, in Japan. And uh, uh, as some of you may have watched it. Uh, we watched quite a bit of it. It was such a beautiful thing, despite all the pressure that was put on Japan not to host it because of the pandemic. Uh, and it was so delightful to get away from the mess that our leadership projects on, on, on television or on the media every day to see the human spirit flying free and doing things we love to do, all the peoples of the world coming together um, to, to celebrate uh, not anything technical, uh, not anything scientific, but literally the human spirit and, uh, you know, I, I was telling Catherine, you know, we got to do this every year. Once four years doesn't mean much, you know, Olympics should happen every year. And we want to happen it on places like moon and Mars. So um, those are the things that make us human more than all the stuff that we train for in our profession, uh, which are really tools 
to make us more human. You know, I recall going up to Zermatt and climbing up to watch, uh, um, you know, the um, the view from there of Matterhorn. And uh, you climb and climb and climb, and then you go up there, and there's a little, small little crucifix sitting over there, and it says, just simple, be more human, you know, and um, it tells you, it, it kind of reminds you when you get into all of these activities, that that is our, our duty to ourselves and to all of us, um, to be more human, and uh, and that also means to be more in tune with nature. Right? Uh, so those are my closing thoughts. Did I have another slide? Yeah, I think we have a few more quick slides. Um, I think um, Aisha said this, you know, that imagination is making us, is, is what distinguishes us from God's other creatures. We say that necessity is the mother of invention, but imagination is the fuel of creativity that we possess as a species. And imagination is more important than knowledge, like Grandpa Einstein says. Next. Um, uh, I reflect back on the words of uh, uh, Buckminster Fuller. Uh, he is a um, a mentor for a lot of us, even though we never knew him. Um, uh, he, you know, in the 1960s, when the space program was at, its, at what we call the golden era, uh, when we were flying very large rocket ships up and down to the moon, um, uh, uh, Buckminster Fuller brought up his book called The Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. Uh, it is available freely. Uh, you can Google it, and uh, in it, he clearly tells you, we are all astronauts, and we are living in a very finite uh, body, just like Larry mentioned uh, um, a few minutes ago. And so we have to rethink, and I think space philosophy is doing that for us um, every day. Next slide. So um, at the end of it all, uh, and you know, T. S. Eliot quotes uh, the same thing too. He, in his in his uh, poetry, he mentions that, and at the end of it all, uh, all the exploration will be for us to come back and, and know the place for the first time. And that is what um, space philosophy is about. And that is what all of our all of our activities uh, in space are about right now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to entertain some questions, uh, but uh, Ken will have to control the time. <laughs> we are way past time, right, Ken? Yeah, if you want to start the panel, maybe the question can be answered in the panel. Okay, okay, go for it. Uh, any thoughts, closing comments? Um, Wes, did you want to say something? I'll go uh, through the line here. No, no, I'm good. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, Larry, Larry raise hand. There okay, is hand. Please, uh, please go for it. I got to thinking that I may be the first person or the oldest person here who had something to do with the space program before any of you. Here's how I grew up in San Luis Obispo. My dad bought a water company, a bottled water company there. And when Camp Cook was uh, being transitioned to a little outfit called Vandenberg Air Force. <laughs> and they were putting in rocket ships and all of that. I was a college kid and I delivered water down there. And I watched the towers go up. Mm -hmm. We had the contract to fill the underground batteries with distilled water. So my dad took a distillery down there that ran 24 hours a day and I was there. So that was my contribution to the space program. <laughs> <laughs> That's very close. And water is precious, Larry, you know that. <laughs> we can live without food for very long, but not without water. <laughs> okay. Uh, Stan, did you have some closing comments? Who are you calling on? Stan, you. Oh, thank you for... Oh, we, we lost you again. We, we had you for a moment, but we lost you. 
Okay, I don't have the technology today. Sorry. <laughs> One other thing I was going to mention, Madhu. Yes. There ought to be a requirement that anybody who has slides must bring a grandchild. Oh, must bring a grandchild? <laughs> they know how to do it. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Uh -huh. and it's, it's not perfect yet, but uh, in the near future, AI will do it all for us. Um, you just tell them we want to be on screen and it's done. Uh, so we're getting there. I have um, something I would like to say at the end. Uh, 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 is that is that Bob? No, it's David. David. Oh, uh, okay, uh, David, go for it. Okay, thank you. I'm going to have to leave, I'm afraid. Okay. But I do want to say that this has been a very special chance to understand the idea, not just what we're going to do in space, but why we're going to be there. Yeah. I said during my lecture earlier, I had a quotation from Macbeth, and I would like to end with one from Hamlet that, um, that I think about often when I'm out under the stars. I do not need to be on a spaceship to experience space. When I am in my observatory with my eye at the eyepiece of a telescope, yeah, I, I am as close to space as I ever need to be. And uh, I'm going to quote now from another one of Shakespeare's famous quotations, this one from Hamlet. I think a lot of you are familiar with it because Patrick Stewart said these words on the hide and cue episode of Star Trek. This most excellent canopy of the air, look you, this brave or hanging firmament, this majestical roof fretted with golden fire. What a piece of work is a man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculties, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. And yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Which brings us back to where we started. Thank you, Madhu. Yeah, you know, um, I don't know if, uh, um, uh, Larry, did you know uh, Phil Harris? Does the name ring a bell? Phil Harris. Um, I'm um, Larry. I don't know. You don't know but I think, I, I, think, I think Bob Crone may know him because uh, um, Dave Shrunk and I and uh, Phil used to know each other. Uh, Phil would always close some of his comments by saying, it's not from dust to dust, but from stardust to stardust. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how we would define uh, the human cycle. Uh, you know, and... Uh, I just thought about that when uh, uh, David mentioned the uh, Hamlet. There is also that other saying that I remember um, you know, Brutus uh, being told uh, uh, the, the, the fault does not lie in the stars, but among us underlings. Uh, it comes to mind all the time. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Let me go by the tile. I'm going by the tile. Before we all leave, we would like a group photo on these tiles. Am I right, uh, Ken? We want all of them to come on the tiles. Um, uh, Frank, yeah, yes. did, you, did you have a thought to close, uh, Frank? Yes, I do. Um, I mentioned earlier, I think we should make this an annual event. I don't know, Madhu and, and Ken may not want to do that after this. I know <laughs> it's been a lot of work. Um, but well, I, well, we have plans for a... Um, for another gathering before Christmas. But, you know, I think Frank White would be the better organizer for it. Oh, <laughs> my goodness. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, we have to do support. Yeah. Well, okay. Um, let me say, I, I'll take that under advisement, but let me just say, I, I honestly feel that we're at an inflection point where we're going to realize a long held goal, which is space for everyone uh it's gonna it's it's gonna happen the inspiration flight is in yeah, that's a right. month that's right that is going to be a milestone and i believe things are going to move very quickly and i feel like what we're doing is really one of the highest priorities because elon musk and others have figured out the what and as as is often the case the why is lagging behind, trying to catch up. So 
I, I really want to thank you all for putting this together because one of us alone can't can't do it. Uh, we need a group of people who can come together and really powerfully create the new paradigm and get it out there. Yeah, we need to thank AIAA and Ken, but I'll get to that after we go through the rounds on the tiles here. Hank, did you want to say something? Something. Yeah, I, uh, you know, it, the why, it seems fairly obvious. First of all, the why, why we do it, we've always done it. So it's hard, to, it's hard to say, you know, why. And the question is, why not? You know, we, we've always <laughs> done this. This is not like a new thing for us yeah. that we're trying to think of. It's we've been exploring and, and, and settling all this time. So first of all, it's what we do. So it's a natural thing. And then the second thing is that I, I still I still believe that you know life as we know it is a bigger thing and you know we think that we're the pinnacle or something but we're just the brain cells maybe of life as we know it and at some point this life as we know it is going to wake up and become self-aware and I you know again this is starting to happen and we all have these devices that that are connecting That's our right. brain cells now. So, you know, the, the speed at which I can find some other person with an, an idea in the world has become like insanely fast. And uh, who knows, at some point with the combination of us, uh, our, our um, imagination or our thinking power and AI, if AI can help us decide when we should contact somebody else. Now we're gonna be like instantly connected. I, I hate to say bored. I don't like to think that <laughs> we're gonna be bored but it's going to be a new thing uh, when we're able to have every other person at our fingertips all the time. And I think this is a, uh, I don't know, there's many different words for it, like the age of Aquarius or whatever you want to call it, but it's a, it could be a, an awakening that we're up for. And the awakening, part of the awakening is that we get off planet and we look back and say, hey, you know, we got to make sure our planet is okay because we're never going to find another planet like this planet. That's right. That's we're right. never going to find another one. As hard as we, we might try, but we're never going to find another one. Yes, and uh, you know, I think um, I think it is uh, they had the Sharda, and um, also I think uh, there are, there are several philosophers who have mentioned this idea of the global brain and the connection um, between people. Uh, make us a collective organism. I think we, we in, the, in the popular uh, literature we called it the hive or something like that. But but uh, the fact is that uh, as cell phones uh, proliferate and we have discussions and we have collective um, ideas, uh, it changes us. I think uh, uh, we are not what we used to be even 20 years ago uh, because of the changes in communication communications. Uh, you're absolutely right. And uh, uh, we are heading there. Uh, Leslie, some thoughts? <clears throat> yes, thanks, Madhu, for putting this together. Uh, we certainly covered a lot of ground today, <laughs> we did. a lot of different topics. And to me, it points out how much work we have left to do. Uh, maybe that's the researcher in me, I guess. But um, I think we need to uh, consider being more intentional about answering these how and why questions in particular that are posed by space philosophy. I agree with Hank that yes, we are doing this now. Um, it's in our nature, but I think it would um, help us all as a community as well as the broader space exploration community to be more intentional about answering those questions and uh, putting more thought into them. Because uh, as Frank mentioned, I think a lot of times that those why questions get left behind. And I think it's, it's something that in putting in that effort, um, we will be able to engage uh, a larger cross section of our uh, culture. Um, I like so many of the things, I, I'm not gonna take the time to rehash uh, different takeaways, but there were a lot of them. And I agree that we need to do this on a more regular basis and perhaps allow more than one day for it. Um, I, I, I agree. And, uh, you know, uh, um, after Stan sent me um, you know, this article by um, 
by the gentleman for, I think he's from Georgetown University. And I read through it and then I, I Googled a few more things. And then I remembered James Schwartz out of uh, um, Kansas and Wichita State. He had been writing a lot of things about space philosophy, not agreeing with many of the things we talk about, you know, like Hank says, we are explorers and so on. No, he, he had many other uh, interest, interesting reasons. And um, I think all of, we, all of us may want to look at his body of work. Uh, uh, his name is um, uh, uh, Schwartz, and uh, he has written quite extensively on the philosophy of space. And um, I hope uh, some of you take a look at it, which brings me to uh, our next um, Aisha. What did you want to say? You know, I really enjoyed uh, your talk and uh, I liked that verse. Uh, it really touched me because, you know, it tells you the human condition, uh, the human imagination. Uh, I don't know how, how, much, how much has been translated to make us feel that way. Uh, if it was written 3000 years ago by a person, uh, who had that imagination, uh, he, he, she or he were far ahead of many of the humans who live now, uh, in my opinion, uh, that, that, those verses. Um, did you have some comments? Um, well, it was a great, uh, great event. It is like around 3 a.m. in Istanbul. I'm still standing <laughs> and... Um, you need, you need to go to bed. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to leave the conversation. I want to stay till the end. So oh, it was gosh. a great chance. It was a, um, after, after all the time we didn't see each other, it was great to see uh, many frontiers and uh, listen their ideas about space. And also, it is amazing to able to share my ideas with you here. And so thank you for the opportunity. That's all great. Uh, you know, you, you, always, you always bring up angles that are, that are precious, uh, Aisha. So we, we enjoyed your, your input very much. Um, Wes, uh, did you have to say something? Uh, no, not really. I, I mean, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it was super interesting. I'm sorry I wasn't able to join earlier and therefore I'm sure that I missed some super cool stuff. Uh, and so I guess it's making me want to come back next time to hear more. Um, uh, but, you know, we're all sort of doing stuff and uh, we have other uh, duties, but I, I really appreciate it. I'm actually quite um, uh, stoked to see that there is so much interest in, in this subject uh, and that the interest is not all purely uh, technical, but there's a lot of concern with you know, the question of why, as was mentioned earlier, uh, though I have to agree with Hank here in that uh, the how doesn't happen until there is a why driving it. it we may just not understand that why yet or have made it, um, uh, we may not have articulated it yet, but we're operating according to that. You know, we don't just do stuff randomly. Um, so there's something there. Like I tell my students, you know, your eyes are smarter than your brain and no stuff uh, uh, first. So you may do stuff that looks cool or, or works for you, to your eyes. And as long as you just step back afterwards and kind of ask, you know, what your eyes are trying to tell you. And I think that's the case in a larger uh, sense with uh, the stuff that's going on. And I trust, uh, you know, based on the evidence of a, a grouping like this and the concerns of all the people here that, you know, it's not, uh, you know, it's not, it's not evil driving it or anything like that. It's, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it's good intentions and and ideally as long as we're paying attention it'll turn out yes and um, you know, Wes, talking about the eye and the brain and um, I think I brought that up before the surgeon's heuristic uh, which says that the eye cannot see or, or uh, what the mind cannot comprehend and so when you when you refine yourself and tune yourself, you see a lot of things. You know, it's Yogi Bara again, you know. If you observe, you can see a lot of things, right? So uh, that's good. And uh, I thought Stan's comment on, um, 
on developing uh, humans. Uh, evolution is a thing that is happening before our eyes, uh, uh, Stan. It's only a matter of time. Um, there have been several proposals looking at how humans may evolve uh, physically too. And uh, I've seen some wonderful renditions from uh, folks who tell us how we might change biologically over time, over thousands of years. So uh, uh, any other uh, thoughts, uh, uh, Ken? Uh, Ken, was there one or two more slides uh, in my conclusion uh, that you want, to, you want to show? I want to thank everybody. Okay, uh, give me one second. <clears throat> If there are no, uh, Santosh Kumar has a question. Go for it, Santosh. Just a comment. Um, one of the things I think that applies to us, you mentioned Scott Gilbert earlier, one of the things that if you were to read, uh, we can't, from, from we can't hear you really well, Santosh. I rejected. He said, okay, one second, one second, sorry. We, we can't, uh, we, we didn't the, quite get it. That sounds totally like it was from very far away. Are you it, an alien? Uh, in today. <laughs> Can you, no, can, can, you, can you hear me better now? Yes, we can. Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I have to disconnect the airplay for my surround sound for it to work right. Um, going back to uh, uh, Stockdale and Stoicism, the part one, uh, Stoke Word is tried. One of the things that he was known to have said when he uh, had his control system shot out by the surface air missile and he's floating his parachute was uh, he whispered to himself, five years down there at least, I'm leaving the world of technology and entering the world of Epictetus, and Epictetus was one of the Stoics, was one of the philosophers, one of the Greek philosophers. So it kind of shows you that no matter how much technology we have, ultimately we will come, or we may come face to face with a non-technological uh, reality, uh, yes. philosophical uh, reality that technology has. <laughs> You're so right. You're so right. Uh, um, that is exactly how things uh, things pan out in the end for all the things we do, but we strive. Um, any other questions from the audience? Uh, I was just a quick thing. Um, since we are AIAA, uh, one of the things that is said as well is uh, with all the stealth technology that we have, let's say this in the B2 or whatever, one of the quotes I remember seeing was that the minute that the B2, the North B2 Spirit stealth bomber opens its weapons bay doors, it is no longer a stealth aircraft. So when it's a bad guy country, the pilot, the, the pilots and the air crew that are about to deliver the ordinance are going in with the same amount of courage that the oldest soldiers of time went in to battle with, exposed just as like anybody else. So that's just kind of another, uh, you know, yeah. allusion to the limits of technology. It is, it is true. It is true that, uh, you know, I still find this puzzling in some ways that we are prepared to shed blood uh, for our way of life. And uh, at the end of the day, um, uh, uh, every country, uh, every civilization wants the same thing for their families and their children, you know. And yet, um, at the, uh, um, uh, uh, we, we approach the boundaries uh, with sticks and swords. Um, I, have, I have read uh, articles that suggest that is the human condition and we cannot ever uh, get over it. And history shows us that. I saw some chat also in that line of thinking. But there have been times in the history of humanity when everything was honky-dory and we did not have trouble. Uh, if you look at the, um, the writing of Steven Pinker, uh, he tells you right now is such a time when we have the most peace uh, ever uh, in the history of humanity. And so if we keep this up, and do the right things, there may come a time we won't be a warring, uh, uh, warring species. Uh, but anyhow, any other questions before I conclude? Uh, you know, I was looking at some slides. These are all humans before us. <laughs> Every one of them waged a war one way or the other uh, to change uh, our thinking. I think all of you are- uh, hey, Matthew, I think Stan, Stan raised hand. Stan did, okay, Stan. Okay, use the phone. Okay. Can't hear you. No. Um, yeah, yeah. Let me check. 
How about now? Yeah, yeah. we can hear you now. Yes, uh, yes, we can hear you. You can you can turn off your phone. Oops. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry for the confusion. I'm gonna turn off the phone. Is that working now? Yes. It's working. It's fine. It's working, Stan. Okay, look, very briefly, I've been trying to say, I'm sorry I haven't been able to get in. Uh, what I thought we were gonna talk a lot about, and, and I think Frank would agree, is that w what we've been waiting for for years is for normal humans, not highly trained specialists to go into orbit and to get that overview effect and to yes. come back and share that with the rest of their friends and communities. Right. We're just on the verge of that today. I thought that was going to be a heavy topic for this meeting, so I avoided it uh, in my presentation. But I'm really excited that after decades of waiting for people to experience the overview effect and come back and share it with their communities, and I don't mean, as I say, NASA employees or highly trained scientists and others, I think you're likely to see a very profound philosophical impact over the next few years, once space excursions start taking hundreds of people in, into orbit. Uh, not sure about the up and down three minute suborbital jaunts, but the orbital flights, I think will make a big difference. Okay, I'll stop there. That's my contribution. For you. Yeah, and I will, I, will, I will step it up even further. Um, they will go into orbit and many of them uh, will uh, fall sick and they may not enjoy uh, the flights. And then they will decide to go land on the moon and experience real gravity, unless we do um, you know, the spin ups of vehicles, which is another area of, of complications. Um, once you go feel gravity elsewhere, uh, it will change our species uh, stand uh, because we will have the overview effect from a distance. Um, people don't understand or don't pay attention to the fact that when you are on the moon looking back at Earth, the Earth will be four times the diameter. It's a huge body in the, in the lunar uh, vacuum. Um, and the light that comes out, what we call Earth light, is so bright, you can see things uh, in the night on the moon. These are experiences that will change us forever. Uh, so I agree with you that you know this idea of normal, ordinary people, as uh, um, as uh, one of you mentioned, I think it was Frank uh, who mentioned that in November things are really going to change. None of those flea hops uh, you're going to orbit, uh, ordinary people. But I mean, I mean they are they are they are pilots. Some of them are, are accomplished pilots. Anyhow, they go into orbit, uh, and and these are citizens. And without uh, uh, a U.S. or Russian uh, professional uh, astronaut or cosmonaut training, they go out there, come back, and uh, I think the gates will open uh, uh, surely. Uh, that is for sure. Uh, thank you, Stan. That's a great comment. Thanks so, for letting I, me get in, what was that? Thanks for letting me get in. Oh, you, uh, thank you so much. Thank for, you, Stan. Thank you to Stan and for Anne for Anne to letting you stay so, so long. Thank you. Um, so now, um, you know, I look at this set of slides and, you know, every one of these people had to persevere uh, to, to change uh, our thinking. I think all of you are familiar with the structure of scientific revolution by Thomas Kuhn. Um, he talks about what it takes to change the, change the mind. Uh, in medicine, it is the hardest established field to change the way you think about how you practice medicine. And even there, it's happening, what we call precision medicine. Um, and next slide. Next slide, Ken. I want to thank all of you. You know, I've never had to organize um, a gathering um, with so many people in one shot. And I simply could not have done that without Ken at AIAA and uh, Dan helping us to, uh, uh, you know, make it all work. Um, a special thanks goes to uh, uh, Dr. Ken Louie, uh, 
you know, it stressed his nerves quite a bit because of all the change orders that came into play in the last few days. And uh, we were pulling our hairs out to get this going. But I think the end product was, has got us all thinking um, in, in some good and interesting ways. And I have a lineup of folks who want to come into the next edition. So we will try to do this again uh, sometime just before Christmas. Um, there are so many wonderful other thoughts that need to be heard um, in this, uh, in this why we do something uh, before what we do. Uh, it's a critical thing uh, in, our, in our own minds. Uh, when we do architecture, um, you know, Wes, we always know why. Why are we doing some of the things we do? Why are we creating some forms the way we do? And uh, what are the consequences? And this is why I like the architectural training very much, where we anticipate and we are able to, able to exercise different concepts before we enter the arena of reality. And uh, architects do this very well. That is what I promote in both the School of Architecture and Engineering. Let's go to the next slide, Ken. So I want to thank all of you. I want to thank the organizers. I want to thank Ken and uh, um, uh, have a good evening uh, wherever you are. Or uh, Sorry to keep you up, Aisha. Um, have a good little bit uh, night's sleep and uh, <laughs> back to uh, doing your magical things. Um, uh, Leslie and... Uh, all of you, thank you very, very much. Uh, is Bob Crone still there? Bob, are you there? I don't I think to, so. I want to wish Bob. Um, uh, yeah, he's here, but. Okay, um, uh, Bob. I asked him you, to, to mute. Yeah, wishing you a quick mend and back to business. I'm sure Selena is taking care of you and uh, um, we'll we'll do something uh, for the um, Journal of Space Philosophy too. Any other comments? If not, we are going to close this. And Ken is finally going to have a good night's rest. <laughs> I had a comment if I could make a um, couple comments real quick. If if is this all time to do it? So, uh, who who is that again? Uh, Santosh. Santosh. Santosh, go for it. Okay, a couple things we're going to stand about the ordinary people. Uh, he, what, we got to balance that with Feynman's admonition at the end of the Rogers panel that public relations must take a backseat to the laws of physics because Mother Nature cannot be fooled. Absolutely. So with that in mind, with that in mind, uh, yes, we can definitely push ordinary people to go up into space. But here's the thing: just like in the military, where we've had when they were introducing females into the cockpits, which is a great thing, but the way they did it was problematic. One comment made by someone who was a supporter of it, but not the way it was done, said that the airplane does not care whether the pilot is male or female or whatever. So similarly, the spacecraft does not care whether someone is highly trained or not. It'll kill you just the same if things go wrong. So that's the thing you got to balance with of how, how much risk we're willing to put people until the technology becomes safer. And the um, only other comment I also want to make regarding um, the, what you said about the wars and and so forth, is that we have the way to avoid wars, you have systems in place where people can redress their grievances. That's why we have governments and courts and so forth. When wars occur is when people feel that they're not being properly and just for, and, and you know, being done justice. And so people so they have to take matters in their own hands and so on a global scale, that's when wars occur. So that's some of the chew on and keep uh, in the back of our minds. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and, and... Uh, 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 we don't have to look very far uh, to see how complex systems have been built in the past, Santosh. Uh, there is a system architecting um, heuristic which says um, uh, evolution, uh, much less revolution. Uh, if you look at how um, airplanes were built and flown, uh, we always start with a very large risk factor and it diminishes over time as we become better at it. And this is exactly what is happening. And in fact, um, you know, the slope is very fast in this arena because we have new agents at our command that we did not uh, in uh, the 20th century, namely autonomous systems. 
and they're doing a fantastic job. Dragon can fly by itself, uh, you know, including rendezvous and docking is entirely, um, entirely autonomous. Um, and sometimes uh, we don't want the crew to get in the way, um, but, uh, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, yes, things can go wrong and as you would if you're driving your car and meet with an accident or, um, or if an airplane goes awry. Um, so um, um, normal accidents will happen. And uh, um, uh, we pray that during the early evolution, uh, we don't get stuck because of it, because you know, during the Challenger, we lost some years. And then again, during Columbia, we lost some years um, of um, active participation. Um, but the way and the cadence with which a starship is going uh, promises a very, uh, very good uh, future. Uh, thank you for your comment. And Gemini 8 and Apollo 13 both have taught us that yes, we can have automation, but at some point systems are, are destined to fail. It's a question of not if, but when. So I think we really need to be cautious about having everything only automated. Automation is good, but we've got to balance it with uh, manual backups and manual innovation ability as opposed to having none. This is something that Airbus and versus Boeing have contended with how much override to give the pilots. Because if you have no override, the system breaks and they're just along for the death ride. Absolutely, you know, and there are, there are many other technologies and that are also coming into play called uh, co-robotics, where uh, you do relegate authority when you think you're getting into a conflict, uh, in a, into a conflict situation. And uh, a lot of things going on in that field um, where, um, where when we say autonomy, it's not just autonomy for the sake of autonomy, but also the ab ability uh, to, uh, to see, assess, and take action uh, during uh, risky situations. I'm so happy that uh, <laughs> that all of you are thinking um, so well into uh, into this late hour. Um, I, I think uh, I just wanted to comment on the last the last person. You know, I don't think that a human can land a starship. Um, and now, what was that again? <laughs> I don't I don't think a human being can land a starship. <laughs> that is, but a human being can't fly an F-16 either without the digital fly-by-wire because the uh, the period of yeah. oscillation doubling is, is less than a nanosecond. You have to have aidance. But what I'm talking about is the judgment of the computer to make the right decision. Sometimes it's be overridden, kind of like what Neil Armstrong did when the uh, when the automated system was about to land the yes. ladder in a field of boulders. He had to manually take over and override that because his human decision making at some point was yes. superior. It's, we are, yeah, we are very. Yeah, I think that was Buzz. That was Buzz, wasn't it? Yeah, Buzz we, are, was one. we are very uh, familiar. It was it was Neil actually. Uh, Buzz was the co-pilot, but he was mainly just to back him up in terms of the numbers and the gauges and so forth. But it was Neil. The, yeah, the the flight was commanded by uh, Neil Armstrong, and he took over a few minutes before a few minutes before landing. And uh, these are all, uh, in in some ways, these are all details. Uh, Santosh, but it's good that you're being vigorous about it. Uh, we, uh, we take all these things into account and yet we will have normal accidents and yet the, the human frailty exists. Uh, so <laughs> the fact remains that uh, as uh, uh, even though we, are, we try to be safe, uh, um, accidents will happen. We have to face that fact. And I'm glad that you brought up uh, Dick Feynman's quote uh, because we all listened to it in real time uh, when he when he was seeing this when he was saying that. But anyhow, uh, thank you all. Um, no more hands up, which means that's great. Uh, um, until uh, the next event, um, Ken has got a whole lineup of AIAA events. Not to mention the AIAA has more events coming up between now and Christmas um, that can pack you uh, full of ideas and full of things to do uh, between now and then. Um, with that, I would like uh, to conclude um, and thank Ken one more time for all his patience and all his work. And all of you keep up the good work and um, good evening, good night or um, uh, early good morning to Aisha 
but uh, uh, we'll stay in touch um, and, and keep in touch. Let's do that. Thank you all. All yes, done. Uh, bye. bye, everybody. Bye, bye everybody. See ya. Bye. Thank you. See ya. Wonderful. It's amazing. Ken, are you still there? Yeah, of course. I'm